Good morning. Apologies for the uh, glitch with the link on the website. We're going to wait until um, 10 past the hour to get started so that the link has time to reach us a few more people. Um, so please stand by. Thank you. I would like the papers on quickly fill it up. Uh, no, I made that. Oh, uh, yeah, just to have a second chat. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Apologies about the the uh, delay. Um, if uh, if you can hear me, um, uh, you can just uh, put a message in the chat so we know that we're getting through. And okay, thank you. All right. So we're, we're, we just lost about 10 minutes, but that's okay. We have a long day. And um, I just wanted to start with um, some brief introductions. I'm Joseph Bush, one of the organizers of the workshop. Um, and I can see that we have Marsha and, um, and Doug um, on the phone who are the, uh, the co-organizers. And we'll be switching off the, the moderation. I believe that um, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves. Um, I don't seem to have the ability to do that here, but so we may have some additional glitches, but let's deal with that um, in a few minutes. So just very briefly, for those who are new to the workshop, um, we've um, 
um, ECOS is um, a, a fairly informal uh, knowledge organization group that's been meeting uh, since the, the 1990s. So we, we have a very long, um, a long timeline. Um, and um, we've um, recently been holding our workshops in conjunction with Dublin Core. Join, please. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, with, with Dublin, with Dublin Corp, but we frequently meet in conjunction with other, um, with other groups. Uh, you can find, um, uh, background information, uh, on the website, um, at, uh, currently hosted by Dublin Corp at ncoastdublincorp.org. Um, and, um, it's a little screenshot of the new of the website, and in particular on the website, there's a section dedicated to uh, to workshops. And you, and you can see that we have a, a very long, uh, uh, long, long list here. There's been an attempt by uh, by, by Doug and Marsha primarily to um, maintain a, a really good archive of all of the presentations and other types of work that have happened in the workshop over the years. Um, and the European group also maintains a GitHub site where everything is available. Um, and um, uh, here's just a, a quick overview of um, the workshops um, history. I've been showing this recently just to give people a sense of it. There have been these parallel uh, tracks with Europe and the US and also with DCNY for a long time. Um, so getting to the workshop itself, um, I already introduced Doug and Marsha. Um, here's the official slide. We've been uh, co-chairing the workshop for the last few years. Um, we also have a program committee, um, which um, is listed on the uh, right side of the slide. Um, if anyone is interested in participating in the programming, please um, please let um, Doug, Marsha, and myself know we're in the process of planning the next workshop for 2024 already uh, because it will it's it's planned to be held in, in Wuhan in conjunction with the um, ISKO meeting uh, for the International Society of Knowledge Organization and you can find the call for papers for that we'll talk more about that later in the meeting so um, just very briefly um, as we're running a little bit late I um, like to just do a quick overview. The workshop this time is um, um, is a big program um, intended to provide accessibility to um, to people around the world because we have participants from from around the world. Um, so we're starting at nine here in Korea, which is fairly late in North America, but not so late that if you want, you can stay up and participate and then it will end um, rather late here in Korea to allow more ready participation starting at around 445 uh, for people in, in Europe or in the more or less European time zone. Um, and we have a, 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 a two very um, uh, large and ambitious panels. We'll have one that starts uh, shortly um, around cost terminology services um, from a North American perspective, uh, meaning just that the participants are located in North America. And um, on the next slide, you'll see we have a, a, a bookend um, session on cost terminology services with participation by people in uh, who are mostly in European uh, time zones. Uh, in the middle, we will have um, what we, uh, typically have at the workshop um, refereed uh, submissions and invited presentations. Um, this year we've had a few more invited presentations than usual um, and fewer submissions, um, but um, I think the general flavor and topics are um, pretty typical of what you find in the workshop. Um, and again, they're, they've been scheduled to try to allow people a more convenient uh, level of participation. So I'm talking to you from, um, from Daegu in South Korea, where I've been at the Dublin Core meeting. Um, and there will be people, there are other people here at the meeting who will be um, uh, dropping by 
Uh, some people will be will be here. We have right now just a couple of people in the room uh, besides myself, but we know that there's over 100 people registered for the workshop. Most of them are planning to participate virtually. And the workshop is being recorded and the recording has all done recorded. Sessions are being recorded and we'll um, send a link, hopefully, we'll send a link. Uh, uh, we'll be sure that the link is sent to everyone who's registered uh, so that they can um, take a listen and, and, and look at the sessions that they might be interested in, but maybe it was inconvenient in their time zone. So let me just show the last bit here in the afternoon. As I said, starting at 4.45, um, we have the, the, the bookend session on cost terminology services with presentations from folks that are mostly based in Europe. Um, so, uh, whoops, it looks like I didn't fully get this correct last, last night, but basically the gen general um, way the workshop will, will, will uh, Will, will work and even for the panel presentations. Most people have about 25 minutes for their slot and we ask them to try to um, keep their formal presentation if they have one to about 20 minutes so that we have at least five minutes for questions and that then leaves us about 10 minutes at the end of the session to have further discussion. Um, because we're working with a lot of people remotely and with a, a, a vanilla Zoom environment, we'll rely on people to um, um, to uh, mute and unmute themselves. So we may have some situations uh, where we need to ask people to mute themselves if they've forgotten to uh, to do so or to unmute themselves. So uh, everyone, uh, we're a pretty collegial group, should just um, uh, please take the initiative and, and uh, use the chat to, to do that. Also, if you have comments or thoughts, Please, please use the, the chat as well. Um, we've, uh, going back to where we started with the website, um, we've tried to collect abstracts or summaries, and Marcia has um, done an amazing job of uh, posting those, everything that we've received. So you'll find on the ENCOS um, website with the schedule for the uh, workshop uh, links, which give you a summary. Um, we'll try to collect presentations uh, from um, the, uh, the presenters, and those will get uh, posted there usually after the workshop, um, and then we'll become part of the archive. Uh, so just again, really quickly, um, uh, in terms of the guidelines, there's, there's just this one URL that now everybody should have. Um, you don't need to have any other URL. You can come and go as you as you want. Um, and like I said, we don't have uh, we have just vanilla uh, Zoom, unlike the webinar which we've done in the past. So um, please use the chat if you have questions. We'll keep track of those. Um, but also um, muting and unmuting. We want it to be interactive as much as possible. It's hard to do that online, um, but it's a relatively small group, so. Um, please um, take advantage of the controls that you do have and we'll uh, try to keep people uh, informed if there's any uh, technical issues that we need them to do. So um, with that, I will, um, I will mute myself here in Daegu, South Korea, and I'll turn the program over to Marsha who will be moderating the first panel session. So let me stop sharing if I can. Oops. Stop sharing. Marcia, it looks like you're still muted. I am trying to share my screen. And uh, success. So you got it? Yes. I will have to do a, a quicker introduction on this workshop. You might make it full screen. Especially. No. Yeah. About this uh, panel. How is that now? It looks okay. 
It's okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I hope our speakers are all coming without problems. Um, it's uh, similar to we're dealing with terminology services, right? So today, what we're going to have is a panel on the terminology services. What we will uh, cover will be much more than just one type of this. So we got the vocabularies and ontology portals, registries, and individual KOS services together to explore what the infrastructures, tools, and approaches used. So why do we want to have this uh, because so anyone who deal with KOS, the life cycle will encompass so many things, including you start to create, you transform, and also maybe not just initial from beginning. Uh, and also later mapping with others, exchange and aggregate. So the aggregate portal services are extremely important. They can provide support for searching, sharing, mapping, and visualizing and analyzing the large repository of what we call ontologies, uh, vocabularies, terminologies, and uh, annotations. Yeah. There are also individual KOS based services, as you will see from this uh, panels, that the individual KOS based service can support indexing, searching, and exploration of an uh, not only the vocabulary, but also the knowledge resource in their own right. So the panel will highlight those possibilities arising from new developments, such as like uh, cloud technologies and um, the significant portals and the services in particular fields. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are having the first uh, section, which has America and Asian put, um, participants, because it's the early morning in Europe. So we will have three presentations, um, starting with our pioneers in the bio portal. And then probably many of you have not be aware of the new Ontau portal and on the portal alliance meeting. Then we will have a special one for the MED portal, which is critical during the last two years. And then the OCOC is faster and do a services. So this is in this particular session. And later at the end of the um, workshop, there will be European participants. Now we will see AgriPortal. Uh, it's another one that aligned with the uh, Onta Portal and initiated this. And the interesting uh, Coco Upper Ontology Cloud. Yeah, that's a cloud approach. And we also will see the link to conservation data repository, the terminologies, because the conservations of many things, you cannot even using words to express what the issues. And so across culture. And the session two will have the Chinese iconography thesaurus of the Victorian Albert Museum, which become a hub and accredited internationally the related iconographies. 
And the, finally, the bar talk, which had several hundred uh, registries and with the discussions. So this will be in the uh, end of the workshop. And later, I hope you can still attend. Now let's go to our first speaker, John Graybell, who has been in the maybe software development, system development, service development, and then now the community development. Uh, and for 40 years and the uh, last uh, 10 years, focusing on the bio portal and the initiating to the Ontal Portal Alliance. So John, now your turn to share your screen. Okay. Very good. Let's see if we can do this. You should now be seeing my slides. Yeah. Excellent. So my name is John Grabiel. Um, I've worked at um, a fair number of places, including Stanford University, for the last eight years or so, uh, up until just a few weeks ago, um, during which time I was a program manager for BioPortal and uh, for much of that time um, coordinator for the Alta Portal Alliance. And we'll talk about BioPortal and Alta Portal and the Alta Portal Alliance in this talk. Uh, if you want to see a copy of this talk, you should be able to access it at bit.ly uh, slash bp-op-opa. Um, and uh, there are a number, a fair number of links in it, um, so uh, that may be useful to you at some point. The two principles that I want to highlight uh, in starting the talk um, are, of course, Mark Mewson um, at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, he's the director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research Program there and the principal investigator of BioPortal. And over the last 20 some years, he has been the instigator of, of BioPortal as well as a number of other semantic resources that are used internationally, and there have been a lot of uh, team members involved in all of that. Um, and then uh, Clement Jonquet is the uh, senior researcher at INRAE and associate researcher at University of Montpellier, who is the principal investigator of the AgriPortal system, um, as well as another system, and has uh, been involved uh, first with Mark and then leading a lot of uh, developments on his own and in Europe. And so they are the principals who really get the, the credit for this work. Um, I've just been a facilitator along the path. What I want to do today is talk about the needs that uh, have been driving um, this work and uh, the, the directions in which it, they have been driving it. Um, the first need, of course, was for a common repository for biomedical concepts, and NIH funded the National Center for Biomedical Ontology in 2004, and uh, that was primarily as a, as a repository, but also uh, in terms of educated, educating the community about that repository and why it was important and why the assets that it contained were important. BioPortal launched in 2006. Uh, it allowed anyone to submit an ontology uh, for public or private or commercial use who wanted to um, and accumulated about 50 or so ontologies per year, initially pulled in by the uh, National Center for Biomedical Ontology and more recently, most of the ontologies are uh, contributed by the users themselves. It also provided a shared backend service uh, uh, software collection that providers like the Marine Metadata Interoperability Project that I led uh, could use to create their own ontology registry and repository. This project received significant funding until about 2016, 2017, and uh, then things were a bit thin for a while, but are now um, uh, coming back around, we hope, for, for a good long while. 
the BioPortal project today is still managed at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research, and it contains both biomedical and other kinds of research ontologies from other communities, as we'll discuss. It has over 16,000 users, registered users. You don't have to be a registered user to use it, so it has many more users than that. Um, and it has about 1,600 total ontologies. Of those, uh, maybe about 1,200 are public. Um, if you take off the ontologies that are just views of other ontologies, then you're down to about 1,000, of which maybe 600 are prominent community ontologies that are widely shared. But there are very many important community ontologies in that collection of six or 700 ontologies. So soon enough, it became clear that the community needed not just to be able to access the BioPortal service, but many people wanted to have their own repository service. And out of this request came the NCBO Virtual Appliance. Uh, this was about 2012. Sorry if some of these dates are a little sketchy. Um, everyone could always access the code in, in GitHub that was in the NCBO repository. They could um, deploy that, but it was a lot easier if you could deploy your own copy that was packaged up. And that's what the virtual appliance provided. There wasn't any cost associated. It included most of the BioPortal services and um, the BioPortal team supported both the BioPortal system and this delivered uh, virtual appliance uh, through the support at biontology.org email. There was eventually a cloud-based version as well, which was called the Ontoportal Appliance Amazon Machine Instance. So between the virtual appliance, uh, which became called the Ontoportal uh, Appliance, and the Amazon Machine Instance, um, we had a lot of different users over the years. And the architecture hasn't changed all that much in the last 10 years. Uh, it is reasonably complex with a lot of sophistication. We're not going to talk about the details. But um, there's a lot of functionality here, and we will talk a little more about that. Um, another need was to store non-biomedical ontologies. BioPortal sounds very biological or biomedical, but there were a lot of scientific reasons for wanting to store other kinds of ontologies. Um, often you need terms from other domains to work on your science project. It can be hard to draw those precise lines and and you'd like to be able to of course provide more services to more communities if if you're running a, an asset like bioportal and so um those were the noble reasons we wanted to uh, maintain this system and the practical reasons were um that bioportal has never really actively curated ontologies and decided which ones were good and which ones were bad and and so on um it really lets the community makes those decisions and so it was easier to accept these different ontologies. And there are more general purpose tools coming into existence like Cedar, like RedCap, that used BioPortal services. Uh, and because the tools were general purpose, so were the ontologies they needed to access. So around 2016, 2017, we started saying, no, no, it's fine. You can put your research ontology into BioPortal. We're not going to kick it out even if it's not about biomedicine. Then we realized that many of these people who were using the software um, to start doing their own ontology repository um, really might be better off working together and being aware of each other's work. And this gave birth to the Ontoportal Alliance in about 2018. We wanted this to provide support for each other's work naturally and to advance the common code base in a productive way, but also to present a unified community of interest that everyone recognized was behind this uh, software collection. Also, there were a lot of requirements that we didn't want to lose track of. Different communities were pursuing, and they were producing code to meet those requirements that we didn't want to lose track of either. So uh, this community was intended to give us the chance to reuse other people's work not just code, but also uh, website production documentation, um, and ideally to increase our overall market share in the somatic community. So the Ontoportal uh, Alliance uh, was the new place for 
bringing forward the Onto Portal software. Uh, and in fact, you can see at ontoportal.org now uh, demonstration software or the ability to download your own um, version of the software. And it also provided the uh, community where different people could participate. You'll hear a little later from uh, Jalin, the, the mid-portal um, project owner. And uh, later on after that, Comont uh, will be talking about AgriPortal. And um, you'll hear about um, these other systems. Uh, the All of those communities are represented by their own repositories on GitHub um, that are reflections of OntoPortal with some modifications in most cases. Um, and uh, have been represented at the workshops we've held. Uh, the 2020 workshop being a uh, COVID workshop by necessity at the last minute, and the other two having an increased number of people uh, in workshops in Europe, including in Leche just a few weeks ago. So an issue that comes up for us as you're having these repositories uh, spread around and different people uh, making changes to them at different rates is keeping their versions consistent. Uh, as it happens, at one point, we had quite a number of repositories that were deployed based on our 2.4 version of the virtual appliance. We had some based on the 2.5 version, and we had released the 3.0 version, which was itself based on BioPortal. So there were a lot of different versions around, and you couldn't always make a change and have it be workable in all the other versions. And so starting from that position, we had to decide how are we going to transition this to some arrangement that's more sustainable and that keeps everybody more or less aligned. And we know there are a lot of steps to this and we haven't gotten our way through all of the steps, but our vision here is clear to make sure there is a, a single public repository that all of these other repositories can be based on and can continue to upgrade and, and follow to support their own systems with the latest modifications. You also run into issues about how that code gets distributed and, and questions having to do with who's making the most changes to the code, how many changes are they making, how quickly, and who is going to be in charge of integrating these changes into your common public collection. Um, like uh, Red Hat uh, Unix systems uh, back in the day, you need to have somebody coordinating all this to some extent, or it's uh, just naturally going to diverge. You also need to have best practices taking place where the coding practices and, and um, separation of concerns and modularization of the designs and testing are all built around being able to make changes and, and integrate other people's changes. We are putting all of these concerns in place. Once they're all in place, then sharing code is going to be much easier. But even in the process of getting there, it's already becoming more expected that people will share their code and reuse other people's code. Even when everyone is using the same code at all these different repositories, people start thinking about, well, if I'm searching for something in one of these repositories, like BioPortal, I might also want to find out about the same thing in other repositories, not just in BioPortal. So perhaps someone is is um, uh, looking to find things, and that would be federating the services, but it also involves the possibility that you are federating the ontologies themselves. And in this slide, we're talking about taking an environment ontology, for example, and having several different repositories serving the same ontology, or ideally the same ontology, maybe one of them is serving a different version of that ontology, which would start to get very confusing. So in this most recent meeting of the Ontoportal Alliance, we agreed on practices for ontology sharing, how to take care of what's primary, what's not, and um, keep the other things current with that. We have this agreement in principle, and we're going to start implementing it across the different members of the Alliance. There are a lot of different features that these different ontologies have to, uh, different repositories have to support, starting with all the features of BioPortal, which was the baseline for Onda Portal in the first place. 
these this is a large collection of really complex features with their own sub features and and APIs with sub parameters and so forth. So it's a complex system. And then we add to that all of the modifications that the different communities are putting into the system to uh, leverage for their own users. And um, our goal is to keep all of these things aligned and coordinated going forward. Um, so it's a lot of things to keep track of, and we're going to need agile methods to both share and, and test the, the features that we are seeing being developed in these different systems. Some of them are quite powerful features, and it's going to be a lot of, a lot of advanced capabilities in the systems going forward. Um, this is where we get back to the search question of someone wanting to search across all the different systems. And so how can we take one of these features and make it work across all of the different ontologies? Uh, one of the Stanford team members, uh, Misha Dorf, put together a, an image of what this might look like if you're searching for an ontology uh, term like environment and you want to search not just in BioPortal, but maybe also in other systems like Echo Portal and AgriPortal and get your answers back for all the ontologies and all the systems. This is a fairly complicated uh, uh, set of things that have to go on for this to work. And a lot of agreement came up in, in this meeting. We discussed it at some length um, that we just had. Um, but there are ideas that are still maturing about how best to display the results and what the best architecture needs to be so that you can have a really responsive search capability. And uh, I think we found some general acceptance of the principles here, um, but there's still work to be due to coordinate our approach and make sure when we implement this federated search strategy, it will really work for everybody. We needed a publication and Clement Jonquet uh, coordinated and, and did most of the writing on um, this uh, publication about this ontoportal technology. Um, it's now available at the DOI um, noted there. And um, so it's one good way to learn about the systems and how they're being applied. So leaning into the conclusion here, uh, we can see how BioPortal itself evolved as a very feature-rich platform that was based around research needs and often made quite complex by those research needs. AutoPortal gave us a chance to create a, a more sustainable platform that the community could gather around, even as the community was getting funded through different sources and in different ways. The AutoPortal Alliance is advancing this on two fronts. The platform itself is uh, being turned into a shared and production level software product, while the community is evolving into a group that's capable of supporting and advancing a sophisticated software vision across all of the team members. The whole platform as a result has already become much more solid and supported and sustained. And so this puts us in a very strong position going forward. Uh, I wanna thank the teams. This is my chance uh, as I'm leaving Stanford to thank the teams that have worked on this and given me a chance to work on this. The, all of the BioPortal teams that Mark has had working on uh, the system for a long period of time now. Of course, the AgriPortal teams that uh, Clement has brong, brought into the picture. And I especially want to commend uh, Sifax Buzani, uh, who has done a lot of excellent um, development work advancing the AgriPortal system with a lot of cool features. Um, at Stanford, Alex Grenchuk has, has done a lot in the background to make the virtual appliance and the auto portal system work. And all of the BioPortal team members, um, Misha Dorf, Jennifer Vendetti, and Alex, Mark, of course, have pulled together over the last eight years, um, during which those were the primary developers of the system. Um, so much credit to them. And finally, the auto portal Alliance as a whole is uh, a really great institution that I think will lead to really great products from this system. So I'll leave it there, be happy to take some questions. I think there should be a little time for that. And um, you are welcome to follow up uh, at any point with the Onto Portal team or with me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
congratulations for the newly published one. I see the big team in that uh, paper, right? Yes, a lot of people worked on that paper and on the systems. Mm. And that's the Semantic Web Conference, very important. Right. So for the audience, any question you can either raise hand or type on this chat. So we can ask John uh, how to join this on the portal. Okay. Yeah. To, yeah, on site also. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll be happy to, to talk about that. Um, I think there's a, um, it's easy enough to take advantage of and get a feeling for the Onto Portal Alliance and the Onto Portal system through our online web presence. And starting at ontoportal.org is a great way to proceed um, and um, doesn't tie you down to anything. Um, but if it's become a practice that people who are interested can participate and be introduced in our uh, Onto Portal Alliance um, management meetings and uh, can even come to the workshops by arrangement with the organizers. So um, getting started is easy and, and pretty painless. And then if you need to want to get more involved, um, it's fairly straightforward to do so. And we're always improving the abilities to install the system and to get it up and running and to respond to people's needs. So I definitely would encourage that. Uh, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, this is Xiaoling from Drexel University. Yeah, yeah. we have been uh, looking up a lot of ontology in this bioportal and that. I see the quality of uh, ontology they are very un unbalanced. Is there some effort of, about assessing the quality or or improve the, uh, the, the ontology layer? Yes, there are several um, existing techniques and initiatives mm -hmm. underway on that score. Um, mm -hmm. On the uh, BioPortal system itself, mm -hmm. we try to make the answers come up uh, uh, at a higher priority, much like Google does for the better ontologies, the ones that are accessed more often and so forth. Um, that isn't always possible, doesn't always work. Um, one of the things that we will do every so often is we will determine which ontologies are no longer maintained and we'll weed them out. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are low-level activities that are meant to address some of that. What the um, uh, the there are a couple of techniques inside the system that can let you say I only want to deal with this set of ontologies if you know what that set is and um, those capabilities are um, that we you know we can talk about offline support list or or via the help can help provide that information on the agri portal side they have done quite a bit of work to evaluate both the fairness of ontologies and describe the ontologies with a lot more metadata. Um, and um, that can also facilitate things. In the end, I think where we will need to go on several systems probably, but especially BioPortal because it's least curated, is to very consciously create two different tiers of ontologies. One, the more community oriented, and one is the uh, and the other tier is the more individual um, ontologies that are possibly of less interest. So people have to opt in to search at the lesser used ontologies. Um, it's also the case. Sorry, one last strategy. Um, it is possible to um, constrain your search to just certain uh, groups of ontologies using the slices that are on the left hand side of the ontologies page, and um, that's something that is uh, a helpful strategy if you know you're working in biomedicine, for example, and you just want to deal with those ontologies. Um, but I've, you, you're raising an issue that does get raised a lot with respect to BioPortal, and I, I think the team is going to want to be looking at it over the coming months and years, for sure. Great, thank you.
Right. Joseph, anything? Oh, okay. Yeah, we got one raised hand. Jama? Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Jarmus Ariko from National Library of Finland. Uh, uh, you mentioned about weeding out ontologies. I have a, a question about if, if there would be an, uh, a valid good ontology, but it will not be maintained anymore, mm -hmm. but it might still be valid. Why would you weed it out? I don't think you would, if it's a valid good ontology, I don't think those would be weeded out. What we see is there are a lot of ontologies that have no submissions, have submissions that don't parse, have submissions that have 12 terms in them that never got defined. Those are the kinds of ontologies that um, you do want to weed out if you can, because they are they have no intellectual content, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking of ontologies which have been used for description of data and so on and so on. So it, that would be still valid, even though if, if uh, exactly. it's not maintained anymore. Exactly. And there's yeah. a little, uh, there's room for two opinions here. I've always, I'm a keeper. Mm -hmm. So I tend to say, if you've put something in there and it had value at some time, it should stay in there forever because the things that referenced it still may be brought out and reference it. Right. There, there are, I, I think at least some members of the team, maybe most of them now that I'm gone, um, uh, would say if something is from 2010 and hasn't changed since then and we can't find the person who's maintaining it then it's it's not clear that this is adding value as opposed to subtracting value so it it's a balancing act and um mm. i don't think we have an ironclad approach that that bioportal and when i say we it's by habit it's not because i'm still involved actively <laughs> it's yeah. we the bioportal that i was a part of i don't think we have a specific okay. approach Okay. Thank you for that question. Are there any questions um, here in, in Deku? Um, I, I do have one question, John. I want to just touch you a tiny bit. There, um, at the Dublin core meeting just prior to the workshop, there there was um, a fair amount of discussion about various, uh, about fair, uh, fairness, as you, um, I, I like that, that term more broadly. Um, and there was some discussion about um, uh, data cards and um, other um, emerging mechanisms for defining or providing frameworks uh, for uh, metadata around fairness. Um, and I was curious if that's come up or whether uh, you, you you just mentioned that it's uh, your your group that's been working on this for a while, so you have uh, kind of a collegial uh, sort of quote governance. Process. I'm just wondering, is that as the groups mature, whether it's become more formal in any of these emerging um, models around fairness that, that are floating around have uh, come up in, in, in your group? Um, they definitely have come up in the Ultra Portal Alliance very strongly. So, in fact, and, and uh, Kamalt will, I'm sure, mention the work they um, have done to incorporate uh, Fair E in the um, uh, structure of the entire system. And you can get a very nice uh, spider diagram of how fair each ontology is uh, in the AgriPortal system. And we're, I'm, I'm hopeful that all of those improvements will be brought back into the BioPortal system because I think they're quite valuable. Uh, I, I don't think fair uh, necessarily teaches us a lot about whether the it, it's not a guarantee of whether the ontology is itself valuable or should be kept around or should be curated in a certain way. Um, just partly because there are many different ways to measure fair and um, many aspects of whether the ontology is good have little to do with whether it's quote unquote fair by, by one of those metrics. Um, so there's a, there's a definite, connection of concerns there and a very strong interest on the part of the Ultra Portal Alliance to make sure fairness can be encouraged in the ontologies. Um, I don't know that once we have all of that incorporated into BioPortal that that would change the way BioPortal chooses to, to manage their curation or intake of ontologies. Um, 
because they're more pursuing a principle of openness there to the maximum extent they can. Did that address your question? Yeah, no, it, uh, yes, yes and no, but uh, ah. I was just, no, I was just looking for a little bit more information and that's what you provided. Yeah, yeah, very good. It's it's definitely a lot of activity, both in the fair community and in the ontology community, uh, especially in Europe. A lot of work has been done and a lot of work has been done to improve the ontoportal alliances um, metadata management for these ontologies, which really takes some curation time to do well. Um, so it's a, an interesting challenge, but one that I think we'll overcome with time. The great discussions. Uh, I think later Charlene and uh, uh, others will talk about AI as well. So, and we, we all know that AI is in, incoming everywhere. Uh, Joseph probably mentioned that next year the NCOS workshop actually have the theme KOS in AI and AI in KOS. <laughs> I wonder whether you have those list of need, need, need. Will you, are you also have the AI incoming in your list of needs? It's interesting because it is, it's definitely coming. It's definitely happening. I'm dying to attend the uh, meeting in, in uh, about three hours that is about um, formulating categories uh, using um, chat GPT. I think that'll be very interesting. Um, and how that, you can see all sorts of different paths by which that might connect up to a repository like OntoPortal, both in terms of information coming into OntoPortal and how to curate it and how to leverage it and describe it. And the, the way that AI could use the information in Auto Portal to improve the information provided by tools like ChatGPT. So interestingly, I would say we uh, the BioPortal team hasn't incorporated into its list, very long list of tickets and, and requirements and goals, anything specific about AI, but um, it's, it's inevitable. And it's just a matter of which things get here first and how it gets incorporated. Great. So maybe next time we will listen. There you go. You're not a lead, need list done. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. If anyone have question, please keep contact or put typing on this chat and also reading that newly published article. Uh, thank you so much, John. We are so appreciate that you are coming and also introduce all those on top portal alliance and others. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on to the next one. Actually, it's a member of this on top portal. So if John, you stop share the screen. And then, Shaolin, you will Hi. share your screen. Yeah. Can you share your screen? OK. Yeah. Uh, well, we're waiting for Shaolin to share the screen. Uh, she is an associate professor of Department of Biomedical Engineering in Peking Uni medical college and also a staff scientist. It's a very interesting, you call biomedical branch of China National Population Health Data Center. So her experiences are academic and also the real practical. We're very happy that uh, she will share us about the med portal. Can you share the screen in full? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you hear? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Go mm, ahead. Good morning, um, everyone. I'm Xiaoling Yang from China. And uh, first, I would like to express my thanks to Masha uh, and uh, Douglas. And uh, thanks for their efforts in organizing this event. I'm sorry. This is the outline of my presentation. First time I will introduce some background. And the FAIR principle have become a consensus in the field of scientific data management. And the FAIR principle define a fundamental model for describing scientific data. At its core, it is a scientific data other digital objects, and it should have a unique and persistent identifier and be appropriate to open format and represented by controlled vocabulary. And the data should be accompanied by rich metadata to describe the contextual information of the data. And on the other hand, we also observed that the fair principles explicitly require that metadata and data are subject to the same management requirements. So the uh, scientific data content standards should have four interrelated aspects, identifier, format, terminology, and uh, minimum information. With minimum information provides a list of metadata that is crucial to be represent reported about the biomedical data to make it uh, comprehensive. And in the past 20 years, the terminology and minimum information about medical area developed very quickly. Open Foundry has developed a series of ontologies such as Wubron, disease ontology, lung ontology, and so on to formally represent the biomedical entities. And as for metadata, since the first minimum information but macro array, experiment, uh, Miami, lots of biomedical experiments have their own minimum information. And the NCBI has uh, um, built their own metadata database, BioSimple and uh, Bell Project to record the metadata from, metadata about the scientific data in various archive databases. This metadata databases offer improved ways for users to query, to locate, to integrate and interpret the mass of data held, uh, held in the NCBI's archival repositories. And as for the uh, simple information was submitted to the domain scientist based on the metadata templates, which is designed according to the minimum, according to the minimum information standards. But, uh, but uh, we found the difficulty does not meet the expectation. This is the research conducted by Professor McMuse and others. It has demonstrated that in the past decades, the number of metadata submitted to NCBI has increased quickly, but as a majority, in, but the majority submitters just submit uh, those metadata according to a general metadata template. That means um, the simple like adequate description and accurate description about, about uh, the simple attributes and uh, the experiment uh, methods. Um, as for the metadata defined by the sub submitter themselves, most of them are without semantic supports. And uh, there are also lack of controlled vocabulary in the value domain in filling the, the simple attributes. So the machine cannot understand in, in those data. Next, I want to introduce uh, some work in the field of biomedical science data management in China. In, 20, in 2018, Chinese, China's government issued 
the matter for the management of scientific data. Mm -hmm. Which stipulates that the government funded science scientific research projects should submit their data to the designated data center. And our data center, National Population Health Data Center, is one of such kind of data center. So the new system to archive those project data was available in 2019, which can collect data, query, and reuse it. But their great challenge for PhDA um, because the submitted data from complicated time, but the submitted data with complicated types from multiple subdomains and such kind of project centered data submitting is useful for aggregating data in a very short time, but we still need to promote data in depth re reuse. On the other hand, <laughs> On the other hand, microdata submitted as a dictionary to PhDA without any predefined rules, without any semantic standards. Um, although some scientists complete the, the data dictionary very carefully, but there's the great difficulties in harmonizing data according to specific needs. Mm -hmm. But for the domain scientists, I think applying I think that applying data standards is a challenge task for them and even for data management professionals, whether in China or elsewhere. It's hard to find, it's hard to be obtained, hard to understood, and hard to use. So they need to build a biomedical data standards environment to promote the use of data standards. Mm, we think the core information of the scientific data standards is the terminology and the metadata, of course. The so combination of terminology and the metadata can make the metadata more understandable. And we believe that uh, mm, Constructing such a machine understandable metadata requires support at three layers. The first layer is the ontology layer, and the second layer is the data, data element layer, where the concept and the value domain of data elements should be supported by ontology terms. And the third layer is the semantic linked metadata, which organizes metadata based on specific scenarios to construct a collection of data elements. In the first layer ontology layer, we built metaphor. <clears throat> we use the ontopotal alliance framework to build our ontology data basis. And the framework of ontopotal aliens operates stably and is easy to implement. This is the initial step our job to building such a standard environment. And uh, we use MedPortal to provide bilingual ontology services in Chinese and English, and also for tools to use ontologies. This is some basic functions of MedPortal and uh, um, and, uh, and Joanna has introduced uh, with more details. And we can use these uh, functions through, through API or web page. Yes. Mm. As for the second layers and the third layers, we build another portal, CDE portal. This is the uh, URL of the CDE portal. We use it to compile and register metadata uh, and uh, guide users to, ge to generate data elements and build a collection of metadata. And um, we also use it to provide CDE resources, which is high quality. And some CDE resources are from um, important research projects. We also hope that CD Portal become one of the platforms for domain data standard publication. Yeah. 
We can use CDE portal to construct uh, data elements to know all. Um, and um, the, the schema of the data elements in CDE portal followed um, ISO 11179. Um, and um, the concept and the value meaning in the uh, data element can use the terms from Magpul to other um, portal aliens member, member databases. Um, those data elements stored in the in a database and uh, the users can reuse the, 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 the data elements or the components of an element to build their own new data elements. They also can use those elements to construct the firms for data collection. And uh, <clears throat> this slide show how to use the data elements to create a CRF. In clinical trials, CRF is often used for data collection in multi-center studies. And uh, some method also can help the scientists to build their own metadata templates. Um, in order to promote the results in that portal and uh, CD portal, we built another uh, tools to promote to use these resources. And this is CDE tools. <clears throat> CDE tools is a plugin of Excel, and uh, it can help the user to search and fetch data elements and uh, uh, CRF from CD portal and annotate their data um, or fill in their, their map page template using terms from Bell Portal, Map Portal, or OLS. They can finish such kind of job in, uh, in, uh, in a scientist familiar work environment. So the user can make their data fire easily. Next, uh, I want to introduce our jobs about to uh, construct some uh, standard resource. We hope to have abundant digital resources driving the utilization of my portal and the CDE portal. First, we have translated some widely used OBO ontologies into Chinese and built the, the, the R version in Chinese of some clinical taxonomy or ontology, such as ICD, LOINC, and so on. Um, and we also built some ontology resources with local characteristics, such as we integrated some 10 local style line resources into cell line ontology and the former represent um, the multiple biological characteristics that is measured by the Chinese experimental platform. We also mapping such cell line resource with ATCC and so on. And uh, they also developed uh, a community based open source traditional Chinese drug ontology. We try to we try to build such ontology based on BFO as a top level ontology and describe the the the, the, the drug characters use um, use use NCBI taxonomy. And um, we also translate the BFO into Chinese and they translate various Smith's book, Building Ontologies with Basic Formal Ontology. We hope that these efforts can facilitate the ontology development in China. And another task, um, an another our current task is to convert the data element standards for Chinese health data element dictionary from uh, textual format to a uh, executable format. And uh, we trust, we, uh, and we extract and pass them. We are presenting them use the data element schema uh, in CDE portal which follow the SOs, uh, SO standards. For the value domain coding, 
by some control vocabulary, we utilize the map portal to store that. So we have initially established an environment for data standard resources in the biomedical field, including ontologies, metadata, and data standard application tools. Such a um, coherent environment help users to build their own pipelines to make their data fly. Next, uh, I will introduce a use case that we use um, this data standard resource and the tools to build in a domain specific uh, database that is PhDA genome data archive database. And um, in this database, we start bulk sequencing, single cell sequencing, and a macro data from different types of samples. And the submitted data, including raw data and the processed data with various formats, we designed submitting pipelines for different experiment techniques to collect metadata. And in every step, we have corresponding metadata templates. After the user upload um, their raw and processed data, and they need to connect the specific simple metadata with those raw data and processed data. That's a um, complete um, data um, system for uh, simple. This is um, the user interface for genome submitting tools in the web, and uh, the user will fill in the information about the attributes of, uh, of the samples. Mm. The necessary attributes of simple are from the minimum information, which predefined according to the simple types experiment design and experimental methods. And then the value of the simple attributes can be selected from ontologies. For example, the source species, the source species of the samples must be described using a CBI taxonomy, and the diagnosis of the uh, uh, the diagnosis disease of an individual should be formally represented by the term of disease ontology, uh, Mondo or NCD, and so on. The second job. We used the ontology um, that will make, we can build um, a more powerful search engine and allow us to search and filter the dataset queried using a basic search approach based on the metadata and the ontology hierarchy. And uh, ontologies and metadata standardization can promote more downstream data services such as the automatic data analysis pipelines for 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 for, for more deep for deeper data usage. Yeah. Next, we'll continue to utilize ontologies and metadata standards to support the development of domain specific databases in PhDA. And uh, I also hope that you use the tools to, uh, to establish implementable data standards. Additionally, as, we're, uh, as a work in the data center, we are aware, we are aware that um, the majority of the work in data standardization must be complete before the data, data enters the data storage system. Pro Providing domain scientists with more user friendly tools and resources is essential. Um, this is my colleagues and um, uh, Dr. Zhu Weimi and uh, um, He Yongqun and uh, Zhang uh, Jie. They provide a lot of academic advice. Uh, help us a lot. And we also all thanks to Onto Portal Aliens and uh, the communication with them. Uh, we got a lot, yes. And um, um, thanks to all of them. Thank you.
That's all. Thank you so much. Anyone have a question? Uh, please feel free to type there or bring your question just directly. Okay. And maybe, Charlene, will you also just uh, bring us to the Met portal directly? Or, I, I uh, yes, I think um, I can share that. Yeah, I can share my screen too. So you can see the, that's the med portal, right? Yeah, thank you. So you have uh, 60 ontologies. Uh, majority are English, right? Yeah. And each of them, are you, how did you make the translations into the Chinese language? The machine made or you made? Mm -hmm. We first translated by machine and uh, curated by the expert. So the specific ones, um, those are initiated in, okay, this is ICD-11. Okay, any mm -hmm. question, let's see, in the chat, we have any question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John. Um, yeah, uh, Xiaolin, that was a, a great presentation. Thank you. I was struck. Uh, it, it it seemed to me that a lot of your initiatives are looking forward to the um, potential for integration of systems, um, your use of CDEs, um, your use of these common ontology frameworks, they, they are exemplars, I guess, uh, uh, great examples of doing things in a common way with other groups and, and so on. Do you uh, hope to integrate um, systems and content in the future? For example, um, would you like to see the ontologies that you've created be adopted and integrated into other um, systems like BioPortal, for example? Um, or are you just thinking of this as a closed uh, system for the purposes that, that you need it for in China. Big picture, are you trying to do a big picture thing or a, a very focused thing or a bit of both? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Yes, I think integrating the systems um, such as you take more jobs um, in on top portal aliens that will promote the development of uh, the the, the 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 ontology i think that is very useful um for that that is very useful mm, but um, you know i some 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 specific condition i have some specific condition and uh, such as the bell portal isn't run well here so we must pull some special services in China and uh, I want to focus more on the biomedical area because we try to make a uh, good data management for biomedical science data and um, and because as the first time we found that we must um, 
if we want to manage our scientific data well, we should have the user ontology and the data elements, but there are no such kind of resources here. So we must we must try everything <laughs> from the beginning and uh, then one step after another step. So um, now we can use these methods to 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 to, to manage our our data better, we should say. Um, um, in the future, um, I want to integrate the more system with uh, uh, with, with other um, our system with other systems and provide more international services. And we also try to uh, open our code resource and uh, um, publish our our codes in GitHub. Yes. Thank you. Any other question? And feel free to bring your question. And this is a very interesting specific one that apply into the whole Chinese related. Uh, I wonder whether about the alignment with the uh, United States has the National Library of Medicine, the Unified Medical Language System, UMLS. And, and you have yes, UMS. Uh, uh, yeah, go you, ahead. Uh, okay. UMS is a very huge system, and we have hosted some number of ontologies you know, in that portal. And I think a reasonable way to align with UMS is using the foundation feature of Autoportal Aliens. Maybe and I and I know that uh, um, there is a complete version of your analysis in Bell Portal. We think we can work together to 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 make that kind of alignment. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this innovative work. Uh, we hope to hear more and more internationally. Into our yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, if anyone have more question, please feel free to just type there so she can also answer later. Um, now we can move on to our next presentation by Jeff Mixer. Jeff, you can share your screen and. Yeah. yeah, Jeff is a, works as a senior product manager of metadata and the digital services at OCOC. And he was last year was presenting also other very innovative services as well. And I remember he also worked for uh, IIIF, right? Yes the whole OCOC triple F. Uh, so it's always very advanced. And this faster and also do way will be a reality. Everyone is using. So Jeff, you can go ahead and tell us about that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, as you can see in the background, uh, I am not in South Korea. I'm um, here in the United States, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I, uh, I work for a company called OCLC, um, and just being conscious of the fact that um, I typically present to librarians who all know what OCLC is. I will just give you a quick background. Um, OCLC is a, a library collaborative. Uh, so we work with libraries around the world uh, to help them uh, manage and steward uh, their metadata that they use for uh, information discovery and retrieval. Um, so the um, probably the largest thing that we uh, support uh, that folks might have heard of is uh, WorldCat. Uh, so it's a large world, the world's largest um, set of bibliographic metadata, um, and we help uh, manage and steward that uh, for libraries in the in the collaborative. 
So um, as Marcia mentioned, my name is Jeff Nixter. Um, I'm a senior product manager for our metadata and digital services. Um, so I manage all of our next generation metadata uh, services and products. Um, previously, um, I was in our membership and research division uh, for about 10 years, uh, working on research and development for uh, linked data. Um, and just again, to provide a little bit more background on OCLC's work in um, linked data, you can broadly say knowledge organization systems. Um, so starting uh, way back in the mid nineties, uh, when these sort of standards uh, for linked data were being developed, uh, OCLC was sort of there uh, supporting a development core initiative. Actually, um, for those of you who don't know, the most you probably do, um, you know, Dublin core is named after uh, Dublin, Ohio, where it was sort of, uh, not instantiated, but sort of um, uh, organized. Um, so Dublin, Ohio is where OCLC is headquartered. Um, we also uh, participated in the W3C uh, RDF working group. So again, sort of on the ground, helping develop uh, the standards for describing things using uh, RDF. Then um, sort of in the, the, the late aughts, um, so right when I started at OCLC, um, we started um, using those standards uh, that we help the community develop um, to publish library data as linked data. So um, uh, I'll be talking about it later, but FAFS was one of those, those vocabularies, um, as well as um, a control vocabulary aggregation called BOF, uh, which I'll also mention a little bit later. Then um, sort of in the 2010s, um, this is sort of the, the research and development work I was doing. Uh, we were experimenting with how we can integrate linked data into products and services. Um, those were just a few of the projects uh, myself and colleagues in membership and research worked on. And sort of bringing this up today, where are we? Um, we are sort of productionizing linked data at scale um, through um, supporting um, linked data standards like BibFrame, which is popular in the library community, um, and also developing um, sort of what, I, what we were going to call, what I'm going to call sort of core conceptual entities that help sort of bind or glue together uh, the bibliographic resources that are critical for libraries to um, curate and uh, uh, maintain. So um, before I jump into the actual um, FAST and Dewey presentation, I did want to just talk, because this will sort of contextualize um, the later discussion, um, talk about WorkHat entities. Um, so back in May of last year, uh, we launched um, a service and a set of data called WorkHat Entities, um, which constitutes about 155 to 160 million um, persons, works, places, events, um, and uh, concepts, which is what I'll be talking about here in a second. Um, these are authoritative linked data entities, um, again, are used in bibliographic resources to describe um, with structured data um, who authored a book or um, a person as a subject of a book or an event or a place as a subject of a work. Um, or an organization as a publisher or a subject of a work. So again, they're not sort of the primary resources that libraries um, um, disseminate to the public um, or to their patrons, but rather it's the, um, the contextual information to describe those resources that become sort of entry access points for people searching for books about Abraham Lincoln or books about the American Civil War or books about uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, to describe these entities, um, we've been working uh, with the community um, as well as internally uh, to develop uh, what we're calling the World Cat Ontology. Um, so uh, again, it follows um, uh, W3C RDF uh, best practices. Um, and again, it's a really, it's a data model to describe these authority entities. Um, so it's not a, um, an ontology to describe um, bibliographic materials like a book I would have on the shelf of my library but rather a data model used to describe um, the people the book's about or the author that wrote the book or what have you. Um, and it's also designed, unlike some sort of traditional models um, in the library industry uh, and elsewhere, it's not confined in scope to the, to the narrow use case of, in this case, authority control. So it's really designed to cover a, a breadth of library workflows, which over the, the past 20 years or so have um, exponentially increased from um, just cataloging materials to 
um, cataloging materials, um, cataloging and curating digital metadata, cataloging and curating electronic metadata. Um, and then when you look at things like university libraries, uh, curating and maintaining um, researcher information data. Um, so that's not only research out outputs, but also the researchers, um, what departments do they work at, where department, where those departments are located within the university, uh, things like that. So uh, what I'm going to, at a high level, talk about in this presentation is data that uh, supports libraries. So I already kind of mentioned work at entities a little bit, but we'll come back to that um, at the end. Um, FAST as linked data, and then also uh, DEWEY as linked data. So um, unlike that order, um, I'm actually going to start with DEWEY. Um, so those uh, who are not familiar, uh, DEWEY is a classification system uh, that is used around the world um, in both public and and academic libraries. Um, in the European context, it's more prevalent in academic libraries, generally speaking, uh, whereas in uh, North America, it's more prevalent in uh, public libraries, again, broadly speaking. Um, and to give you an example of what Dewey is used for is if you, if you go into your lo local library and you ask the librarian, where can I find books about um, uh, North American history, very high level, and they take you to a shelf and say, here's a bunch of books about North American history. Um, that's what Dewey is, basically. It gets you to a general shelf within a library that then has um, a wide variety of specific books related to that sort of classification. Um, importantly, it is a built taxonomy, um, so it has a, a high level of customization. Um, it's been translated into seven languages, um, which are English, German, Arabic, French, Italian, Norwegian, and Swedish. Um, and sort of a reoccurring theme that I want to go back to in this presentation is um, the use of these uh, FAST and DEWEY um, taxonomical terms, because, um, you know, in, in my opinion, taxonomies are only worth um, as much as they're used. Um, their weight is only as much as they're used in actual data. So um, WorldCat, uh, within WorldCat, there are about 170 million Dewey numbers. Um, again, that's sort of put, put in scale how, how prevalent Dewey is within the WorldCat bibliographic corpus. So um, OCLC has a product called Web Dewey, uh, which is sort of the, the user interface um, for uh, searching for and in, uh, in also in cases creating uh, Dewey numbers because I said it's sort of a, it's a built taxonomy. So um, just doing a quick search for um, a medical term that um, I'm sure I could pronounce, but it's uh, almost nine o'clock at night, so I'm not going to try to pronounce it and butcher it. Um, but uh, doing that search here, you can see um, this is what you'd be presented with. Um, it's again, it's it's hierarchical. So you start in the 600, 610, 617, and then you can dig into these decimal um, extensions. This is why it's, really, it's nature of being a built number. Um, for curiosity purposes, these um, little um, sort of puzzle pieces indicate Dewey numbers that a Web Dewey user has constructed and created within Web Dewey. So again, this is sort of the power of these built um, taxonomies um, that, you know, they, they're almost infinitely expandable. Um, additionally, uh, in WebDewey, you get um, important things like scope notes um, for use of this term. Um, sometimes there's comments, um, and then there is this, um, this feature, to, again, to build, to create, build, uh, build number, to build numbers, basically. Um, and then lastly, um, there's also uh, relationships to other um, uh, classification systems. So uh, in this case, uh, this, this term has three vocabularies it's connected to. It's connected to the Dewey Relative Index, uh, which, unlike the Dewey classification system, is more of a um, uh, topical reference. So again, this looks kind of familiar to Library of Congress's subject headings. If folks are familiar with that. So. Um, the relative index is more um, like known entry point for materials. Um, it also connects out to um, the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, and then um, in this case, also MESH, because this is a medical term um, and MESH is a medical classification system. 
Um, this term happens to also connect to that as well. So this sort of highlights the um, another important critical aspect of valuable uh, knowledge organization systems, in my opinion, which is the interconnectedness of them sort of across the world, across the web, however you want to, to, to phrase that. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, so Dewey itself is um, traditionally been a uh, print um, but it's also available as a, as a web service, as, as I just showed you in those screenshots. Um, but OCLC right now is also working to publish Dewey um, as linked data. So uh, we're initially going to focus on the approximately 28,000 Dewey headings that have been established in Web Dewey. Um, and that's, again, an important distinction because Web Dewey is a built system. The amount of Dewey headings is almost infinite, um, which doesn't work particularly well from a linked data perspective. Um, but uh, we're right, initially just focusing on those um, established 28,000 and then it'll grow uh, grow over time. So the, the data that will be found in this sort of RDF for linked data representation of Dewey will include um, those multilingual prep labels, alt labels and scope notes. Um, and also links to broader, narrower, and uh, related terms or classifications within uh, the taxonomy. And these URIs will also be added to WorldCat data, uh, which includes both um, MARC bibliographic data in WorldCat. MARC, for those unfamiliar, is sort of the, the record format used to describe bibliographic materials. Um, but we'll also be adding these URIs to WorldCat entity data. So in, uh, for example, a, um, a work could have a classification that is a URI link to um, one of these Dewey URIs we'll be publishing. And uh, we'll be publishing this Dewey's link data um, in the, the early part of 2024, so early next uh, calendar year. Um, and uh, if you have more questions about that, certainly please feel free to reach out to me um, after the presentation. So um, another important aspect um, is, is folks who are, are familiar with Dewey know that um, based on uh, its origins, um, there, there's a lot of problematic uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, um, terms within Dewey. So uh, we are working with the community to understand and make editorial changes to Dewey to help resolve these diversity, equity, inclusion concerns. Um, and as part of this Dewey's linked data, effort, we're actually developing a, well not developing, we're going to create data using a data model to describe these DEI concerns. So in addition to um, making uh, corrections or editorial changes to Dewey, we also want to take steps to sort of contextualize um, where and why terms are in Dewey right now, as opposed to just scrubbing the past and, and, and fixing it or making changes also any context to terms that are, are there that um, could be harmful to, to, to folks. Um, so one example of that is uh, recently one of our um, uh, Web Dewey editors um, uh, actually authored a blog post about removing gender identity from uh, the mental disorders portion of the Dewey taxonomy. Um, so this is um, just, uh, just one example. Um, there's more updates like this, as well as just general Dewey updates can be found at the Dewey blog. Um, and this uh, here, when the slides are shared, this is a hyperlink uh, to that, uh, that blog site. So um, moving along to FAST, um, FAST uh, stands for the Faceted Access Subject Terminology. So it is a, a, a faceted view. Uh, it was created initially as a faceted view of uh, the Library of Congress subject heading vocabulary. Um, it has sort of evolved from there, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but in, in FAST, there's sort of eight facets, um, person headings, corporate headings, um, or organizational headings, topical headings, which would be sort of subjects, uh, geographic headings, um, meetings slash event headings, um, form headings, which um, distinct from topicals are more like genres, so like history or romance. Um, uh, period facets, which are a little odd, so we won't talk about those much. Um, and then title facets, which would be, at least in library terms, kind of like a uniform title for, for something. Um, in total, uh, there's about 1.8 million terms across FAST. 
And um, again, going back to that, um, I mean, your vocabulary is only as good as it's used. Um, fast, there's approximately 400 million fast headings across WorldCat. Um, so that's it's a large, a large number of fast headings. Um, also, fast uh, supports a, a variety of services, um, and you can sort of see those services again if you if you follow that hyperlink. So. Um, just to dig in a little bit deeper, uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with FAST or what what the heck does a faceted vocabulary mean? You know, what, what does facet mean in this case? So um, I apologize, this is gonna be library speak, uh, kind of market, mark format speak, but I'll try to explain it my best I can. Um, these are three uh, Library of Congress subject headings that would appear, that could appear in a mark record. So in a Mark 600 field, which is a person as a subject, uh, we see George Washington, uh, and then uh, his birth date, death date to qualify which George Washington this is. Um, a 650 is a subject heading, um, and this is a pre-coordinated subject heading, which means you need to look at the whole thing to sort of understand its context. So in this case, this is the Battle of Trenton that occurred in New Jersey in 1776 in juvenile literature. So what you can infer from this is that this book is um, it is juvenile juvenile literature about the Battle of Trenton, um, and then the six fifty one is a place as a subject. So in this case, um, it's referring to uh, the Delaware River, which is a river uh, in North America, uh, located in uh, New York, Delaware, and New Jersey. So when this is faceted. What happens is these um, sort of complex um, things like the 650 field that includes sort of a place, an event, a year, and a genre um, get broken out into um, component parts. They're faceted parts. So if you now look at what this would look like in terms of fast, you can see a 647 field, which is an event as a subject. In this case, it is just Battle of Trenton. Uh, which took place in New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey in 1776. Um, we can see juvenile juvenile literature is now on a 655 field, which is a um, sort of genre form as a subject of the, of, of the work. Um, then we can also see uh, 1776 uh, was specifically broken out uh, as that relates to the date that's part of the um, event. The big difference is um, pre-coordinated, which is what LCSH tends to be, versus post-coordinated. So the benefits here are that um, FAST um, is, is by its nature easier for end users to understand and navigate. Um, and by that, it's also um, been determined um, through studies to be simpler uh, to understand, uh, learn, and apply to bibliographic work. So again, just to do a real quick overview of um, sort of what FAST looks like, um, this was doing a search for Columbus, Ohio. Um, the terms here you can see um, are Ohio dash dash Columbus is the term one would be searching for in this case. Um, if you were to click on that, um, it would have a bit of descriptive information. Um, the geographic terms are, are somewhat limited. If you look at terms for uh, personal names like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, um, you'll see a lot more variant forms in the name um, across various languages, um, across various scripts and things like that. Um, but you'll also see sort of the links here to external resources, uh, which again sort of helps anchor this URI or this linked data description within the broader linked data ecosystem um, that is the web. Um, so again, um, uh, talking about this from a linked data perspective, um, FAST is linked data. Um, FAST is published as linked data. It was one of those uh, vocabularies I mentioned that we published, that OCLC publishes linked data back in about 2009 or so. Um, and in terms of using FAST as linked data, because of its faceted nature and its post-coordinated use in bibliographic description, um, it's actually very suitable for linked data. So basically every term in FAST has a persistent URI, which um, you know, even going back to my discussion about Dewey, um, you can't really do with, with pre-coordinated subject headings um, in that there's almost an infinite combination of pre-coordinated or built 
taxonomical numbers or headings you can create. But because FAST is faceted and sort of finite, um, you can support um, you know, link data friendly, uh, persistent URIs for all 1.8 million subject headings uh, in FAST. Um, as I mentioned in that earlier slide, FAST uh, does link out the VAUTH, um, LCSH, uh, Library of Congress subject headings, excuse me, um, GeoNames, which is sort of a link data gazetteer, um, as well as uh, Wikidata. Um, and right now it's modeled both in SCOS and uh, schema.org. So now this is where sort of WorldCat Entities comes in, sort of taking a step up, I guess, um, looking at FAST and Dewey together. Um, FAST and Dewey will form sort of the foundation for OCLC's contextual or con uh, conceptual, excuse me, that was a typo, uh, contextual entities um, in this broader uh, linked data ecosystem that we're building. Um, and actually, in addition to that, um, our membership and research colleagues are actually working on a project right now to map FAST topical headings to Dewey classification headings. So what this will provide, um, you're thinking about it from an end user perspective is um, both classification and topical browsing um, or classification to topical browsing and vice versa. So again, to think about this from the terms of a, uh, like an end user, um, if I um, found a book I'm interested in um, and it has a very specific fast heading, uh, what I could do is jump up to a higher abstraction layer, which is the classification to find additional books about the broader classification of which this book is a specific instance of. Um, but I can also go from the classification down. So if I found um, a classification uh, shelf I'm interested in, I can look at all the specific subject headings and then find resources that those subject headings are associated with. Um, and because of the potential one-to-many, um, there's an opportunity for actually deep knowledge browsing and searching. So again, from a use and user perspective, if I was at a library shelf and found a specific book, if that fast topical heading not only related to the shelf, i.e. the classification I'm on, but also to another classification, um, I could actually find another shelf in the library that might be 15 rows down, down that away um, and find additional resources that would have been very, very difficult to find because those two classifications are so far apart from each other within the taxonomy. Um, so again, um, this sort of then, how does this relate back to sort of that WorldCat entities thing I was talking back, uh, talking about at the beginning? Um, the, these concept entities, again, form the glue that connects together bibliographic resources. Um, and uh, we feel that this classification plus topics uh, combined um, can really help bridge sort of two levels of information seeking. One at the more general, let's say, classification level, and another at the more specific topic, uh, topic level, which is where... Um, most information seekers eventually end up because they're so closely associated with distinct resources at the library. So um, with that, um, I think there's maybe five minutes or so uh, left for questions. Um, again, my name is Jeff Mixter. Um, I work at OCLC and I'd be uh, very interested in hearing what questions you have, but also uh, um, feel free to reach out if you uh, anyone wants to chat more about um, this work or other work we're doing uh, in the realms of uh, linked data. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very interesting new step. Now we have a one question already from John. It's uh, typed in the chat. John? Uh, yeah, Jeff. Uh, at the that was an interesting talk. Um, if there's time, I might have another question now. But um, at the beginning, you talked about built taxonomies and and the relationship to higher levels of customization. And I sort of grokked what you meant by that, but can you say explicitly what a built taxonomy is and how that yeah. affects the customization process? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um so it was it was really meant to distinguish um that type of um 
way to construct or use taxonomies from the from the the fast, which is post coordinated. So fast, there is no idea of like I want to take Columbus, Ohio, and append to it history and append to it juvenile fiction. Basically, in fast version, you just have three headings, one for Ohio, one for history, and one for juvenile fiction. And you basically, it's the responsibility or the expectation of the end user to understand what that means in context to the thing they want to get. Whereas um, um, things like LCSH and, and in this case, Dewey um, are built in that you can build an inf almost infinite Dewey number. Um, so 600 or let's say six uh seventeen dot one three four five eight seven six three two one whatever and it basically the the bigger the number gets the more sort of granular you get i mean at some point it's not infinite i mean there are sort of logical mm -hmm. limitations to this um but it's it was sorry i meant to what i was really trying to do there was distinguish um that sort of pre-coordinated from post-coordinated mm -hmm. um and, and then in the context of linked data um, explain um, or, or convey that that sort of pre-coordinated or built um, can actually be very problematic from a linked data perspective because of this sort of infinite, well, infinite, infinite quote unquote combination of headings you can create uh, becomes very problematic for, for creating persistent URIs for those things. It, it Mathematically, the two get to the same place in a sense it seems to me uh, the, the, when you get to a high level of customization in either case identifying that entity in a unique way is sort of the same problem am i i'm making this up as i go along <laughs> is that right <laughs> yeah again i guess i guess it's um y y yes yeah, that that is correct yeah um okay. and i think that that um, you just, and I, I don't have the stats, um, so I, I, I'm just going to throw some pretend numbers out there. So take this like mm -hmm. the biggest grain of salt possible. Um, <laughs> but what my former, uh, one of my former bosses at OCLC, um, uh, Ed O'Neill, did an analysis of Library of Congress subject headings um, mm -hmm. uh, it used in WorldCat, which is by far the largest um, sort of control vocabulary used in, um, in, in WorldCat and looked at how many of those headings um, had been established and therefore had a persistent identifier for them in the Library of Congress um, subject headings. And it was only like 1% of LCS, valid LCSH headings had a linked data, basically at that time, a linked data identifier that uh -huh. you could assign to it because all the other ones were this combination. Um, yes. So Ohio, and then you could have these sort of floating subfields or geographic or form genre type of things. And again, it's, it's not... Um, depending on you can uh, you can engineer your way around anything <laughs> yeah uh, right. having been a software engineer for almost a decade um you can certainly figure it out but from a, a practical reuse standpoint um it just be, does become problematic for reuse of the data when you have this sort of extremely high volume of yes. uh in this case subject headings that don't have a single persistent identifier for them yeah okay interesting thank you yeah, so Jung have a question now also. Can you speak, Jung? Jung Park? Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I have a question for it um, because I'm Korean. Um, uh, do you have a thing to expand at the local function of uh, duty? We can add, for example, um, some Asian geographic names to T2, uh, Seoul or Daegu under the South Korean. Sorry, the audio is a little hard to hear. So I'm, I'm just reading, I'm reading the question now, sorry. Um, that, that, sorry, that would be a question for our web Dewey product manager. So I don't want to answer that question incorrectly, um, but our web Dewey product manager, um, Alex Curios could certainly answer that question. Um, so what I could do is um, if you, 
I will put my contact information into the chat. Um, if you could send me a that basically that question in email, I will send it along to Alex, and we will get back to you with an answer um, uh, in in the coming days. And sorry for not having an answer for you. Good question. Then they're getting more international. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I could be there. It's just <laughs> now. Uh... Yeah, uh, I'm a professor at the College of Computing and Informatics at Dresden University. So uh, our college is a, a, a very unique one, which combined computing, uh, computer science and information science together in the college. So the current in the college have a computer science and information science, which is the original high school in me. Uh, we have a LIS program, we have a data science program, SGI, uh, and many different programs in this college. And I have participated in uh, this anchor workshop several times. I think it's always a great topic that people talk about in this workshop. And I only give you one second to read abstract. I'm sure you are you can read as far as the uh, chat GPT. Uh, I want to mention that just yesterday I did a talk at Taxonomy Bookend. It seemed to be all these conferences are all hosts at the same time. Yeah, otherwise we might consider to go there. Yeah, that's a, that's a conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have a talk there uh, with similar uh, contents that I'm going to talk about. This is still going on. So the, so this uh, uh, Tessonic Book Camp is part of this K World, K KM World Conference. That's a much large conference. It's still going on. I just come back last night on, on a train back to uh, Philadelphia from Washington, D.C. And just make sure we have good connections. Uh, at home, it would be much better than in the hotel. But last conference, very good conference. I think I particularly like uh, those keynotes. They all talk about uh, how AI's impact to knowledge management, AI's uh, impact on, on taxonomy. So everybody's talk about AI. Well, and I just want to be a little bit more specific. Just talk about chat GPT for text classification. Just, so this is what we are working on uh, for in this workshop. Uh, almost everybody recognizes there is a lot, lot uh, potential opportunities there. And how do we... Uh, utilize this kind of opportunity for the kind of work we are doing. First uh, is uh, is the very, very large, large base as, uh, uh, because of this LM, M uh, model. Uh, uh, I think this is the first time we, uh, we such a large text base uh, knowledge that have been accumulated through, through the deep learning process for that. And everyone will recognize it's, it's comprehensive. You don't need, have to limit it to a domain in order to get access to this. The chat GDP and the interface make it so easy. Anyone can uh, sign up a car, basically sign up a car, start to interact with the, uh, it, it's comprehensive, it's interactive. It's kind of uh, a natural language dialogue. You can listen, yeah, whatever the instruction you give to chat GPT. And the best of it is it will remember. So the conversation can continue. This is also very unique to chat G GPT. The, uh, the conversation uh, is is a continual. Even I uh, just save you uh, almost always save the conversation in your browser. Every time you you log out again, uh, you can continue the conversation. And ChatGPT is also willing to learn and be correct. You if you if you 
uh, let's say you like this term, don't like that term, you tell chat GT, it will consider your input and ge generally uh, the next version of hierarchy, for example. So there are a lot of uh, special features of chat GPT that can be applied to, to the classification. Uh, I just list a few things. This is kind of unique and new opportunity that emerge from this. Along with that, there are also a lot of challenges. As you, that's a lot of uh, people talk about, for example, the, the potentially bias, the bias based on the training base, uh, whatever the text, and this it's all those mostly basically English, uh, the web, the whole World Wide Web that available, that, that collected to do, do the tra training. So that's a potentially bias. And there are perhaps more issues would be the, the copyright issues. LM learn from all these documents. It does not give the citations. It could learn the structure from some some classification. That's a copyright, for example. And if you create uh, a new classification system and uh, a chat GPT create that, it doesn't really specify how the structure are created and based on which one, which even some of the term, for example, uh, are from the same thesaurus, the same uh, copyright uh, system, that is a potential issue. And these are potentially even more is ethics issues. Machine learning is always uh, kind of break apart all the text and then bring it together and does not address just the ownership of that. Will that at least is a, a big challenge when we create new classification based on this kind of chat uh, GPT. So, a lot of these might uh, need to be addressed before we can actually put ChatGPT to, to generate some a uh, practical uh, classification system. For now, is we need to explore these opportunities and challenges. I, I just use this example. Like, and this is everybody's know the chat GPT is very smart and we want to hire him. Uh, it, should we hire chat GPT to, to be our assistant? Uh, then just like we, uh, we hire a new employee, we, we may want to give some question. So in a way we'll, we'll ask the question say, and then uh, give some tasks for it to complete to see if this this would be the intelligence assistant that we would like to hire. Okay, uh, my first question is: Ask ChatGPT what is the solemn development process. I see that is the kind of question. It's very easy to be uh, answered by by ChatGPT. It, it very quickly uh, assemble assemble a. Uh, well, I see uh, a, a good or at least decent uh, definition uh, of the taxonomy development process. The, the, that is a low problem. You emphasize on a systematic procedure, creating, organizing, and managing a taxonomy. So, and in the same time, it will it also give a little bit more detail of the, the, the steps that need to be done, like the planning, content analysis, term selection, and so on. So all these, I see this is the challenge, but yeah, a lot most a lot of these process need to be done by by human or uh, by experts, the main experts of taxonomists. Uh, 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 quality insurance. So a lot of these now will will 
see how the ChatGPT will help through this process. That's what we want, want to test for that. And actually, that is just the, the uh, I can ask the simple simple question. If we, yeah, ChatGPT always give a very long answer for that. So now I want to give you a test. Uh, using the two uh, case studies for that. First one is I'm currently developing a taxonomy of data analytics for small business. So almost every small business uh, uh, want to uh, develop some projects of data analytics projects, then they need uh, help for, for that and consultant want to go to the small business, talk to them. I think they would like to have a taxonomy as a, as a guide to 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 interview uh, the small business owners. So that, that's the background and scope for these, these taxonomy. Mm. Uh, and so that, that is the first a case study and the second the second case is about uh, uh, existing ontology can we use the uh, chat gpt to expand to expand the uh, existing ontologies and we just pick one from the uh, bio on top bio uh on top on top part of for that so let's walk through these two case study. Um, well, there are many ways to interact with, with uh, ChatGPT. You can start very simply, just say, can you create a taxonomy for me? Even that, you will still create one, right? But let, let's, uh, let's uh, example here, is I would just ask, ChatGPT to create, develop a taxonomy on data analytics project for small business. It would give you a, 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 a hierarchy structure there. But the way to, to be a little bit better is we want to be a more specific, uh, give detail, at least give some, some ideas that uh, these taxonomy will be used. These are just examples. Uh, you want to give a purpose of this this taxonomy, and uh, a little bit better is give a, a first level. If we I see uh, uh, when we develop it, we all we have some ideas of what uh, would be the first level of the hierarchy. If you give that, or even a little bit more of that. Uh, explanation. I say the ChatGPT will accept a, a, a very long input. Uh, the, the more ideas that you can communicate with ChatGPT, that it will likely be go to the direction that you envision uh, is create. So this is an example like, like I would give it give the uh, explanation, ask the chat GPT to expand, to expand the, uh, this taxonomy, uh, for example, for each category, uh, you, you can have that and ask it to expand uh, each of these category. Uh, if you ask this is interactive, so I here just use the example, say here are the, here are the uh, hierarchy top level and expand one of these. You will, will create, you will create one, and then you could continue to that. So that I see is the first thing I learned about is that ChatGPT is like a language. We need to learn how to speak to it uh, for that. And in this case, we want to learn how to speak with ChatGPT for the purpose of taxonomy development. Well, that's for example, that's why we are actually doing the planning. We need to clearly do the planning. This is the 
uh, since that tragedy may not be able to provide unless you communicate with, at least with them. So let's uh, def we'll define that and then start to communicate with just like the previous example, like you communicate a scope or objective and ask it to explain uh, each hierarchy, go deeper and, and change it. Uh, ChatGPT can do a lot of things, not just a simple hierarchy structure. It will also define the term. If you uh, request that ChatGPT give a definition okay, uh, of a category or the term, it will all do that very quickly. And of course, we can also uh, modify, modify, remove it, change the structure and ask the uh, chapter to regenerate. But and in the end, we still need to have an expert to review it. So uh, there's a, a, we will not just accept the, the chapter. I see the best use of this, it will uh, generate a lot of good term, good concept that you see, wow, well, that, that, that's a good to include in this. And then we can, continue modify. So uh, this is a uh, continue just some examples of that. If you uh, ask it create sub category for the for the above category means the, the communication is continued. You don't have to create complete thesaurus in one question. You, you can continue ask the question and also Sometimes you will give the whole paragraph as answer if you request using specific term. For example, in this case, use nouns only. You will give a give a good term options uh, uh, for this category and start to adding this. The other way of interacting with ChatGPT is actually we can also put this ontology in use in use situation in application the purpose of creating such a such a thesaurus is uh, to help the consultant to, uh, to conduct interview for example then we can directly ask chat gp to generate questions for a particular category the business process and we ask some questions so create uh suggest some interview question i see that is also a very good use of chat gdt and making connections to the classific uh, hierarchy uh taxonomy or classification or it, it, uh, documents that again this is just another example of uh, a one of the term, uh, one of the concept in hierarchy, we ask to generate interview questions. And you always uh, generate uh, some related question, then the, the consultant using this may decide uh, which question to use for, for that. I think this is also very unique way of interacting with ChatGPT. ChatGPT have a very good the API that allow uh, creating a ChatGPT plugin for for taxonomy creation and management. So the plugin actually this is just simple uh, some programming. It's the programming part is is not complicated. It's it's like idea how we are going to use the plugin. So the the, the more question, uh, I'm still working on these questions. What kind of functions that we want it? Uh, we could develop using the uh, ChatGPT's plugin for taxonomy management. Like typically is that we want to be able to input not just high first level, perhaps we have a 50% develop uh, taxonomy because input a 50 or 50 percent uh taxonomy in that in a file yeah uh, i see using the plugin we can read the whole file uh, as an input uh, to chat gpt that's what 
Chat GPT is good at is the more input, a uh, little more input, it got the uh, the better idea. Uh, he can understand. So you generally uh the branches generate a new hierarchies for that. And so these are just some of the function will do. At least it would be create uh, create a hierarchy, and then we can ask to expand each uh, any particular hierarchy or to uh, in uh, to allow humans to do the editing to uh, remove some or additional term on that and so on. Of course, then we can save this. Uh, for, so that could uh, it can be become a very handy taxonomy management system if we can uh, build a chat GD behind it to support all these functions for that. That is what I'm currently working on. And I hope uh, many of you can also work on different ones that we can share the, the experience for that. Now, the, the second example is here is a ontology. I pick up one, one of the ontologies on, on the bio uh, auto. There is that they give the same questions as say, which one is the ontology published in BioPortal? Which one is generated by ChatGPT? Mm, mm, the, the, and in fact, this, uh, this is the kind of question we plan to develop, uh, work on a study. And we want to talk to domain experts, ask the domain expert to, to, to review this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the same thing is that we, we can have, have that to explain it, uh, which one, which ontolo ontological relationship makes sense to you as a domain expert, for example, and which one uh, have that kind of relationship more, more related to your expert's view. So that, that is it's, it's also a, a challenge. I see your different expert would might have a different view. Uh, that's how we can discuss or compare all this. It's, it's almost like a, a human generated ontology versus this kind of uh, machine generated ontology. Of course, this is the uh, need to have a study, need to conduct a study, just, just some observation based on this, we will see that. Ontology, they are, it, it's more than just hierarchy, right? We, we all know the ontological views that kind of build into it. This is the kind of uh, ideas. And typically that's why I'm looking at the, the ontology. A lot of these ontology is difficult to build complete. And uh, very often is is incomplete uh, imbalance uh, for special purpose uh, for that. Uh, on the other, on chat GDP, it's more like, a, it based on its very large language model. Uh, and then it, it always look comprehensive, cover every corner, the topic that related to, the, to that one. But it very often it lack of specifics lack of specific uh, 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 at the general level. So it, it's a good classification. It will put related things all together, uh, but it, it's, it's still different from, from this. Well, the, the question of well, this is compare. Now it's the question is, can we use this to assist uh, uh, the expert to develop this? We can't trust. So in the end, we can't totally trust the ChatGPT to develop that. The, the question is, uh, well, uh, how we utilize the potential? Uh, what kind of, what kind of 
since the we can ask chip GTD to to do and then we are uh, experts we evaluate or uh, use it for that so I think that's uh, my conclusion is there are great potentials uh, we need to look at uh, both practical and both uh, the check on both the potentials uh, and the challenge. For example, in, in order to use it, we need to learn to speak with ChatGPT. We want to do the developer work and then do a lot of testing. This is uh, this is just the kind of testing. Let's uh, I thought let's uh, let's I uh, ask the question earlier. It's a bio portal. We go through uh, a lot of ontology. Is it, uh, many of these are uh, uh kind of developed and uh, well, well, I should say have been developed there and uh, not really been tested. And uh, in this particular case, we try to contact the original creator, and we we are not able to get the answer from from them. So, uh, but it would be a potential use of this chat GT to go over uh those uh on target layer uh, to do some testing. And then the other is always uh. Uh, lead uh, domain experts to review it and make sure the, the, these are the something useful and particularly for uh, application. We, we want to use these uh, in specific application and see how how the kind of structure will help for, for that. And this uh, since this is a uh, developed so fast, uh, we don't have any best practice. That's uh, uh, all the kind of legal challenge and uh, other challenge is not very clear. If even develop, for example, using ChatGPT develop one, is there any value to publish it or uh, any value to uh to to build into the system or any copyright issue? Uh, all those things are still uh need to be research on for that. Okay, I think I will leave some time for discussions uh, for that. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you, thank you, John. I see there, there are What's several, it? yeah, several oh. comments uh, okay. in the chat, uh, John. Yeah. Great, will ask some questions and, and others. Why don't you take a look at the chat first and then um, see if there's other questions? Yes. I see, I, I see that's first one is John's question it is about uh, how you how you uh, develop. Essentially, is how you compare that. Uh, I say I put the two on top there. I say, that can you tell which one is is the original ontology, which one is uh, is is a uh, new ontology developed by ChatGPT or expanded by ChatGPT? The the goal is uh, for test uh, testing. Uh, is to say which one will be more useful by the domain expert. They, they, uh, it, it can't say which one is correct, which one is wrong. And then for specific domain expert, they may say, well, the, if for this purpose, I, I would like to use this one. The, uh, uh, for that particular purpose, they will use that one. That is the kind of idea we want to develop in the, the, the research questions uh, for 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 domain expert uh, i see we heard a lot of people uh, they talk about they want to use ontology but in, in actual application they feel that the ontology has not been built into their their tasks their, 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 their job so that is the 
things we like to work on. So, so go in the other direction for me. You mentioned mm -hmm. a few times having Chat GPT test mm -hmm. a given ontology, and I wondered what question you would put to Chat GPT in order to make it test an ontology, and whether you're really a lot of what you're getting back is just the aggregated randomized comments and inputs from various people about a similar topic right it's not like it's not like it's thinking per se <laughs> so is there is there a test that you've thought of that you would say this is a good way to evaluate a human developed ontology by chat gpt that, that. I see right now. I, I don't see it's a, it's a, it's a test. I was thinking to okay. how the the GPT will make the ontology more useful. That's a, yeah. that's a way of thinking. Sure. It's okay. a, uh, for for that, and it also a lot of chip uh, ontology is is like a not fully developed. I see. That's why I'm copying the the. People will use it to develop it, uh, develop a more complete ontology. I said, uh, a lot of those are only like a, a uh, like a uh, fifty term, one hundred term ontologies, uh, publish it there. There, that's I really like to see. It. People want to use it. We we'll hope to see it become fully developed ontologies. Yeah. Lovely talk. Thank you. Fascinating. <laughs> um, What's the second question? I wanted to add a comment, if I could. Um, oh, sure. Because it, it, I hadn't really thought of it before, but if you think about it, um, uh, as a taxonomist, if you're a practicing taxonomist, we're generalists, um, and we work with subject matter experts. But in fact, what we do is kind of what ChatGPT is being used to do it's a it's a way to summarize what the general notions are um like you said broad category it's good for broad categories and for suggesting broad structures it's not so good at getting into the details and and, and as and i would say it, it's the same experience in doing it um, as a as a human taxonomist um, we would um, have difficulty telling the difference between what an appropriate method would be to uh, to do uh, some of those detailed um, subcategories, uh, that's really a matter that we would want to go to the experts, just as you just as you say. But to identify what the broad categories are that we want to uh, then elaborate is a, a very useful um, adjunct to the, the way that, that we approach building. A, Building tax building tax on is as generalists. Yeah, I see. The, the, this is a uh, again top, top uh, related to ownership. We have a lot of discussion of these. Like, can still use ChatGPT in class? Because uh, if you uh, you give me a question, the student basically use ChatGPT to answer. Is that? But on the other hand, it can a student write their answer first, and then ask ChatGPT to improve it. Will that be acceptable? Let 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 let's kind of that. The the basic idea are still students. Student uh write the answer. Student uh, will. Uh, for example, professor's question, still a right answer, and then ask ChatGPT to improve it and provide some detail. I get that. I see that it's a, that uh, in, uh, the answer become much improved, but its basic idea is still learned. The question is sometimes it, it's uh, it, it's that clear or still a simply the same time. Like, so if you just enter the question and let, let the ChatGPT answer it. Let the student doesn't do any work, right? Let the student doesn't do any work. Uh, it's uh, still look a good answer. Uh, that we, we say we, we, we would, if we find that, 
let well, the student answer will not be acceptable. Well, well, that is the tricky part. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, let's see, any other questions quickly? Um, and Chris, we should probably move on. Um, this, we could talk about this all afternoon. Uh, Any, does anyone else want to um, uh, unmute themselves and, and enter a conversation with John? With yeah, John? Uh, John asked, uh, mm. I, yeah, I see right, uh, uh, right now, I only test the hierarchy. It's, it's much more, on top of much more link. It's, it's really need to have a, uh, I see a lot of knowledge graph. Essentially, you, you, you want to input a knowledge graph to the, to the chat GPT. Uh, if, if you assume that chat GPT fully understand the ontology, then it, it's, um, the input be, need to be much more uh, complete, not, not only just the hierarchy, for example, for, for that. Yeah, I see that would be for the future, but it will, will be very fast. The last in the near future, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very, very provocative, interesting presentation. I, I think the use cases you presented are are really key ones, and the questions are uh, are very large. And I know we'll be having this discussion for uh, for quite a long time. Um, and just to reiterate what Marcia mentioned earlier, the next workshop will be focused on the AI issues. And um, so we will come back to this in March. Uh, we'll meet again in uh, in Wuhan, China, at the ISCO conference. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So the, the next speaker is myself. Uh, actually, I we are... Uh, had someone um, who decided that uh, who was unable to um, to participate, and um, so I, I reluctantly agreed to. Um, uh, oops, sorry, I'm just going back to the Zoom meeting. Reluctantly agreed to um, uh, give give a little talk. So I'll I'll give a quick talk here. Um, it's it's really. On quite a different um, different topic. Right. So this is um, um, really, really switching gears. Uh, so um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm Joseph Bush again, and um, I'm a consultant by, by practice, and I do lots of different um, kinds of uh, projects. Um, I uh, started out an unusual project for myself, and that it involves um, a, a bigger commitment than usual uh, to um, uh, become part of an organization for at least a year um, and uh, work with them on um, business classification in a records management context. But it's really much more than that. I wanted to talk about this, um, uh, a particular aspect of this uh, here. Uh, so the broad topic is sustainable economic development. I'm working with the African Development Bank, uh, which is based in um, Abidjan and the Côte d'Ivoire in West Africa, uh, and um, uh, it's a multilateral, what's called a multilateral financial institution. And to me, the the interesting thing about this is that uh, there there are many many projects that need to be funded, and there's quite a bit of resource to do the funding. Uh, but the challenge is that you have to go through a very um, structured process um, that. Um, has uh, very strict standard operating practices in order to uh, plan for, um, do the due diligence around, um, uh, make the grant uh, uh, or make the, the funding available 
and then to monitor um, the funding of the process of the project throughout its life cycle. Uh, so there's a, uh, and all of this results in the creation of documentation, the very formal reports. So there's a real need to provide ways to um, to make this as uh, frictionless as, as possible, but it's a very different context than the ones that we've been uh, discussing. Let's just see. Slides. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, so there's a project at the African Development Bank to address this. They call the project uh, Sankofa, but that's just sort of a code name, and um, and it, it, it's really focused on how to capture and store documents effectively and develop the metadata associated with uh, those documents uh, so that uh, they can be captured um, and um, and then handled in ways that are important to support this. Um, this development funding uh, life cycle. Uh, those are all associated ultimately with um, uh, with, with key uh, sustainable development goals based on the, the UN goals, and they focus on five particular areas. Um, but I won't, um, um, what, what I wanted to do is primarily talk about what the connection between classification is and uh, these these sort of broad and lofty goals. So it's it's it, it's basically around the efficient documentation of the projects through the development life cycle. Uh, and to do that, they need to be able to classify the documents um, with the particular project and the project phase. Um, and they need to identify what the type of uh, information is, what appropriate, and then uh, provide the the uh, complete and consistent metadata. So this is different than the biological examples that we saw earlier today, but it has many of the same characteristics just in a completely different domain. Um, and, and many of the issues that were discussed earlier are, are, are relevant here. Um, the particular use cases are a little bit different because this is a, um, 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 uh, not exactly regulated, but it's one, it's a, an environment that, that requires um, accountability and uh, compliance uh, with um, uh, transparency and other things of that nature. So they um, um, it's important to classify the document by what the particular activity is that the document relates to. Um, and then the particular type of document it is. And those then become the basis for um, um, defining what are called record series, which describe the value of the document from a business perspective, and that in turn determines what the requirements are for retaining it in a records management environment. But there's also this public disclosure aspect of the problem, and that has to do with determining which documents should be disclosed, need to be disclosed, and which ones should not. Um, and this is something that we do deal with uh, routinely, for example, with uh, medical records, uh, that any item which has personal identifying information in medical record is something that is very confidential. And the same sorts of issues apply with these kinds of documents, uh, which, are one, which ones can be um, uh, can be uh, disclosed and which ones can't. Um, there are some additional criteria besides whether they relate to individuals, and that has to do with whether they are uh, they relate to what are called sovereign activities, that is between governments or private activities, which has to do with entities which are not governmental. And um, those have certain requirements and agreements around access to information. Um, so to get to the heart of this, what, what's a business classification? It um, is a, basically a, a type of taxonomy. It's not um, not particularly an ontology, I would say. It's a bit less structured and starts with high-level functions, which are um, easily agreed to. What are the key things that an organization does? And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, and then what are the specific activities within those functions? Um, that gets to be a bit more um, uh, complex because it varies from 
um, let's just say department to department. Um, and then there are some things which are the same. There's uh, something on the order of about 68 of them in, the, in this institution. Um, if they're project related, there are some standard phases of those projects. And there's six, I believe, um, phases of implementation that are standardized. And then there are record types. The number of record types is quite large. It's on the order of hundreds, um, it's about, I think, 600 or so now. So basically, you get this um, um, from a high level of uh, agreement on broad categories, um, much less um, harmonization as you get further down this classification. So let's go quick look at some examples uh, to give you the flavor of this. So functions are things that you might recognize they're readily agreed to. There's, they're often uh, standardized in organizations. And while they might be different from one organization to another, these are fairly standard types of uh, framing for the way large uh, bureaucracies might, um, might be set up um, these days. So, and they've been limited to 10, and those are standard. Every entity follows and agrees to those. Um, and, and the um, area in which projects fall is this fourth one, operations, programs, projects, and initiatives. Um, so activities get much more diffuse, and um, this is an example of some of the types of uh, activities that have been identified, um, things like program budgeting or, or uh, capacity building, communication. Some of these are very specific to, or more specific to this particular organization. Others are more general. Um, phases uh, are these uh, standard project cycle management phases, and it's a convenient way to group documents, and there are standard documents um, and penultimate reports that occur in each one of these. And anyone who does large projects knows and is familiar with these kinds of um, life cycles and the fact that there are key uh, documents that are prepared. Um, usually at the end or at a routine period that covers um, um, what, what happens in those particular phases and are required to be produced as a form of accountability. Um, and then finally, records. And these are, some of them are uh, very generic, things like correspondence or budgets, and others are, um, are um, quite a bit more specific. So it's just a small set of examples. Why it's important is that um, the uh, each of the record types in this particular environment um, uh, has two um, uh, characteristics that get associated with it. One is what the business value is, and that's simply on a, uh, there's a, a very simple four-level scheme from, um, from transitory, which means it's not a great business value, to permanent, which means that it has um, and forever business value. Um, uh, and then the security level, and that um, simply indicates whether it's something which is um, public um, or whether it's classified, and if it's classified, whether it's uh, something which is highly classified or confidential, um, or whether it is something which over a period of time, um, the importance of keeping it confidential diminishes and, and, and it can be assessed for uh, for disclosure. The idea is that if you can identify a record type, you can consistently apply a business value and security level so that it doesn't have to be determined, isn't determined by the person who's, or the individual who's um, handling that document. In other words, it, it gets determined by the scheme and not by the, um, and not by the instance. Um, this is just a quick summary of what those two um, types of classifications are. One is related to retention, the other to disclosure. Um, and then the other um, uh, interesting thing about this project is that rather than, uh, and this is pretty standard, rather than defining a master plan and then uh, completely and then implementing it, it's built iteratively. So you begin with um, with for the unit, and you um, determine what the uh, plan is, what the classification is for that unit. Um, when that's approved, it becomes part of the master file plan. It's a little bit more complicated in in, in reality, 
Um, so it's a, it's an iterative process uh, where you build it up over time rather than completing it and then um, uh, implementing it. They, they, it. There are arguments about why it's better to uh, you know, do a master plan first rather than to do an iterative process or do an iterative process. It's mostly a pragmatic consideration to do it iteratively. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing is trying to provide some um, editorial rigor uh, to the labeling process uh, through agreement on some standard, um, some conceptual uh, editorial rules and some um, more um, 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 a, a kind of standard practice editorial rules in order to allow the labels to be um, more consistent and to make it easier to harmonize. Uh, so that's pretty much what I had to say. I wanted to explain what a business classification is, how it can support and um, um, and um, enable compliance with um, the policies that are necessary uh, in this kind of an institution, and and also to provide the kind of uh, complete and consistent labeling that allows for effective and reliable search. Um, and generally, like a good classification will, will be broad and shallow. Um, and that, that's the case here where we have, um, it's not terribly deep. And as you saw, it started with four, I'm sorry, 10 uh, broad categories that then um, uh, were elaborated uh, into four levels. Um, we also provide some simple naming conventions that follow organizational standards. And that all enables this harmonization of variations uh, so that we don't have, uh, so that we have some common uh, understanding of, what, of what's in each of those categories. So that's, um, that's what I had put together for this group. Are there any questions or points people want to describe, uh, to discuss it? I think take some of the things that were brought up earlier in the bio portal uh, or in the, in the general, um, discussion about the various uh, community-based um, um, uh, um, knowledge organization projects, um, it's a lot easier than one institution to try to specify some of these things. But some of these things also need to be specified ultimately in those broader community projects, too. Let's see, I see in the chat there's just one. John is always asking really good questions. Well, I'm really glad you came. <laughs> you've come. You've come to the workshop this uh, this year. Um, there, um, um, there are, are, as you point out, endless opportunities for category overlap. The question is, how do you avoid getting caught in, in category overlap? And uh, you provide a great example: minutes and agenda. There are some that are even. Um, 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 uh, simpler, where you have uh, people who have preferred labels that they uh, that they like, uh, and a good example of that are people who prefer to use acronyms or abbreviations, and those who like to spell things out. Um, so, one of the simple ways to try to um, avoid the um, the category overlap, as you call it. Um, is to is to provide some basic guidelines, what we call editorial guidelines. And I know that that might be more complicated when you approach this as a scientist, but when you approach this as a library scientist or a taxonomist, the idea of having a, a simple set of broad editorial guidelines, um, as mundane as that may seem, is is very effective. I'm not saying that we want to necessarily have a whole handbook, uh, but that we have some, uh, for example, guidelines on uh, what do we mean by a cat by a category overlap, and when should you uh, create a new category as opposed to when you want to um, provide a, a a a scope note or a definition, which explains why you want to include two similar things. Like minutes and agendas in the same category, or when not. I mean, it's a and a good way to do this is to have examples. Um, 
uh, the um, more traditional and simple editorial rules about what your practices should be in terms of using special characters or abbreviations and acronyms versus not can also help with some of this. Um, and it's um, um, uh, in, in, um, if, we're, if we're dealing with ontologies, the ability to have equivalent um, uh, um, and variants associated with a concept rather than having to have a preferred label can make this a little bit easier and make it more of an act, more of a modeling activity than an editorial activity. We're saying all of these um, concepts are going to be, uh, I'm sorry, all these labels are going to be clustered together under this concept and, and modeling in that way, and which, which we do all the time. Um, and that comes then, but it's still helpful to have some guidelines that describe as much as you can, how and why we do things that way. Any other questions? Well, uh, thank you for that. It's very interesting presentation because I also um, studied about record classification scheme. Um, so the project include not only business classification scheme, but also retention period or security classification. So um, is there any difficulties to map with business classification to retention period because it's different things? Yeah, we only get two down in the weeds about records for case management and policy. So, um, um, yeah, so gen generally, um, records, uh, record retention schedules are. Uh, done um, at the activity level, um, ideally, um, rather than at the record level. Uh, so that the rec so different record types tend to um, within an activity tend to have the same um, uh, retention period. And the period we like to refer we, rather than talk about an abstract period of time. The reason we set that time depends upon the value of the or importance of the. Um, of the material that is set. And so for example, a good example that's simple is um, anything related to the operation of the organization is usually considered to be permanent. In other words, you need to know that for the life of the organization. And um, and even if, you, if, it, if it's 50 years or 100 years, it doesn't really matter as long as the organization Organization exists. It's it's you know charter for example is going to need to be there, so that's permanent. Whereas a business document it needs to be kept for a period of time um, to be referred to for legal reasons. Usually, it's determined by law, and it's typically ten to twenty five years depending on the jurisdiction. So, um, but but you know when we talk, let's say the project documents. The business value is a very subjective yeah. uh, consideration. However, getting back to your question, so it, it, ideally it's set at this higher level of activity. Um, in some cases, uh, you you have exceptions uh, because you have just different type different types of materials that get associated and, and it, it doesn't fit meet them. In any case, you uh, typically create the open series independently of this business classification, um, but it is um, derived from the classification. So um, it's another layer, uh, but it's another layer scheme, but it's usually at a higher or broader level than the business classification. And the reason is that business classification is much more concerned with um, documents to be used um, uh, by the um, for, for reference and operations, whereas the record schedule is much more concerned with complying with rules and regulations. Um, so you, you want to do that at a, um, at, a, at a more procedurally convenient level. That's the best I can explain. I'm not really a records manager, so I'm a little bit over my head 
here, but uh, I'm working with the records managers and um, uh, to create a record schedule in under this. Mostly it operates in that way, except it's broader level, usually with activity. And in some cases, we make exceptions and split that record series because it happens to be more heterogeneous. Does, does that answer your question? It was a different job. Okay, we can talk at lunch. Uh, speaking of lunch, we have um, um, at this point in the schedule, um, uh, we have a one hour um, slot um, for eating. <laughs> lunch is probably just matched with the other workshops that are going on, but we were going to take a one hour break and then come back um, in one hour uh, for. Uh, I believe we have four more presentations scheduled in the afternoon, and then we'll go back to the um, second part of the panel that we had at the beginning. So thank you very much, everyone, for um, oops, for joining us this morning uh, for the first half of the workshop, and we look forward to um, um, Seeing people, some of the same people and different people in the afternoon. Perfect. Just like my house between the beach. I'm going to place to be right there. Okay, apologies, we just had to load up all the papers. It took a minute. Um, so we'll, we'll move on with the program. So our first speaker this afternoon is, is Sophie Chen. Um, we'll be talking about um, modeling ritual activities of intangible cultural heritage. Um, we heard another presentation of hers earlier at the DCMI conference, so I'm very excited to hear about this one. You can introduce yourself a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Sophie Suji Chen from Academia's Sinica Center for Digital Cultures. Um, today in this session, I would like to use one of the rituals in Taiwan as a case study uh, to discuss how we uh, model intangible cultural heritage. <laughs> so uh, the intangible cultural heritage includes uh, the traditions and practice, uh, practices passed down from our ancestors, such as the uh, oral traditions, uh, conforming arts, uh, social customers, and rituals. These treasures are vital for preserving cultural diversity and promoting intercultural dialogue among diverse lifestyles. Universal salvation, or uh, in Taiwan we call it uh, Kudu rites, is an intangible cultural heritage observed in the seventh month of the lunar calendar in Asia cultures. The main purpose of this ritual is to honor the uh, deceased, hungry ghost, and the ancestors, making this period known as the ghost month. The fifth, the fifth days of the seventh month is also celebrated as the Zhongyuan Festival, or we call it Hungry Ghost Festival. The name and specific ritual uh, practices may vary across different regions and countries in Asia. The case study exam Taiwan's Pudu and uh, aims to create a model that in integrate this event into its cultural context while um, hopefully to managing diverse documents. 
because the performance of the Pudu rice can vary between countries and regions. This study initially examined the 2020 event in um in a, a small township uh, of the Taiwan, we call it Shishan Township, uh, as a case study. It analyzed the ceremonies structure and the process through on-site observation and interviews. Relative, uh, relevant documents are currently available as part of an online exhibitions on the Digital Museum of the uh, Rural Taiwan website. Uh, and as you know, in the uh, digital museums, uh, they provide some um, search the database. We can uh, one user can very uh, can just uh, search one uh, one image, but uh, the user couldn't know uh, this picture or this uh, this image is belongs to uh, which part or which process of the whole. Uh, uh, the whole um uh, future uh, uh whole events. So uh that's the reason uh and motivation I would like to build on uh, this kind of uh model or we call it ontologies. Um uh, do rights is an event consisting of several activities, each of which include multiple sub-activities in their sequence. The entire a uh, ritual, uh, ritual event can span weeks and is considered a structural hierarchical knowledge organization system. In Taiwan, Hudu rights are typically divided into, as you can see, four phases. Uh, one is the uh, pre preparation of sacrificial offerings, uh, God inviting process, and Hudu worship. And the final is the closing the gate of hell. So um, in this study, I have two questions. Uh, one is how can we reuse the existing event-based semantic model to propose an ontology framework for describing the multi-layer event structure of Kudu rights? And the second is, how does this ontology represent the ritual events related to Kudu rights in ancient countries? The study reviewed common event-based models such as the event ontology, uh, load C.CRM and schema.org, uh, uh, the event vocabularies before we creating the uh, model. The core classes in Pudu event-based model include uh, event, place, person, organization, object, activity, time, and concept. And uh, finally, the CWCIM was selected for designing the event-based ontology for Pudu rights because it can describe the various forms of cultural heritage and also distinguish event concept and handle hierarchical and sequential relationship between events and activities. Taking the Pudu rights and example, the study has proposed a data model for religious and cultural events. As the model structure on this slide uh, demonstrate, all the detailed components of an entire event can be organized and defined with hierarchical or sequential, uh, sequential relationship. So the proposed model is, uh, is event-based and primarily designed following the CWCI model, an overview of the class and property elements reused in this semantic data model is presented on this slide. For example, the entire God inviting process and its sub activities during the 2020 Pudu rise in Shishan Township can be described using a semantic method as shown uh, on the slide. Uh, the sequence of various ceremony, 
ceremonial activities also becomes machine readable data when, it's pro when this proposed model is applied. Based on the example mentioned earlier, the religious and cult cultural event model can describe a ritual event and its sub-activity. However, in practical situation, event process may be recorded using various media types, such as a photography, audio, or video clips, which could capture the same process or a sub-activity of a ritual event. Therefore, effectively organize, organizing these documented resources is crucial to integrate event metadata with diverse published or mm -hmm. unpublished documents. Um, so uh, in this study, the cultural heritage in digital environment, CHDE model developed by the Professor Skimodo at the University of the Cuba uh, offers a practical solution to meet the research need. Following a mapping process, the CHDE model can manage various types of record, uh, record resources related to a ritual event. For instance, a photography of the religious assembly of Pudu ceremony held in Baoan Temple in Shishang Township uh, in 2020 can be integrate, integrated into the C, uh, CHDE model, illustrating its structure in both the physical space as an offline resource and also the digital space as a URL based uh, digital document. So um, in this um, in this CHDE model design, use the class uh, here you can see uh, here there is a uh, uh, this model um, we call it uh, instantiation is defined as the concrete manifestation of intangible cultural heritage. And it can also be mapped to a CWCIM's class as E7 activity, the right hand side. <clears throat> Thus, the instant initiation classes, a class, serve as a connection point to integrate CHDE with proposed model. Uh, allowing it to link metadata description of all activity within a ritual event as structures in the model. The property, uh, uh, the property RDFS uh, see also uh, over there can be used to connect the instance of CH, uh, CHDS instant initiation with the instance of uh, E7 uh, activity in the proposed model. And uh, this linkage enables the reconciliation of metadata for a ritual event and its digital resources within a semantic uh, framework. When integrating the CFDE model with the proposed uh, model, instances of intangible cultural heritage events and their hierarchical ritual processes can be preserved and transformed into machine readable data set. So uh, from a cultural perspective, perspective, the concept of Pudu rights is part of the broader category of religious and cultural events in Asia, which center around the worship and respect of ghosts, ancestors, and the past lives to enhance the practical reuse of the CHDE model. We expand it to describe related concepts 
such as the Purdue rice, using the scarce vocabulary to enrich the uh, uh, the class C H D E I C H class within the model. This promotes the integration of the similar religious and cultural events across regions. Also, uh, clarified, distinguished, and highlights the religion, uh, regional cultural context of specific mm. specific inta inta uh, intangible cultural heritage. So as a result, the Kudu rights concept can be associated more broadly with Zhongyuan uh, festival in Taoism and closely linked to similar concept found in Asian countries with rules in the Buddhist religious tradition. So here we can see uh, we using the uh, uh, scarce cross match. Uh, we can connect to Japan's uh, uh, the similar uh, they are uh, actually a uh, long time ago is the uh, the same rules and the Korea uh, and the ch uh, ch Chinese and also uh, Vietnam. So uh, through the proposed model, specific intangible cultural assets, such as the uh, rituals or uh, vegetables can be structured and standardized. When integrated with the CHDE model, this ontology can manage resources in both physical and digital spaces, facilitating their reuse in digital uh, exhibition. The integration of the religious and cultural event model with the CHDE model offers several fundamental, uh, several advantage for digital curation or we call a digital uh, exhibition. Uh, for first one is it provides a fundamental model to convert exhibit ex exhibited resource metadata into link open data enhancing the reusability and findability of curated object within the semantic web. The second is uh, to uh, the standardized model designed for uh, the religious and cultural uh, events allows managers to popul uh, populate curated object with structures uh, data, thereby uh, facilitating resource reuse and item management. Uh, the last one, uh, the advancement is the uh, with the semantic model design. Curators can conduct database searches to determine the quantity and types of resources related to their curation topic before structuring the exhibition content. This helps in understanding which resources can be displayed on the uh, digital museum. Using the concept of an object warrant, curators can uh, meaningfully arrange and organize curate, curatorial content, confirming the availability of objects for display in each curatorial unit. unit. So in conclusion, I uh, would like to highlight uh, a couple of uh, points. The first is the study developed a model for describing the hierarchical and sequential unit of religious and cultural events and integrated it with the CHDE to transform event metadata and associated uh, resources into an accessible database, data set. The study applied SCAS vocabulary to expand the usage of CHDE's class for intangible cultural heritage. This enabled the integration of similar and related concept of intangible cultural heritage from different regions and distinguishing them through various types of relationship. And uh, in the future, we are um, plan to 
uh, make further development in the following ways. Uh, first is to uh, utilizing data resources from the online exhibition on the Pudu Rise in Shishan Township within the Digital uh, Museum of the Rural Taiwan as material to implement the proposed model. This data will be converted into the um, link data and evaluate the usability of the model's design. Uh, second, uh, hopefully completing the entire integration in the model design and release it as an application profile, serving as a guide for further reuse. Uh, the last one is uh, we'd like to introduce the uh, FAIR principle into the data model of really religious and uh, uh, cultural events to enhance the accessibility and reusability of cultural events. So uh, thank you, that's my presentation. Yes, so are there any questions online or in the room? Um, okay, then I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> I think you, I think you discussed it a little bit. Um, I, I, uh, you decided to use the the CDOC CRM um, as the basis for modeling events. Yes. Um, but you mentioned several others. Could you um, um, maybe just explain again briefly um, why you settled on CDOC CRM and not the others? Um. Yes. Oh. Uh... Uh, we uh, actually uh, have done, we pick up uh, uh, currently or uh, ontologies or data models uh, which mention or uh, design the uh, event, uh, event uh, classes or property. And then we find out uh, uh, the CDAC CI and this one can fit mostly to our needs. So that's the main reason. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any any questions? No. Just for the report. Okay. Have you seen the example um, of the object mm -hmm. which is adapted the model? Um, you mm -hmm. mean on the real case? Yes. Yeah. No. Um. Lastly, um. Uh, thank you for your question. That's uh. Uh. My reason. Um. The motivation I. Uh. I doing the research is uh. In my institution, there is a very uh big uh digital museums, and one of the uh exhibition is uh my colleagues and I went to this township, we to observe this ritual. Uh, for the uh, two, two or three days, and we uh, take uh, we took a lot of pictures uh, uh, for these uh, uh, events. But when we uh, come back, we digitize them and then upload into the uh, museums. Uh, the only way we can have the just like the storytelling is uh, we we have done the uh, exhibition online exhibition. But I am thinking about if one user just uh, search uh, one of the material from the exhibition. Actually, uh, he or she couldn't understand uh, that's the context. For example, this photography is belongs to the second stage uh, of the activities. So uh, I am just thinking about if we could have behind the, um, the database, we have this uh, kind of ontology then uh, in the near future, uh, when the user search this photography, uh, we can in the, uh, on the interface, we can tell him or he uh, or she, um, this photography is belongs to a uh, which storyline. Yeah, so, so this is just a proposal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? 
Oops. Any other questions? Hey, thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a great presentation. So, um, so we can let's go forward. So the next presentation, I think, is Tom. Right. Okay. So Tom Baker, um, who um, most of you know as the technical director for the Dublin Court Technology. Technology director. Sorry. Um, he's going to talk about uh, work he's been doing um, recently with the. Um, um, you know, U.S. National Agricultural Library's thesaurus, right. um, and I'll let him explain explain it the way he would like to. Okay. No, thank you. One minute. So, you need your phone. Oh. 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 Uh, maybe that, please. Yeah. Okay, and then view, and then. Let's see, this is, does this work? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Page down. Okay. Oh, no, it doesn't work. It should be view. Um, full screen menu. Ah, okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Is this the microphone on? Uh, no. No. Is it on now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to be talking now about the um, NAL thesaurus, which, as you'll see, has been uh, is being renamed in a sense. Um, and it's a rather technical talk, but I, um, if you are interested in the details, if you of uh, SCOS, uh, you will find that part of the talk interesting. But um, if you're not really familiar with SCOS, I'll try to um, focus on the general ideas. Um, so, but there is a lot of technical detail. So, um, okay, so we have a project called NALT for the Machine Age. And um, its primary audience is researchers at um, U.S. Um, uh, Department of Agriculture and um, the uh, research institutes affiliated with USDA. And the themes of that project are um, to redefine or to build up the NAL thesaurus, NALT, as what we are calling a concept space. I will uh, describe that shortly. Um, there is a part of the project that is um, focused on automated subject indexing with machine learning. And there is a part of the project that is about integrating agricultural data using shapes, uh, checks in particular. Um, and we're doing that in in uh, partnership with the uh, with a research group in Spain. Okay, so I wanted to just start by um, saying that uh, the design of SCOS, SCOS was designed according to the principle of minimal ontological commitment. Um, that's a, a term from Thomas Gruber, who went on to create Siri. Um, and the idea is that it, um, that one makes few claims about the world being modeled and allow users freedom to specialize uh, those uh, concepts as needed. Um, so in a sense, SCOS concepts are just names for things. And SCOS broader and narrower hierarchies do not uh, imply the set um, and subset relations of RDF class hierarchies. 
And um, when SCOS uh, was published, it was the um, pub the uh, W3C working group um, encouraged uh, ex experimentation with novel usage patterns. So we are um, experimenting with some uh, with some usage patterns that are um, uh, that are well. Uh, if not entirely novel, then uh, in this context, um, uh, novel usage patterns. Um, so uh, SCOS concepts are disjoint only with other SCOS things, such as a concept scheme. So anything can be a SCOS concept, um, including, for example, an RDF property. So um, you can say that uh, that NALT concept one, two, three is a SCOS concept. And you can say that it is um, a, an RDF property, and that is consistent with the SCOS data model. Um, this is actually done in, in, in practice, for example, by uh, uh, the Library of Congress. Um, so if you take the mark related term actor, uh, it is described as both a SCOS concept and as a property. So what does this mean in practice? It means uh, that if you have the concept actor as object um, and you're using the uh, URI for the um, mark relator um, term, you can say that Sunset Boulevard, which is a movie, um, is about an actor. Um, if you use it as a predicate and all property, um, you can say Sunset Boulevard has the actor Gloria Swanson. So we're embracing this idea um, of punning uh, because there are concepts in the in NALT which are very much property-like. So for example, Mike Renner, uh, it's a way of, um, uh, it's a quantitative measure of uh, cotton fiber uh, fineness and maturity. And uh, if we use it as an object, as a SCOS concept, we can say that a given research paper uh, is about Mike Renner. Or if we use it as a property, we can say that uh, cotton sample, one, two, three, uh, some cotton sample has a Mike Renner value of whatever, one, two, three, four. Um, so, um, a SCOS concept is um, then um, can also. This is also this is this is a little, we're not we're not quite sure about uh, whether we want to go this far, but in principle, it would be possible to um, to pun some concepts as classes. So um, uh, it would not be inconsistent with the uh, with the SCOS data model to say that. A given concept in NALT is both a SCOS concept and an all class. Um, now, um, obviously, a concept. Well, um, this is something to discuss discuss over a beer, but uh, should not be both a property and a class. We can't think of any sensible um, a sensible way that that uh, uh, should be done, um, but. Um, we haven't, uh, we're not, we're not sure about punning with classes. So we want to point out that, um, that this, um, uh, yeah, is not compliant with description logic. Uh, you might want to have, um, it would be um, cleaner from an ontological point of view for people who are, who care about description logic to have uh, separate concepts and properties and then to somehow relate the concept for Mike Renner with the property for Mike Renner. 
Um, but uh, the point is that um, it is uh, when you're dealing with um, uh, with researchers who are going to be modeling their domains, um, it's hard to explain why one would need to have uh, two URIs for two different things, one a property and one a SCOS concept with the same definition. Um, and the links between those URIs would need to be um, maintained. Yeah, so, um, so I should say, um, I should have put some slides in at the beginning. I'm going to, uh, what we're trying to do in the project is we're trying to, we're reaching out to communities of practice in the USDA community. And we are working with them to um, uh, turn vocabularies that they use kind of pre, we call, we think of them as pre-semantic vocabularies because they are not defined with URIs, but they have vocabularies of their own that, that they have definitions for the concepts, for the things of interest in their, in their specific fields. And um, they uh, are trying to move in the direction of linked data. They're trying to move in the direction of linking their, integrating their data, making it possible to integrate their uh, data with data from other communities or with weather data or with soil data, um, that sort of thing. And if they, if you are moving in that direction, uh, you need to, uh, think of it in terms of you need to 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 essentially you need to use RDF because that is uh, the consensus model that we have for generic depiction of data for the purpose of integration and um, um, alignment. So our approach is then um, so if we if we if we accept that, it's easier to um, explain uh, to users that um, the um, that the concept uh, or to not not to um, get hung up um, trying to explain the difference between concepts and properties, um, but take a bit of a more pragmatic approach. Um, then uh, the idea is that we want to declare certain selected concepts um, uh, as properties um, as needed. Uh, and these are concepts for properties like Micronair, which is essentially a property. Um, and we want to be able to use that also as an RDF property. Um, we're considering, we're talking about maybe, you know, declaring others as classes, uh, but that's a little bit trickier. So we haven't come to a clear conclusion about that. Um, so, uh, but certainly we need to ensure that concepts are not declared, that are declared as properties are not also declared as classes, because to us, that seems like a bridge too far. Um, and, uh, but if we did declare some concepts as properties, then we would be able to use them as um, uh, with RDF type um, in order to uh, uh, create discriminator triples for data shapes. So, uh, I'm aware that I'm introducing some jargon here, which may not be, um, uh, which you may not all know, but we can we can circle back to that. So um, we want to use not URIs in data shapes. Um, what is a data shape? A data shape is a, um, it's like a regular expression. If you know, um, in, com in computer languages, a regular expression, it, it's, it's a pattern for your data that's, um, that can be matched against your data in order to validate your data, to make sure, uh, to, uh, test whether your data conforms to a uh, particular um, uh, pattern. So uh, here we have a, um, 
uh, an excerpt from a Schex schema uh, that is uh, intended then to validate a sample of cotton fiber. And um, uh, it has, uh, it uses NALT concepts, properties um, of, um, uh, of cotton sample data yield and micron error. And, um, and it also extends the shape of um, um, uh, one needs to picture that these patterns can kind of build on each other. So you can have a pattern for crop samples and then you can have a pattern specifically for cotton samples and you can link them and, and one extends, extends the other. Um, so um, formally, a um, set of concepts are in a concept scheme when they're declared to be SCOS in scheme. Uh, so here we have a uh, concept scheme called NALT core and various concepts are, are declared to be uh, in that concept scheme. Um, uh, so, uh, but we want, we're moving now to what we call a concept space. A concept space being essentially a, a large a namespace of concepts that contains or that um, also where the graph contains um, multiple possibly overlapping concept schemes. So you can have a concept like animal welfare. Animal welfare is, um, uh, is part of, um, of NALT generally. It's also part of what we call NALT core, uh, and it's also part of the concept scheme that we created for the Animal Welfare uh, Information Center at National Agricultural Library. Um, so um, the, um, the um, yeah, the Animal Welfare Information Center uh, concept scheme focuses on concepts that are relevant to animal welfare. So the idea is that we have one null namespace Within that namespace, we have multiple uh, overlapping or potentially overlapping subschemes, uh, concept schemes within that uh, within that uh, larger namespace. And so we have right now we have um, NALT. We call it NALT full. That's the original NALT uh, seventy six thousand concepts. We have um, something called NALT core, uh, which is a subset of frequently used concepts. We have something called NALT taxon, which is a large subset of things that are taxon have taxonomic rank, um, and uh, a um, uh, a concept scheme for the Animal Welfare Information Center, and then um, other. Uh, concept schemes in the pipeline, for example, related to pollinators. And each subscheme has its own top concepts and it has its own hierarchical um, relations. So that causes a potential problem because hierarchical relations cannot be contained in or limited to a specific subscheme. So all hierarchical relations are in principle global, are no, not just in principle, but in practice, they're, they are global to um, the graph uh, in which the concept scheme appears. So um, just simply adding different um, subscheme hierarchies would, uh, would increase poly hierarchy across uh, all of the concept schemes, and it would make it difficult to um, distinguish the hierarchy for any given subscheme, which may be different from the, because people, when they organize concepts, they organize them according to different uh, principles. Um, and, uh, and we want to enable um, uh, groups, organizations to define their own hierarchies 
that may be a bit orthogonal to the hierarchy of uh, nults as a whole. So the solution <coughs> is to maintain nult um, in a back end graph that we call the nult source, the source graph. Um, and the source graph is uh, the graph from which we extract standalone SCOS subschemes uh, for publication on the web and loading into SCOSMOS, uh, which is a uh, concept scheme broader. And this graph does not have any standard uh, SCOS hierarchical relations. It only has subproperties of uh, SCOS relations. So for example, um, you have um, you have default hierarchical um, subproperties, broader source and narrower so source. Um, and then for each subscheme we define, uh, in addition, we define subscheme specific um, um, uh, hierarchical relations. So um, subscheme specific properties like um, broader core, which is uh, specific to the NALT core subset um, concept scheme, it's um, it we can use that in NALT source when we need to uh, in order to um, uh, uh, reduce the amount of poly hierarchy in the source in order to correctly display hierarchies when they're being edited um, or maintained in Bookbench, and in order to um, bridge gaps in a subscheme with respect to the global hierarchy in a case where um, a, a subscheme may be much simpler um, from uh, than the global NALT uh, hierarchy and you don't need all of the hierarchical levels that are found in NALT. You just want to skip one or two and list um, a an organism, for example, as a um, as a laboratory animal, um, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so um, uh, this is awfully. I see that this is taking longer, a little bit longer than I thought. So I might speed up and uh, so fasten your seatbelts. Um, this is uh, I'm just going to sort of flip through some technical detail here. Um, uh, but if null source says that A uh, has broader, you know, I think I'm gonna skip this. Um, if, if it's it, um, this approach uh, base, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that this, um, that this, um, this, this, this explains how um, having um, uh, sub properties of the uh, hierarchy allow, allow us to avoid problems with the global hierarchy. But I'm going to skip over this detail because, um, okay. So we have this null source, and we when we it comes time to extract the subschemes, we load it up. We we um, if we're extracting null core, for example, we delete all references to concepts that are not in null core. Uh, we convert the null source hierarchy to SCOS, and we run some SCOS uh, quality checkers and make fixes, and we have a. Um, a plain SCOS uh, vocabulary um, concept scheme for, for NALT core. Um, okay. Um, okay, so our mission is to help researchers semanticize their controlled, controlled vocabularies, vocabularies they already have. Um, we want to um, map their terms to terms that already exist in NALT. If um, we need to create new terms in NALT, we create them. And where a community wants to have a, um, a coherent, maintained subscheme, 
with its own top concepts and its own hierarchy, then we can in turn turn uh, a vocabulary into a sub scheme and and uh, and they can take it from there. So why semanticize the data? So it's to in support interoperability as fair data. Um, it's to give uh, URIs to the concept that are uh, concepts that are globally valid with uh, NAL persistence guarantees. Um, it's in order to capture uh, authoritative definitions, which often come from um, authoritative USDA sources about how certain concepts uh, should be defined. Um, it's in order to give each concept a synonym cloud. Um, so uh, if um, the same concept is used uh, with slightly different words in different contexts, we want to capture that in the uh, concept scheme. We want to map to um, other uh, concept schemes or concept spaces. Um, we want to map to Wikidata, we want to map to Agrivoc uh, and to others. And we want to have a basis uh, for data shapes, for example, as normalization targets. So um, we, our guess is that future machine learning applications will not have a problem handling this punning. Um, that they will tolerate, maybe even leverage a certain amount of poly hierarchy, um, that uh, this is perhaps not the um, the issue that it was in tradition, more traditional thesaurus um, uh, uh, creation and curation practice. Um, we, um, we believe that having domain specific sub schemes, such as a sub scheme on animal welfare, can help us uh, improve indexing quality for specific domains. And uh, we're looking forward to having some help, uh, potentially from AI, in proposing new concepts um, from the from the literature, from um, uh, mapping to other. Uh, concept schemes, detecting inconsistencies, or generating um, helpful visualizations. Um, so, yeah, um, this is work in progress. I could, I, I think I've used up my time, but if one, two, three, I could add another geeky sort of um, detail about how this works if we have a few minutes or okay um so uh given that the researchers will be creating these uh wikidata like these checks schemas as normalization targets um the um uh the idea is to list potential um uh, to have uh, lists of potential shape properties um, hardwired into NALT. So uh, like schema.org, um, schema.org has um, lists of properties that are grouped under uh, what they call types. And so um, our, uh, our plan now is to model these as SCOS collections. Uh, why SCOS collections? Because they're really kind of just flat lists and they don't really relate to the NALT concept hierarchy per se. So we can embed that information without, without um, regard for um, the, uh, how that relates to the concept hierarchy. And they can be nested because sometimes data shapes extend each other. So we, we want to be able to capture that. Um, and we want to help researchers draft uh, what we call boxologies. Uh, I love the term boxologies. Boxology is any uh, model that can be expressed with boxes and arrows, which is a brilliant, I think, uh, simple um, uh, definition for something which one finds in many forms. Um, so, um, 
And so one, we might think of this as a, a boxology for, um, uh, for cotton data. Um, and uh, the, uh, so maybe we'll call them NALT boxes um, uh, because the, these, these SCOS collections that, that hold flat lists of properties. And well, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I haven't, um, I hope that the main ideas at least came through for any of you who might not be um, really into SCOS enough to, to follow the, um, uh, the main idea is that we want to um, help researchers make their data fair. And by doing, and to do that, we want to help them um, create uh, their own vocabularies for uh, about the things of interest in their field, the classes, the properties, um, and we want to uh, we want to make that easy for them to um, to draft a boxology to turn that boxology into a set of data shapes that can be used to normalize and to validate uh, data um, for purposes of data integration and uh, other purposes. And that's what we're trying to do. And all this technical detail is about how uh, some of um, how, we're, how we're trying to do that. So that was my presentation. Oh, thank you. I think I thought it was terrific. Um, if I could just, there are a couple of points that I that I picked up on that I think are um, are, are topics that have been discussed um, in the I don't know in the in, in possibility yeah. for a while. For example, um, the and uh, I think it's very helpful to be able to think of SCOS as a way to um, kind of discuss some of the ugly details of things that people want. Yeah. So for example, a subs, uh, the idea of using sub schemes yeah. to do micro, what we used to call micro Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's also, uh, it, uh, also all the discussion about the, uh, the, the little messy things about, um, um, uh, uh, you know, multiple parents. So probably higher yeah. the, the, the unpronounceable word. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That shall not be mentioned. Um, so I, I think this is great. And then finally, um, I think the, um, the the notion of thinking about um, um, about using boxology. I've never heard that term before. Yeah. Um, but, but boxes and arrows, or yeah. sometimes circles and arrows, um, as a, as a as a means for subject matter experts to discuss, or you know, whiteboard. Exactly. Yes. Come to a consensus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What they're what they're doing, and then yeah. have that be be an input to, to you know to to render. So we can say, well, SCOS becomes a means to an end. Yes. You know, here. So some really lovely, uh, lots of very um, interesting points um, that, that I I picked up on. I, I don't know other people. Do people have questions or observations? I think this is really interesting. Oh, and also the the whole idea of semanticizing. Mm. Um, an existing vocabulary, which yeah. would be inherently flat, yes, um, maybe with a little bit of shape to it, but not much. Um, and, and this just adds so much value in it and uh, to what you know. It's useful to have a controlled vocabulary, but not as useful as if we can synthesize and create these relationships. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Good, good stuff. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can uh, only agree with that. Uh, I, I think um, using SCOS kind of as a way to do wireframes. Use SCOS what? To do wireframes. No, uh, SCOS uh, collections. What did you say? SCOS in general. Oh, SCOS in general. To use the concept schemes yeah. and use the toolkit of SCOS yeah. terminology yeah. to draw things that are very whiteboard friendly yes and then also connect them to properties and classes so you don't initially commit to that yes exactly i think and exactly. i mean generally it's useful to use scos broader roadmap 
to match. I, I even used it to match classes, so I learned very much for that. Yeah, I think it's useful to be able to do it without the ontological commitment. So, uh, so, so, yeah. The comments. Anyone online? Okay. Um, I guess uh, let me just check the schedule again. Uh, I think we're. The car ahead. All right. Oh no. No, no. We're we're where we want to be. So okay. we we were uh, supposed to have a break at two fifteen. So we're, oh, okay. It's okay. We're about five minutes um, over. So why don't we take a quick break? Um, uh, most of the people are online. So, okay. so why don't we just take a quick break here for about uh, seven and a half minutes, okay. and then we'll we'll come back and um, we have two uh, two presentations, one online, and then Ziyang is actually here. So um, we'll just uh, we'll go mute for about seven minutes and come back and and have a couple more. Glenn, we'll be ready for you in about seven minutes. If people don't get 100%, that's okay. Yeah. Because, well, I think it's, 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 Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Can you hear me? I'm online. I'm online. I saw you're trying to do something on the screen now. I'm, I'm uh, Glenn and Chow Yawa from Singapore. Uh, hi, Joe. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can't seem to hear anything. Oh, shucks. Hi, I can hear you. And this is our break time. Until uh, yes, I understand it's a seven minutes break. So okay. I was hoping to take this opportunity to load my slides. Oh, is my slides already there? Uh, ready here, or do you share yours already? Uh, okay, hang on, please. I, I, I don't see, bec because I only see your face. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so will you share your screen? Okay, let me share my screen again, huh? sorry. Um, share screen, share screen. Do you see anything? I can, ah. uh, I can see yours. Yes. Yeah. yes, I think now you now we see. Okay, we are good. So we just wait for everybody to come on board later. Thank you. Okay. But, uh, wait. Uh, also project there. 
जो पूछ this is Kickstarting our uh, uh, bigger cash. Yeah, it's on the edge. Um, it's got um, um, I haven't seen anything like this. Um, no, it's written. Yeah, it's written, oh. written, down, written down. It was off the site. Off the site was off. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Glenn. Yeah, uh, can, can you see my slides on the screen now? Yes, we can see them on the screen. And um, I think uh, what we see is what everyone, everyone sees on their Zoom call. Um, so we still, uh, we're waiting for the, <laughs> for the one, minute, one minute to... <laughs> To turn to two thirty. This is the most complicated arrangement you've ever had. <laughs> it was much easier when it was just virtual. <laughs> okay, thank you for thank you for being patient. So, um, so welcome back after the brief break. Um, and we we have two more two more papers that we um that are um in the next session, uh, which is um. Uh, uh, about named entities, and uh, I think both, yeah, both papers are going to be talking about named entities today. Uh, so the first um, um, the speaker is um, Len Hogg uh, from the National uh, Library Board in Singapore, and um, so I will um, turn it over. We can't see your screen right now, so if you want to share your screen again. Thank you, Hi, sorry, I'm back. Hi. There were some connection issues. Uh, you hear me loud and clear? We hear you loud and clear. Great, great. You had lunch? We had <laughs> Okay, okay. We had lunch here. We had our break. Um, you want to share your screen again? So, sorry? Um, we can't see your screen. We want to share the oh, screen. You can see my screen. Oh, okay. Let me try. Yeah. Um, share the screen. Because I realize you do it from there is a problem. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, I hope you guys see something now. Yes, now we see. It's clear? Is the size and everything is okay? Yes, everything looks good. So it's over to you, okay? Um, you can do more introduction if you'd like, and um, we'll stop at the end for some questions. Right. So we use this, forget about the big one. We just use it for the sound. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Sorry. Uh, are we starting or waiting for the participants? Uh, um, no, we're all set. Um, we're starting. We have um, people online. We have people in the room here. Um, so we're starting. Please. Okay. Good, af uh, good afternoon, everybody. Maybe I switch on video just to say hello. Um, hi, this is I'm Glenn, and this is my colleague, uh, Yawa. So we'll be doing the sharing uh, jointly. Okay, thank you. Okay, anytime um, you can't hear us, just, just type something in the chat. Okay, um, today we are sharing um, the contributing of the Singapore name entities to Wikidata. What we share may be a bit different from what was shared earlier by the various other presenters. So I don't know. Anyway, we'll we just share what, what, what we have. Um, gosh. Okay, so that's the agenda for our sharing. Okay, NLB, NLB stands for National Library Board um, of Singapore, name entities, and also uh, how we contribute our entities identifiers to uh, Wikidata. Okay, some just some, um, some background information from our corporate site. In the National Library Board is in charge of the public libraries, the National Library, and also the National Archives. Okay, so these are some of the statistics um, to be shared. I think I'll just run over this. If you are interested, you can come back to the slides later. Okay, and uh, more statistics, which is quite the norm these days. <laughs> okay, so what are name NLB name entities? I mean, another word that is used interchangeably is I think name authorities. Okay, essentially. It is um, unique standardized names uh, of, it, it's not on topics, but it's on people, organization and places. So essentially it's for, um, to allow consistent, unambiguous reference to these uh, entities. And main purpose is really to improve uh, search and discovery to a more uniform access of, uniform description of all these entities. Okay, some examples you can see here is uh, blue boxes are uh, examples of the people's name we have. I think um, some of the names probably will look familiar to most of you. And then in green are some of the places names and um, the gray are the organizations. Okay. So, okay, what, what, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the semantic web. Uh, what, what can machines do? Okay, I think machines essentially are able to make connections uh, a lot faster Okay, and it's very powerful for um, information retrieval. So what NLB did was, uh, in the, we had strings like what you see on the right, like uh, the, our first Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and this is established in the tradition of name authorities, right? So what we have done in NLB is we have gone through a process, uh, it's still ongoing, okay? A process of transforming these strings into... Um, Link data entities, like something like this. So instead of uh, just a string, now you have a HTTPS, okay? Or what we call an NLB identifier, right? So these identifiers, as most of you would have known, is understood uh, by machines, also usable by humans, I suppose. And it basically uniquely identify people, organization, places, and more, right? So... Um, this, we have exposed this in Wikidata. This is just part of the uh, building block to enable future discovery of our print and digital resources, okay, as link open data. So as I said, some of these work are still ongoing, but uh, this part of the work is part of the building block or the infrastructure. 
Okay, so essentially we are like um, parachute into the whole semantic web via Wikidata. As a, okay, uh, so what is Wikidata? I uh, I will just briefly go through. If you, you are familiar, bear with me. Okay, essentially it's linked data, it's structured, it is uh, human and machine friendly, used in various applications such as these. I think you've probably seen the Google Knowledge Graph and the Wikipedia info boxes, as well as the digital assistants like Siri and Alexa. In fact, if you read some of the recent articles, I think even a lot of the AI engines, they're actually mining Wikidata to answer some of the questions. Okay, so um, a lot of people confuse Wikidata with Wikipedia. Uh, they're not the same, obviously. So uh, how are they related? So on your right is what most people will be familiar with, a Wikipedia article, or let's say on the Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, right? So um, I will just click on the golden magnifying glass to enlarge this piece of info. So some of this data here uh, comes from Wikidata like this. This is how Wikidata fits um, uh, in Wikipedia. One of the users, I wouldn't say that's the only reason why Wikidata exists, but if I understood correctly, this is one of the things that Wikidata does. Okay, so uh, a bit about Wikidata essentially is, is uh, the structure of Wikidata, it is essentially RDF. So you have like uh, on the left is a sample Wikidata record of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Wikidata record, not Wikipedia. So it essentially made out of trippers, subject, predicate, object, or item in the language of Wikidata is language, item, property and value. So an item is always prefixed with a Q. Apparently that's the, the letter of the first, of the name of the founder of Wikidata. The wife, sorry, the name of the wife. Yeah, so uh, then you have properties, okay, which is a lot. And finally the values. These values can be a literal, it can be an identifier or it can be another item. So if it's another item, essentially this relationship is the properties is actually an object, what is called an object properties, okay? Um, so what does Wikidata do? It serves as a linking hub for URIs from different institutions globally. So uh, some of the examples will be like the uh, Library of Congress, the German National Library, okay, the GND. And so NLB identifiers are also linked to the corresponding Wikidata uh, entities. That's what uh, we, we have done. And that's what today's session is really about. When later my colleague uh, Yawa will share the, need, the nuts and bolts of how this is done, okay, from NLB's experience. Okay, so, so our identifier here gets also plonked into Wikidata for discovery by the semantic web, okay? By, uh, so essentially we created uh, same as what in our is one of the same as relationship with the our our identifier with the Wikidata entity. Okay, so why is the purpose of this? Um, like like me mainly for discover global discovery. So look at the catalog on the right. This is from taken from the uh, example that we have found from the University of Wisconsin. Okay, so a traditional catalog looks like this, pretty bare, has subjects, have title, and all those stuff. But with what is out in the semantic web on Wikidata, potentially the catalog is enhanced with what you saw here, information from the web. Okay, because this book is about Lee Kuan Yew, so you could draw more information, pull more information from the semantic web, and the catalog is enhanced with a lot more info. Okay, some of it you can see the source is from DPpedia, some is from Wiki, Wikidata is also one of the sources. And at the bottom, the identifiers on the web, if you go to the same record on Lee Kuan Yew uh, in Wikidata, you'll see all these identifiers contributed by different agencies like Library of Congress, VR, you know, and then what, what does it do? In terms of discovery, if a user select an identifier, it goes to the, the page of the institution and then related resources get discovered. That's how I believe the whole promise of plugging our bibliographic records in the semantic web for everybody down the road. Yeah. Um, okay. So I will hand over to my colleague Yawa where he'll go through some of the tools we explore and then how it is being used for us to 
uh, stick our U identifier into the Wikidata record. Okay, uh, can I just have a quick sound check? Everybody is still hearing me well? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Great, thank you. Yawa. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so I'll be going into the details of uh, how we actually go into uh, matching and uh, populating our uh, NLB name entities and identifiers into Wikidata. Uh, before we contribute to Wikidata, we have to come up with a process. So this is basically what the process is. We first have to create a new property for the NLB ID, and followed by uh, identifying the list of the Singapore related entities that are available in Wikidata. And from there, we have to match this if, uh, with our, our own NLP entities. And finally, from there, we have to populate all these NLP entities ID into the corresponding Wikidata entity description. So uh, this actually leads us to think what are the tools that are available to help in to, to complete all these tasks. Okay, so first of all, we need to create a, a property page for the for NLB ID. And we first uh, we have to seek help for the gay data community on actually how to proceed with this. They also uh, set by step back in the wiki data to on how to actually to propose a property for authority control. So uh, basically these are the data that we are needed, things like the label description, uh, what the data type, and we have to uh, finish with a sample uh, URIs and as well as the formatted URL uh, to actually to complete the, this proposal and to, uh, to actually to get approval by the wiki data community before we can go on to create a new property for our NLB IDs. And these are how the property page looks like for NLB ID with uh, various uh, statements that describe this property. Uh, we begin by uh, populating the identifiers uh, to a manual method it means we basically is to look up uh, the all these uh, Singapore related entities that are available in the uh, Wikidata, and from there we have to add in the our NLB identifiers uh, in manually item by item. Uh, we found that it's a very time consuming process, especially when we're working with a huge amount of data. So we definitely need some uh, automation to help us in this job. So uh, basically we need a, a tool uh, that can actually help to help us to automate the, the process of matching of the, our names with that in Wikidata at the same time to populate our NLP IDs into the corresponding Wikidata items in bulk. Uh, so we go about to actually to search for some of these tools and we stumble upon this page in Wikidata, how to contribute data to Wikidata. And we found that this uh, dimension two tools uh, is a mix and match and open and fine. We begin by using the tools mix and match to, we, uh, we hope to actually use this tool to uh, match our NLP entities with that of the Wikidata item based on the label. And we try out with using some, um, some sample NLP entities, but uh, it ends up with a uh, great failure. <laughs> Uh, a lot of this actually is uh, in display in error, and we can't uh, successfully match any names uh, on, and we can also populate the, all the our identifiers in Wikidata using these tools. So we continue to experiment with uh, various uh, online tools, and we finally shortlisted these three tools: uh, Wikidata Query Service. Open define and quit statement. But we realized that uh, none of them can actually complete all the tasks uh, within using just one tool. So we have to com so after com comparing the pros and cons of each tools, we find out that we have to combine these three in order to complete the task uh, that's required. Okay, sorry. So basically, this is how the three tools uh, work together uh, to identify the list of Singapore related entities. In, it required the Wikidata queries to, to complete this task, whereas the, the, uh, the matching of the, the uh, name entities with the Wikidata, we have to use OpenAI. And the populating of the IDs into the Wikidata, Wikidata 
uh, you have to use uh, the quick statement. So uh, we found that by combining these three together, it's, uh, it's actually a time saving uh, process in, uh, to, be, to be effectively to complete the task. Uh, so what is OpenLify? Some, some of you might uh, heard of this OpenLify tool to, to clean up messy data, but uh, it's more than that. Actually, we can use it to, uh, to match the labels uh, of our uh, NLP and name entities with, uh, with that in uh, Wikidata, as well as mapping the attributes of a name entity to the corresponding properties in Wikidata, and uh, finally to populate the data into Wikidata in bulk. Uh, this is how we first prepare our data in Excel before the, the, uh, the reconciliation in uh, OpenLify. Uh, we have, uh, by, we are actually uh, preparing this data based on columns. So we actually, each of the column header represents the, the NLB name entities uh, attributes. Uh, for names, they are actually like for people, because in the library tradition is to uh, convert them, is to, is, they are established in the inverted Format. So we have to convert them into the direct format before we can actually reconcile with uh, Wikidata. And we also add in other information like the, the variance form of the English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil names to help us in uh, to uh, to actually to help to open the file to identify the, the uh, entities in Wikidata that we require. And we also add in other information like the FID, uh, the nationality, place of birth, that contains the value of Singapore. So this will help us to actually to, to narrow down the results when we match our data with that, with that of uh, the type of wiki data. And last of all, we, the, the important thing is that we have a column on the NLB ID so that all this can be uploaded to wiki data after the reconciliation process. Uh, this is how the page looks like after the reconciliation. Uh, the, the one at the top you can see here is uh, those suggested matches that uh, actually uh, been reconciled after the reconciliation with Wikidata. Yeah, because they can't find an exact match for this. So they, they, so they actually uh, suggest some of the names that actually is quite similar. Uh, at the one at the middle is actually, it mentioned that actually there's no matches. So it will suggest to you that you are, can either create a new item or you have to search for another match manually. And finally, the one in the dark blue, it indicates that the name has been successfully matched with the Wikidata label. So once you confirm that all the names have been uh, reconciled and matched uh, successfully, uh, there's a, this function called schema, whereby you can actually use this to map the attributes of Wikidata with the, with the attributes that in the NLB uh, name entities. And from there, you can actually pull all these, uh, their corresponding values into the, uh, into wiki data. So uh, there's a preview page to, for the user to actually to view, to ensure that all their values have been mapped correctly to the corresponding wiki data properties. Um, you, there's a, the user can use uh, the OpenLify to upload data to Wikidata, but uh, we found that actually quick statement is a better choice because we have some uh, not so unpleasant experience uh, when we are uploading through the OpenLify, to, to, to upload data to OpenLify because it's, there's no alerts from OpenLify with the data fields to upload. And there, there's also some uh, unstable, instable part of OpenLify that we find that actually you succeed in uploading some of the data, but not others. So uh, what is quick statement? Uh, basically, it's, it's the use of a text command to edit and create Wikidata items. Uh, you can see from here is uh, the use of the command sequence syntax, or you can use it uh, in the form of, uh, you, can, you can export the data out in the CSV file format, and from there use a converter to, uh, to convert into the quick statement uh, the sequence index that you can uh, see over here. So this is how the uh, exported data is being converted in the, uh, into the quick statement format. And from there, we can import all the data into the uh, Wikidata. 
And this is another way of doing it is to uh, basically to import the data out in CSV and from there use a converter to convert into a quick statement and from there upload into Wikidata. Okay. And this is another scenario whereby you need to create a new items because some of these, there are some matches where we can't find any uh, names that actually match in Wikidata. Basically, it's not existing in Wikidata. So we need to create a new item. And we need to uh, basically to use this quiz statement to create uh, uh, some, of the, some of the information like the label, description, instance of, and from there to upload our NLB IDs to that. So you can see here that uh, there's, the, there's actually a column that's a left bank, the identifier. So once we upload the data it, uh, to, to Wikidata, it will create, it will automatically assign a new uh, identifier to our newly created item. And uh, another thing about Christmas is that it will alert you on any error. So you can see from here, it will uh, alert us that if our description actually exceeds more than 250 characters, it will send out uh, alert and we have to actually define the data from there. The third tool we use is a Wikidata query service. Uh, basically, it's a, a query, basically it's to obtain the data by using uh, Sparkle query by through the use of uh, RDF triple statements. So in the example here, we are trying to obtain a list of the people that are born in Singapore that are found in Wikidata. And all this, uh, all this data can actually export out in uh, CSV format. And from, from there, you can use this data to match back against our existing uh, NLB name entities. Okay, for those who are not familiar with uh, Sparkle, there's actually a dumb dumb version called the Wikidata Query Builder, uh, whereby you can still construct a simple query, uh, we, even though you have no knowledge of uh, Sparkle. Okay, so we basically we are making use of uh, properties like place of birth, country, citizenship, that contains the value of uh, Singapore uh, to find out some of these uh, data that actually doesn't, it actually fails to pick up when we actually uh, use OpenDefy to match with our uh, NLP name entities. So this is actually a quite a useful tool if, if we want to uh, complement it with other tools like OpenDefy uh, to find out which are the gaps that actually doesn't pick up uh, during the previous reconciliation. But there are also some limitation of this tool because uh, things like, uh, because there are also people who are actually born outside of Singapore or they are country of citizenship minor based in Singapore, the part they've contributed significantly to Singapore. So these are the type of uh, limitation which uh, this uh, query service won't be able to pick up. And also find that this, it takes longer time and effort to actually to do all this matching using the uh, various uh, Excel list. Uh, and also much of the verification still required the human uh, judgment to uh, to actually to verify and to assess uh, the whether these are the same entities that are found in with our local name or name entities. Uh, so you can see from the graph over here that the majority of the work actually is still done by human. Okay, so this is an example of uh, how actually automation doesn't uh, works quite well, uh, and it's it's still, we still require the human judgment to complete the task. So uh, one example is this, uh, the, the same label, those, uh, we, there's uh, two wiki data in this, in this case, but they actually share the same name. So uh, for this case, what we, the open define won't be able to do a good job on this, and we still need the human to actually differentiate uh, these two entities and assign according to the the NLP identifiers to the respective Wikidata entities. And this is another example uh, of another scenario whereby the uh, uh, one entity in uh, Wikidata actually can represent two concepts. So this is a hotel, but this is a, it's a hotel, but at the same time, it's a both uh, organization as well as a building. So in, uh, in our NLB name entities, we treat this as a set, a two separate entities, but in, in Wikidata it's considered as one. So we have to do some prioritization to 
to prioritize each uh, identifier to be assigned to the to that uh, Wikidata item. And in this case, because the, that this hotel is uh, more known as a national monument, so we have to use the identifier in our building or the, you know, the building of our name entities to assign it to the to that uh, Wikidata entity. And there's some of the other challenges is like we have to convert names to in the in the forms, especially for people to into the direct form. And there are some names that can be quite generic, especially those uh, non-authorized names. So we have to uh, be careful when we, when, when we are doing uh, some of this uh, automation in, in the matching. And there are some, uh, so there are some limitation in the matching is that uh, they, they might, the open if I might find the next batch match with that, you can, if they can't find the exact match. So this will end up with uh, some inaccurate results. And we found that actually also like the use of VFID, we have to use the exact ID instead of the whole URI. So we have to continuously experiment and define the canvas in order to improve the result of the matching. And uh, this, this actually takes up some, some of the time also. Uh, so what has been achieved, we, we managed to uh, Expose of our, our NLP name entities, uh, with the, as well as their link data, into the wiki data platform to actually allow more people to uh, access our NLP resources in a way. And at the same time, we also learn how to apply this uh, new using the online tools such as Open Define Quiz Statement to automate some of our process. We managed to uh, Engage with the, some of the online committees, the Wikidata committees, as well as the uh, Open Defined committees, committees to help us in our work. We take on our knowledge and expertise actually to, to actually help us to improve the process of uh, uh, matching and populating uh, our data. And last of all, we managed to upload more than uh, 4,800 names of. Singapore people organization and places in Wikidata since 2020. And about 39% is a uh, new creation. So these are, these are some of the, actually the help links that we seek help from, and also some of the context we actually uh, been seeking help in our, in completing our, this project. And also some of the uh, tools, the, the videos and the, the, some of the help page that actually that we use for, for our OpenEFI reconciliation. So uh, this is the end of our presentation. So thank you. Uh, if you have any inquiries, so just feel free to draw us an email. Uh, this, you can see over here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was really um, a deep dive into into, into a, a problem that uh, many of us face in terms of mapping identities. Um, a really useful presentation and a really helpful set of resources. So thank you very much for the case study. Um, are there any questions that anyone has specifically? Mm -hmm. See, we have one not even in the chat. I think it's it's a thank you <laughs> for the references. I think we all I think we all agree with that comment, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I know you guys are wondering whether this would be this would be of interest. It's of great interest. We may not want to discuss it a great deal, but um, when we um, get back to our offices and start working on our our own mappings, we'll be definitely in touch. <laughs> you know, ask you if you have to run into this situation. Yeah, quite so. Yeah, it's just really helpful just to see what the plus minus points of the so. Definitely watch the video again too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely watch the video again too. I mean, it's, it's a lot of information that sort of flew by, but which uh, merits really a, a, a slower and a more careful reading. Uh, great work. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, okay, so with that in mind, why don't we move to the next presentation? So. Um, so, so um, Zealand Park, who's here, 
um, will be spot. Um, this is a, a little bit different, um, but looking at a, kind of an under um, an, an under exercise type of named entity, the translators. Um, and um, I think there's some interesting use cases that that she has, and that um, people will find um, will find interesting. Can you stop sharing? Yeah, can you stop sharing the screen, please? Uh, Glenn and Hong, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Glenn, can you stop sharing again if you? Do we need to do we need to stop sharing? Yeah, we stop sharing. We did. Okay. So here we go. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jia Park from Hanson University, South Korea. Um, my topic today is linking bibliographic data to hidden knowledge workers, uh, that is translators. This is a project overview. Uh, our project initiated in nine, uh, 2019. So the first phase is over. So the project transitioned to its second phase from 2022. To 2025. Um, it's, our project is about to construct a translation database and about uh, about a German literature translated into Korean. Um, critical reviews are written for representative translations, and both bibliographic data and critical reviews are published in. Uh, on wiki page. So I'd like to share the wiki page. Uh, this is, um, yes. Can you see this screen? It's written on Korean, but we can translate this into English using browser translation. Um, so, so the name of the database is Videco. Um, the meaning is German. So, um, you can browse the translated literature by the name of the work. For example, it's written in Korean and German. Um, if we select the Korean index, you can see this the name of the work and the Korean and the German. Another access point is by author of the original text. For example, it's a Korean uh, Grete, Guantagras, and you can also access the German name of the author. If you click some author, you can see the list of the work. For example, um, Demian is very famous. You can see the title of the work and the short sentence, the paragraphs and the birth date and 
the date of death and the number, the type of the work, and it's the simple introduction of the work of our translate English. So it's a introduction of the work the mean and it's information about the first edition and it's a long list of translated bibliography lists in Korea, the Damien is translated over 200 times in Korea. It's, um, it's all in Korea because I translated it in English, but the original text is in Korea. Something like this. Um, more than 200. Uh, two, 146 times were translated in Korean. And this is a critical review of the translated text. It's um, kind of the critical review of the translated text. You can check this text. Uh, during the project, I think I missed something important, and that was the translate, uh, translators. Uh, translators are vital mediators in transferring the literary works from one cultural environment to another. But their contributions often remain overshadowed by the original authors. Actually, in the example of the Videco database, only the index of the original authors can provide, and the translators are hidden somewhere in the key pages. So it is necessary to identify groups of significant German literary works that have been translated into Korean and to pinpoint the key translators who have been crucial in translating these selected works. And it is also needs to systematically compile a comprehensive list of works translated by these main translators. I, I want to call it the bibliography universe of translations. So, this is the original version of the Faber model published in 1998. Um, we usually consider the translations as expression of a work. So the red box expression is linked with um person or a corporate body. The relationship is the expression is realized by Person. That so the translators cannot be a creator in this model. Uh, but the more recent model, the IFLA library reference model, uh, some things are changed. So the new entity agent is more upper level than person. So work and expression have the same relation was created by or create. So expression is also created by agent and the translators also can be an agent. Now another concept, a representative expression is also added in the recent library reference model. And the representative expression in the model means idea or original or canonical expression among other expressions. So, for example, the end users intuitively understand that William Shakespeare's Hamlet is linked to the English language and that his literary form is a play. So, um, we usually consider the representative expression of a work of Hamlet is a Shakespeare's English text 
and the literary form is a play. Work-centered bibliographic model is also can be seen in original title and creator model. Um, when we call the main title or story record, for example, Hesse Herman Carr is a name of the original author and the Demian is the title of the original text. So where is translators? So I bring up some ideas. Uh, there is a representative expressions in cultural context. So how about general users who read literary works with foreign languages? Actually, Korean people read what that work in Korean. So translator is a creator who can produce representative expressions in the aspect of cultural diversity. So who read German literature in translated text? There is a representative expression in Korean, maybe. For example, what are you reading now? That is uh, some conversation. I read the Mian all night yesterday. Oh, really? How was it? Can you read it to me? So if they are Korean, they are written or Korean too. So you, uh, the, in the Wideco website, we checked uh, 246 translated Korean text of the Mian. It's a some sample of that. So um, I modify some library first order. It's a classic view, work centric view. Uh, when we call the original work, some original author create original work and is realized through expression one or the other expressions. So uh, expression, the first expression made by original author, we usually call it representative expression. And the second expression made by other foreign translators, um, we, we did not consider it a representative expression, but um, if we change some point of view, the original author create work one and work two. Also, they are realize the original text of their work. So work one and, and expression one is made by original author. How about this translator centric view? If we start from the translator, we uh, first we can go to expression, not a work. So translate translator create expression and the expression is realize some work. If a translate or uh, if a translator translate two uh, two words, they are responsible for two expression. Uh, this is an example of the data. Uh, the translator's name is Park Pandok in Korean, and we usually um, use the Chinese letter to disambiguate the name and the personal ID AP00179 is the ID for the translator and we add some external data. The one is the authority ID of National Library of Korea. So the KAC20131751 
39 is the uh, name authority ID of the National Library of Korea. And the easy number of Bakpandong is like this. So this Bakpandong named uh, or translated this title is the uh, all of the German literature and the personal ID, the, uh, they have the same personal ID and the different publication date and the character of the translation is all different and it's publisher's name and the text ID is the um, ID for the book and the work ID is the ID for the work. So the text is means the book and the work is the the literary work in the book. Um, so the translator Park Han main expression want is the German title is uh, the Black to Man is a uh, Korean is Yang Chol book and the other work he translate the Bear Bundle in Korea is Pyongyang. So Park Han the translator has two expression of two different work. Um, in the second translator that review is there are two translator is a different person. So if two person translate the same word, I think they can be linked um, with the word. For example, uh, Park Hwan Dao translated the work and also the other person translator Kang Du Shik also translate the same work. So uh, the Korean title is Malte e Suki. So one work and two expression and two translators, they can be linked. Um, you can see the example. So the AP0001 Akhanda create the translation of Marte Suki and the other translator Kang Dushi. His number, ID number is AP0001, also translate the same work. So the two person also linked because they translate the same work. Uh, in this matter, uh, we can list of the translated work by individual translators represent the intellectual and artistic effort of the translators. And by analyzing the list of translated work grouped by translators, we can gain valuable insight into the translators' preferences and their creative collections of translated work. And by connecting translators who translate the same work, the relationships between the translators can be linked. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Zina. Um, I think this is a, a really nice um, illustration of the um, of semanticizing um, personal names, uh, which we normally don't think about. Um, and um, looking at the uh, relationships between the works and um, and these sort of hidden um, named entities, which are um, very important for the expression, but are frequently not. Um, Treated as a primary access point. So, um, well, thank you. Um, do uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm such an interested in when you said it was part of the difficulty. Sorry, it's a result of difficulty um, identify who the translates is where. Um, was this because it's often not obvious from the resource itself who has done the translation, or is it that you're going back to your 
metadata which may be created at the time in the past when it wasn't necessarily standard practice to record who the translator was. Sorry, can you can you tell us more? Um, is it easier if I don't use the microphone? <laughs> we only need the microphone for yeah, for recording. For recording, but it's okay. We we set it once. So. Um, it was rude to ask um, when you said about identifying who the translators yes. were. It was that um, really if it was going back to older metadata yes. where it perhaps wasn't standard practice to record this or whether it was difficult from the resources themselves to identify the translator that the translator's name didn't appear on the resource. Um, maybe... The main reason I think we did not pay attention to the translators as much as the original authors. So in the national name authority record of the library, National Library of Korea, um, the name of the translators are often missing from their authority record. But in our project, there is a professional German literature researchers so they can verify the translators or, or to find the metadata to, um, to add to their, um, our database. So it's actually really a case of asking researchers to do this work. It's, it's really sort of asking the researchers to assist you with it. Uh, yes, it's, it's very effective, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, just to say that we are um, uh, that we're recording the session, and everyone should be um, aware of that. Um, uh, um, recordings are available afterwards. Um, the um, uh, so the um, refer the after, after the workshop, the um, uh, presentations, the abstracts will be are, will be available on the NCOS uh, workshop webpage, uh, and I put into chat the uh, links to the NCOS pages if anyone's not familiar with them. The um, Joseph gave an introduction to the um, NCOS workshop series. Uh, this is a NCOS is an informal network dating back uh, to 1997. Uh, and um, we have um, the, um, uh, uh, an effort into um, uh, creating the um, presentations which are available from the NCOS a website along with special issues, different um, uh, arising from the workshops and um, various other resources on network knowledge organization systems. So Marcia, uh, as um, uh, organizes the um, and um, curates the, the uh, web page for us, which we're very grateful for. And um, there's also uh, uh, the European workshops. There's a, uh, also a, a, a repository, a GitHub repository of, of them. So the workshop as a whole had um, both um, this uh, extended panel, um, across different time zones on terminology services and also other presentations, um, uh, individual presentations, which again, I'd recommend. Um, so we're um, uh, on the, um, in this um, uh, panel and um, uh, the, um, on terminology services, I think we've got, um, presentations across the whole cost life cycle, uh, as we see here. Uh, broadly, we have both aggregate uh, portal services um, for collections, for repositories, portals of repositories uh, of, 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 um, of different kinds of costs, ontologies, thesauri, classification schemes, um, um, et cetera, terminologies. Um, and um, the, uh, so we're having presentations on um, uh, uh, portals, bio, 
uh, and um, uh, also individual cost services, um, both creation of services, creation of costs, and using them in, in actual applications. Uh, I think both we're looking at um, now looking, um, taking advantage of new developments in technology, and we're looking to make connections between uh, different costs, yeah, uh, mapping, uh, uh, federated search, other um, uh, uh, um, annotation services, uh, ways of um, connecting, joining them together, using them in, in real applications. Um, so in the um, thinking about the um, focusing on the uh, panel on terminology services, we've um, what we've um, uh, as previously been presented, we got off to a good start with the um, uh, presentations we see here, uh, the bio portal uh, and the onto portal uh, technology uh, framework that um, has uh, arisen from it, med portal, um, uh, instantiation of the onto portal and the OCLC past and GUI services. Um, uh, uh, um, providing a kind of faceted uh, interface to uh, some of the OCLC services. In uh, the, um, uh, the second, what we're just starting now, the second phase of the panel, uh, we're going to have a presentation um, from Clement just in, in a minute on AgroPortal. Um, the um, uh, uh, following on the, um, the Onto Portal um, uh, framework theme. Then um, there's a presentation used on a different um, uh, portal, if you like, um, uh, terminology, uh, uh, technology from the, um, the COCO Upper Ontology Cloud from uh, uh, National Library of Finland. Um, and um, then we've got a presentation on uh, uh, link conservation data um, uh, on, uh, from a network on um, uh, 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 creating and linking um, vocabularies, terminologies connected to um, uh, uh, conservation documentation. Um, uh, presentation on the Chinese iconography thesaurus, um, very rich uh, uh, thesaurus dealing with uh, applying uh, icon iconography to uh, uh, Chinese uh, application and um, the Bartok repository uh, on um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, another form of um, portal, if you like, um, on, um, uh, which is a, a major um, uh, uh, kind of federated effort um, to uh, uh, provide a, a repository for different um, library um, uh, science style. Well, not just library classifications, but others as well. So um, I'll stop sharing. That's just a quick, uh, very quick intro. Um, we'll, uh, I think, then move to um, um, the um, start the presentation with Clement. Uh, I'll um, I'll say a word about the um, Clement. If you want to start sharing, I'll just um, um, uh, say a word of um, introduction. I'll keep introductions very brief so as to leave um, leave time for the uh, presenters. Uh, Clement um, Jeanquet is a senior researcher, director of research at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, INRE. And um, he's going to be talking about the uh, agro portal. So um, uh, over to you, Clement. You do confirm you see my screen, guys? Yes, I can, uh, I can see your screen. That's fine, and we can hear you. OK. Uh, okay, well, uh, I want to say good morning, but, for, but maybe probably good evening for some of you. And uh, 
thanks for thanks for having me um, around in this session. Very happy to see that that the NCOS workshop has a has a focus on terminology service. Uh, uh, and very happy to see that some of our work, uh, including uh, presented by John or Xiaoling this morning, was was featured or presented there. Indeed, we we spend um, uh, some energy uh, in um, in developing ontology uh, repositories or terminology service. Uh, now we also use the term of semantic artifact catalog, which is a term that um, we see more and more emerging in the context of the the European Open Science Cloud in Europe. Uh, the notion of semantic artifact has also um, been used. Um, uh, I would have historically preferred to use cost, but uh, anyway, I was not the one choosing or pushing for that term. Okay, so today I, I know that the, the ontoportal technology, bioportal and medportal were presented. I'm going to give a, a, a little tour of, um, of uh, agroportal, one of the tools that we are working on, on uh, on the, uh, and and especially the one we are developing at INAE. And then I wanted to, to have a focus on what I call the browsing of SCOS resources in AgroPortal. So I will explain how why SCOS is a very important format for us. Um, uh, in agriculture, we have a lot of resources there and I wanted to show the improvement of the technology that we have done um, with respect to that. And as you said, as a quick introduction, I'm now I'm, I'm an associate as, um, researcher at the University of Montpellier, and um, and working at NIA now. And it's been a few years, more more than 10, 12 years that I'm working now on ontology repositories, historically on on, on bioportal and and then agroportal, but also different application. Okay, so let's let's uh, just say a word about the context of of that. Just you know, to to tell you a little bit about the the project that we are founding there. We we have a, a project called Data to Knowledge in Agronomy and Biodiversity. Uh, it's really a linked data project in which we develop AgroPortal as one of the uh, provider for 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 resources and semantic resources to build knowledge graph in agronomy and biodiversity. And we are pushed by even driving use cases. Um, <clears throat> And, and this is a project that is funded by the French National Research Agency. And uh, the other context in which we are doing this is really the Ontoportal Alliance that was that was introduced this morning with, with John. That is really something uh, pushing for the synchronization and the mutualization of research and development effort with respect to, to ontology repositories. And you see the, the updated the screen of all of the instance that the Alliance is kind of um, uh, uh, developing with different groups, <clears throat> addressing different communities and different scientific domain, uh, including the two one on the left, BioDiv portal and Earth portal that have been released about a, about two months ago, and of course uh, uh, the historical uh, connection with BioPortal in the middle. And AgroPortal was more or less one of the first, uh, probably the first one to be very uh, um, active as a public repository, following the same philosophy that BioPortal, but in the agri-food domain. So John probably mentioned that beyond the beyond the the, the ontoportal initiative is that notion that we want to maximize the ontoportal value in terms of services portfolio a portfolio of of services things like that we want to improve the software but also increase the numbers of persons that will get to the semantic world also by 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 addressing them with more specific. Uh, of a portal and also increase the long-term ecosystem health, uh, financial health, uh, financial and support in terms of finding a model also for supporting our our program, our our portals. Okay, so let me just make a, an introduction to 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 our portal. Maybe I, I will focus on on a few aspects here that that were not presented by my colleagues. So so. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably pass quickly on some of the slide, but I know we have a little bit of time, but I don't want also to, I want to keep some maybe for exchange right after the talk. So uh, yes, uh, um, AgroPortal, I mean, I usually start by, you know, talking about issues with ontologies, vocabularies, or costs. Uh, they are spread out in different format, different size and different structure. This is the numbers of ontologies. And um, they are represented in variety of representation language. That diagram, that diagram image was there uh, even before uh, SCOS was, was there, but now we also have to deal with SCOS. And they are overlapping. You know, every time you start dealing with uh, multiple ontologies or multiple uh, costs, then you have to deal with the mappings between them. Um, and so we really start that that 
thinking when the FAIR principle came around to say, like, look, ontology repositories, the fact of developing them can actually help us to address the fact that we can make the, the ontologies and costs, semantic artifact resources, as fair as possible using our repositories. And so now this is one of my arguments that ontology repositories really help to make ontology fair. And um, and because ontologies and vocabularies fair are necessary to make fair data, then it's really important for, for to be sure that those vocabularies are, the, are available. And the screenshot that you're seeing here under each of the fair principles are really taken from Mago Portal, explaining that we are designing the interface to find the, the, the application, to find them, uh, but make them also accessible through REST API for Sparkle endpoint. Um, but also make them more interoperable by representing them with a shared model, a shared metadata uh, model, but also interconnecting them with uh, metadata information like alignment between them, but also, uh, um, uh, and also, of course, being, being sure that they are reusable with providing as much as information as we can about them. So AgroPortal was a was was a is a project that we started in in 2016, with really the motivation to to to, to let me present that slide before, but really the motivation about developing and supporting a reference ontology for 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 the primary for the domain of agronomy and close related domain plant sciences food biodiversity a little bit at the beginning, but now we're going to probably pass over to our other colleagues. Uh, the key idea was the very beginning was to use the NCB bio portal technology. At that time, Onto Portal was not even branded with the idea of avoid re-implementing what was being done, reuse the scientific outcomes, experience, and method of the biomedical domain. That as well that that has always been very important in the in the field of of ontologies and, and terminology service. And we wanted to have a focus on what could be the value added for 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 agro agri food community and enable new science in their domain and we were also very much interested in the fact that the bio portal was also very fully semantic web compliant and, and that was also following the philosophy so the portal was made available in 2016 we have now 100, 100 and a little bit more than 49 156 uh, ontologies uh, a little more also of candidates ontologies that are waiting for us to be loaded or for us to be uh, to be uh, to to reach out to the developers and then loading them we are more around 120 so so we discover more and more ontologies as uh, as as we work and and people are also encouraged to develop new ones because they see also with the portal that this is an active field for their community so the basic features that the portal is uh, is offering is all of it's really an ontology repository. So there are there are different terms in the community, ontology libraries, ontology repository. We define a repository really historically by the fact that we serve the content of the ontology. So not only the metadata record, like we'll do fair sharing, for example, of the Obo Foundry. We by indexing the content in a repository, we do serve, we do serve the content, allow to browse, allow to search, allow to use multiple services like annotation and recommendation, where you can get some 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 recommended ontology for some data that you provide. We also deal with versioning, we also deal with mappings that behind the Agro Portal repository, there is a mapping repository and multiple features also like notes proposals that can be made through the portal to um, to uh, make an ontology or demonstrate that an ontology is alive or capture feedback from the community with respect to a certain ontology. Uh, so yeah, I'm illustrating some of these with UI that I'm that I'm guess you guys you have seen, but I, 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 this is just to to con to continue that that quick introduction. So you can see here for examples of ontologies we have in uh, we have in Agro Portal. You have a bunch of faceted search approach based on the metadata information that you can use to to search um, to search uh, ontologies in the portal. Um, I usually use the term ontology because it's an historical uh, it's an historical inherit legacy, but but I really the the portal handles different kind of costs, um, and and, uh, and we'll be able to load our and scarce ontologies, uh, and scarce vocabularies, and also uh, also different formats like the OBO format that was for example very much used in the biomedical community originally. Uh, so this is basically the browsing interface. You guys, one of the 
one of the most important services, of course, the class search or concept search. Once the concept of has been identified, I didn't parse and, and index in, a, in an index, you can search them, then figure out also the reuse between ontologies. Uh, we also have those those small widget that that, that we provide uh, inside the portal that people can reuse to actually plug in bio portal or agro portal in their in their website or web application when typing uh, the the beginning of a label then users will actually grab a uri of a concept in an ontology in the back of the form we like that very much and you know, we know it's very much used to 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 actually uh, annotate or or disambiguate data from scratch in a web application and then we have the basic um, uh, UI for 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 ontologies. I mean the classic hierarchy on the left and concept and con content content information about the concept or the class on, on the right. Uh, we display uh, details, but also the instance related to a certain class if we are browsing an ontology. Um, a, a visualization that show you show us a little bit the, the the graph of that ontology, the specific mapping of that class. So here you see that leaf area index in the agronomy ontology is positioned in certain hierarchy and has, for example, thirty two mappings to other terms. Uh, the key idea of the portal was also to make all of that, all of the different ontologies being loaded in the portal, uh, fit in with a common model. Uh, that we can have for all of the ontologies, all of the vocabularies, and this common model is very close to the to the to the the cost one or the the one defined defined by SCOS with a preferred name, synonyms, definition, and, and a hierarchy for 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 concept. So we're going to have that for all of the ontologies and vocabularies and resources that are loaded to AgroPortal. We have those community-based functionalities uh, uh, where people can upload mappings, comments, make term proposal. Those are there are different ways of, of using these, but this is really um, uh, something that the, the portal where was offering for from scratch. Although uh, because there is a tendency in different groups and ontologies to to adopt different approach, we haven't found out exactly the best approach for, for uh, to 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 capture notes and feedback. But we are we are doing our best to follow the discussion, uh, the the discussion and, and, and participate into the. The, the the process in order to show that the portal can actually mediate the the, the conversation or the feedback that external users will eventually have about an ontology and mediate those information back to the ontology developers. So in AgroPortal, by comparison to, to the work done in BioPortal or in MedPortal, we have we have invested a lot of energy in describing our vocabularies and ontologies with many metadata. So we illustrate that historically with, with that UI showing on additional metadata here. Um, the new metadata model was, was implemented about, about five years ago and we are rebranding it. We're gonna have a new UI about that very soon. And, and um, uh, that metadata was built in the portal. You can display per ontology, of course, the key idea is to offer a metadata catalog. And, and so you'll see a bunch of information about an ontology that we can also extract from the file or extract from, from computing them, but also, also ask the users to provide those metadata. And we try to use URI as much as possible. So instead of having a, 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 a in the UI, we'll show a little icon for the license, but in the back end, we'll use a URI in order to encode all of that with a triple, with a, a semantic web triple. Uh, and I'll illustrate different aspects of that later, but yes, really those additional metadata are really the ones that were coming in from our additional metadata model. And we're also motivated to, to, to offer uh, what we are, Offering to edit here is the metadata record of the ontology here, the agronomy ontology in AgroPortal. So we are also very sensitive that the metadata will not only live here because we are not necessarily the, the, the kernel or, or the canonical um, place where to have the, the metadata. So we provided the, those buttons when the metadata has been edited, you can actually download it back and actually copy paste it back in your ontology file if you're an ontology developer. Uh, this feature needs to be a little bit improved, but we're working on it. I'll describe the fair score right after. And you see also that there are things like metrics or visits with respect to a given ontology. We also have the uh, logos and the fact that an ontology is included in different catalogs allow us also to figure out a little bit where people can use that ontology. And we deal with versionings also. On our side, we call every file, every version that have been loaded to the portal, we call it a submission. And sometimes it's, um, it, it's a good way to follow a, a 
uh, the versioning of an ontology. That work on the metadata level allows us a few years ago to, to work also on what I, we call the landscape page, which means that by putting all of the ontology together and looking at their metadata, the other way around per property, you can draw the landscape about the ontology, see who, who, about the ontologies of this domain, who are the most active people, the most active organization, what are the most the format that are mostly used, the kind of ontologies you have, the language that are being used, the size, et cetera, et cetera. So we also have that annotator service within within the portal where people can give text and get some annotation of the ontology terms right away. So the key idea there is to avoid implementing a, an NLP workshop, an NLP workflow, sorry, to 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 reuse uh, the key use case. The key use case, for example, here is that you know ever seen you've you've seen those those Excel spreadsheet with something like for example thread describing here the cassava the annotator will really help you to go to the uri for that concept inside the cassava thread ontology so structuring consolidating the information the the data you can use also the ontology recommender which is based on the annotator to actually get a recommendation on which ontology to use for a certain piece of text or certain input and also we deal with ontology alignment between ontologies this is an illustration of what i was showing before the the the, the fact that there are there are for certain mapping here for carbon dioxide inside the anatezerus to other ontologies some of them are computed automatically the lexical match one are but we also have a mapping repository where people can load their mappings and different visualization too. So <clears throat> the work on metadata also allowed us about two, three years ago to implement uh, a new feature that I like. And John sent me an email during during the night uh, saying, oh, I got a couple of questions about, about ontology evaluation, uh, fairness evaluation. So maybe you can say a word about that. So uh, we have implemented that service that we call OFAIR, Ontology Fairness Evaluator, which is really based on a methodology that we develop on the side. That OFAIR is a methodology with a bunch of metadata related questions, 65 questions, uh, criteria will help us to figure out and this, and, and, and then uh, and then provide a fair score to a certain ontology. So you know that, that first slide that I was showing with respect to the fair principle, then we now we can measure that uh, with a implemented methodology inside the uh, inside the uh, agro portal so if someone wants to get a fairness score for a given ontology you will see that on the page uh, that score is normalized here for example we'll have a score of 71 percent and, and of course all of that can be explained the 61 65 questions can be explained and we will say which metadata field we use to actually populate uh, uh, assigned score uh, points to the to the ontology and then show the score that are being obtained and we can also give, give uh, information about groups of ontologies when someone work like with a group of three or four or even more ontologies then can get a feedback also with respect to to the fairness assessment of their group of ontologies uh, all of that is being done in the context of the Onto Portal Alliance. Uh, uh, you've seen Med Portal, but we've been also working historically in my lab on the French Bioportal, where because Bioportal was not multilingual, and we had an important set of use cases in the biomedical domain to deal with French. So we we implemented a French version, uh, let's say a, a version with with uh, with uh, with uh, an, sorry a version of Bioportal that will have. French version of the ontologies inside. And then AgroPortal was also kicked off. And then after that, things like EcoPortal and more. So just, we always stay in line with the auto portal technology, but on our side, but we do implement a bunch of new features and, and the rest of the presentation is really about the one related to SCOS. We've done some improvement with the, the multilingual aspect, the metadata model, the interface, the annotator, the mappings. We deal with instance, we deal with fairness assessment, as I think we, we repair, fix and improve the notification. The, the, we can deal also with, with, um, uh, with mappings in the SSSOM format a little bit more now, things like that. So really, we have a bunch of things that we are developing, still being backward compatible with the Onto Portal technology, and sometimes proposing some of those features to the Onto Portal baseline. But uh, but we think that we also were advanced in terms of features. And all of that in Agro Portal is accessible through a REST API and a Sparkle endpoint. So the key vision of that slide is really to say that someone can actually build an application, a web application or a tool based on our, on our services. Okay, so let's take a moment to to focus on on the on, on the on, on, on what I call state of the art browsing of scarce resources in Agro Portal. 
So we implement a bunch of change. I'm, I'm starting with three um, three slides explaining a little bit the, the context with SCOS, but I'm sure some of you are very familiar with that. But okay, SCOS support, support in vocabulary services, uh, what's the state of the art in that? Um, uh, you, you're going to see Bartok later. Um, uh, you, you all know Scosmos, the technology that was developed in Finland, which is probably the, one of the best, best technology to, to provide uh, or, or serve Scos vocabularies. Uh, Lothar, Finto, Shark Vocabulary Service, Bartok, uh, were used on Scosmos. And Scosmos really support very well Scos because it was designed for this language. But it also has many limitations with comparison to what we do in, 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 in Onto Portal. Uh, Scos is only addressing a few services that, uh, uh, with comparison to what we do in Onto Portal. Uh, browsing and searching, basically, but we, we do have a lot of many more things in, in, in Onto Portal. So we wanted to make a, a, a path toward, towards Scos. Um, uh, in order also to also match the standard like Cosmos. So since 2013, the Bioportal Ontology Repository was offering some support for SCOS, uh, uh, but because SCOS was not really uh, adopted in biomedical medicine historically, we have not really seen a full support of that in Bioportal. So we wanted to address that. And our vision was to find a way to browse concept in intuitive and easy manner when uh, vocabulary or tesori will um, uh, tesor, uh, will, will make an extensive use of both the schemes and collection. So, so if you're familiar with the SCOS specification, you'll know uh, what schemes and collections are. So, uh, SCOS resources can semantically be very rich when they regroup and classify concept with schemes and collection. But we're gonna need specific like software needs software to to and or develop that. And we have even observed that uh, those mechanism collection and group and schemes were underused in scarce resources, probably because of the software not using them or showing them enough. So they're, so basically, as a recall, a concept scheme is an aggregation of one or more scarce concept and it's typically used to group concept together with a specific hierarchy. The integration in the scheme is done at the concept level with the property scarce in scheme. Uh, typically, the thesaurus itself is a concept scheme, but sometime inside the thesaurus, you will have also sub schemes that can be also a concept scheme. And a cost collection is 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 uh, our label our label or order groups of cost concept. Those are the definition from SCOS. and they are typically used to group concept that share something in common. So so here the 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 the, the definition of the integration of the collection is done at the collection level, where a collection declare what's what what concepts are inside. Those two things are are, are then very different, and and and, um, and still very complementary. Uh, so this cost construct raises multiple question uh, uh, that for which we don't necessarily have um, uh, uh, have clear answers in the cost specification. For example, how to distinguish between the main concept from other sub schemes in a unique source file. I mean, if you have multiple concept scheme, how do you found out which one is the main one, if there is any. It's, it's like you, if you will put multiple, um, I don't know, document in a unique Word, uh, Word doc file, then you have to figure out a way to find out which one is the main one, if there is a main one. How to display the hierarchies for any scheme and uh, of any scheme independently or mix? I mean, we can consider also that some hierarchy paths will go through concepts that are not necessarily included in that scheme. So you want to see a hierarchy and then stop, and then that hierarchy resume again because the schemes can be embedded in other schemes. Uh, how to display the concept? Its collection, especially. The word collection are non are non order. So a typical alphabetical alphabetical approach is sometimes not enough to display a, a collection with a, a, a large numbers of numbers. So we wanted also to think about that that, and how to browse a tesora a tesaurus order by their date or creation was also what some kind of a motivation. People sometimes very often come to say, what are the news element or the things that have been added in the in the in the vocabulary? So we did. A few implementation that I'm illustrating now in the next uh, three four slide, uh, we can now visualize inside the inside the the agro portal uh, the schemes and the collection itself with a special tabs here on that you see. So we are reusing the the left and right uh, pattern here, but the left show you the list of collections. So it's not a color hierarchy. It's really the list of the collections that are being described here in the context of the biodiversity tetherus. And you see that those collections will have a name, a numbers of members count that is count by the portal but also sometimes assessed by the by the by the ontology 
developers, the vocabulary developer. In this case, uh, this is why we have the information so all time. And those those collections will really have their own existence now inside the portal. We added them to the model. We did the same with Scheme. I'm not illustrating that, but if you go to, to, to Lago Portal, you'll see that. And we implement three different ways of browsing the concept inside those uh, those uh, scarce resources. Uh, your hierarchical one, where you will select the, the scheme you want to browse, and the hierarchy will show you the the, 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 the selected scheme, and sometimes find a way to, to skip the scheme, the, the terms that are not in the scheme you ask for, but will basically show you the schemes that you're selecting. We also offer a system by collection where we'll use the alphabetical order and also, also a temporal uh, view. I'm going to illustrate them. What's interesting in the hierarchy one is that you can also select the collection you want to use in addition of the hierarchy. So this is illustrated here on that image. If I go to the same the same biodiversity tethers, for example, in AgroPortal, and I'm selecting the main scheme here. So the BLH is and identify as the main scheme, but I could actually select also other schemes. Uh, then I have the hierarchy of the schemes on being displayed there. So here I'm and I'm, I'm browsing here the concept behavioral ecology. But because I can also select collection uh, in a pop up that uh, offers me to select the different collection in the in the in the tethers. And here I've selected animal, uh, bacteria, behavior, discipline, measure. And and by using these, you you will see with those bullet points on the left of the of the of the concept in which collection the term is also the the concept is also in. So here. We we see that behavioral ecology happens to be a member of two collections. This is displayed on the right, but this is also displayed in the hierarchy tree. We found that it was a very interesting and we had very good feedback from users on, on, on discovering terms and collection um, uh, like that, browsing the hierarchy. Uh, you can also now, this is an example on Agrovoc, uh, visualize, the, visualize the terms uh, based on the, on the DC created and DC modified property. Uh, uh, well, you could be able to visualize the terms, um, the order by by by, by temporal uh, order. Uh, so here, for example, you see uh, the last version of Agrovoc. Uh, and if you go to that last version, you'll see the one that have been modified in July, June. And then if you scroll down, you see them order like that. This is super useful for a lot of use cases, including Agrovoc, for example. And this is not based on the versioning of ontologies. This is really based on the metadata that is entered at the concept level, usually using things like uh, VocBench. Uh, uh, DC created and DC modified properties are used to, to store those information. And you can also visualize now in AgroPortal the, the SCOS Excel label. So for those of you that are familiar with SCOS Excel, this is a reification of the label inside of, uh, an object uh, in, uh, in, uh, in SCOS. And this was also very important for us to be able to endure that. So now we identify also SCOS Excel object as a, as object that you can, uh, that you can uh, reuse and display. And we also did a few implementation with respect to mappings, where we can actually also detect the mappings that are now declared in this course file, if they are explicitly using this course property, exact match, close match, those properties that this course specification is also doing that. I'm just mentioning the fact that we are going to be multilingual very soon. And this is also important for, 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 for people usually developing course. Uh, this is happening in, in by the end of the year. So yeah, that's my summary slide finishing on these. I have to explain that 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 we 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 work on, on making semantic artifacts or course resources, vocabularies, ontologies, or you name it, uh, fair. Uh, we develop ontology services for that. We develop multiple services that are based on their content. We deal with their uh, we, with their version. Uh, I've illustrated that that it, we are we are also addressing very well now the the SCOS format and, and doing that in the context of multiple projects, including Fair Impact, which is also a, a project at the European Commission in which we want to push for the adoption of the ontoportal technology at the level of the European Open Science Cloud and infrastructure of uh, of uh, of uh, services for open science in Europe. And if you have any question, I'll take those now. Oh. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Clement. Um, let's take um, uh, five minutes for um, some questions discussion. Um, I'd encourage uh, folk to use the chat. We can uh, come back for questions or comments. We can come back to that in the general discussion. We've got a little time at the end. Um, and uh, we've got, uh, I see we've got um, three questions or comments um, in the chat at the moment. Um, and let's just start start with them. 
Uh, Yarmo, do you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Um, I can you I, unmute? I see, I see the question. I can also answer them. I have them in front of me. If you want, no worries. So the question from Yarmo about um, are you able to provide a register namespace uh, for the ontologies and their concept in the Agro portal repository? So this is a question we have very often. I mean, I mean do you support URIs or can you can you provide URIs for, for users that will come to the to, to the portal? So the short answer would be no. Historically speaking, the portals were like offering a, a place where ontologies will be displayed and then uh, once they are done, really, but this is a request we have more and more of. Uh, more and more users are developing ontologies, and they are not fully aware of how to build those URIs, where to mint them, where to um, uh, um, resolve, how to resolve them, all of that. So we are starting to think about a, uh, a, a let's say, a URI service in which we can also say, look, if you have URIs, those are the way we can provide the support we can provide. If you don't, those are the mechanism we can provide in order to address this need. Uh, because for the moment, people are very often surprised. They come to the portal, they discover a URI of a concept, they click on it, and if that URI is uh, not a very good URI, let's say that doesn't resolve or is not permanent, then we will bring you to a 404 page and people are like thinking that 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 we are responsible for that so this is a this is really something on which we are trying to help the communities this is not e easy because your eyes are really dependent on you know the namespace that people wants to put in that are very uh, sometimes political your eyes goes with also with the idea of minting the concept in a certain organization so going to the, the second question that was from Jacob about the 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 the, the terminology, or let's say the, the 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 categories that are used to classify the terminologies and ontologies in AgroPortal, is that available? Um, uh, I will say there is a there is a URI for that. Not really a URI, uh, 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 but they are not really avail, uh, available. We in AgroPortal we 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 used a, a, a small classification that was provided by FAO at the time we started the portal. And now we are discussing in the Onto Portal Alliance the fact of relying each of our categories in different portals on a very high level classification uh, on which uh, some of us are, um, um, come, most of us could rely on and some, and some of us can actually divide between the portals. So for the moment, I would say, no, they are not really defined in a in a, in a classification, although those 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 terms were coming from a, um, uh, an FAO uh, documentation that 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 we found uh, five six years ago, uh, I'm assuming also uh, uh, this is a point of interest when we want to classify a bunch of ontologies coming from different domains. Yeah. And BioPortal has experienced the same situation, trying to also update those categories recently and find maybe a, a meta meta ontology for that. Um, Etienne asks, is the temporal and other view also expressed in the triples underlying the visualization? In other words, can the visualization be reproduced or done in alternative manner using Sparkle? Okay, so all of that is based on the content that we have in the triple store, based on the content of the ontology, uh, which is, and we don't touch the content of the ontology. So we'll be able to display the, the temporal view only if an ontology has form about the date of creation and the date of all the date of modification of the term. So if you don't have the information inside the ontology, we can't provide the UI. And uh, you can eventually will have a, an opportunity to to um, um, uh, to to specify the property that is used, for example, to declare the date of creation, not only not only DC created, but that's going to come. Uh, so the key idea here is that is that yes, we are serving the content. So another user, another tool, another application can uh, using our Sparkle endpoint or API can actually get that information back and build its own application uh, based also on that temporal view. The comment from Matthias, I'm, I'm going quickly because I know I was a little longer <laughs> in the presentation. So the comment from Matthias was, "Thank you, approach me to the." Yeah, your approach to metadata about cost itself and the fair scores. Yeah, I'm glad you see it's that interesting. Yeah, that, that took us a, a little bit of energy over, over the last two, three years. But we're pretty excited about, about presenting all fair now in conferences and things, although it sometimes creates a, or a debate on the fact of evaluating uh, the level of fairness with that, that 
uh, approach of you know putting a score or notation people feel that they are back in the classroom when someone tells them oh you score up to 50 percent and sometimes it scares a little bit people we've seen other fairness assessment approach in the concept of context of the fair impact project and those have not necessarily went to the fair score they went to say yes you're fair you're not and um uh and yeah yeah i think this is there or no other question feel free to go uh i'll uh, I'm uh, curious, just if you're able to answer quickly, on your um, ex SCOS extensions with the working with the SCOS collections, um, people have had um, problems with, uh, uh, some, some folk have had problems that uh, SCOS collection members are not um, uh, co uh, concepts, SCOS, if I understand correctly, and they're not part of the hierarchy of the um, of the SCOS concept scheme. Was that an issue for you at all with your work or, or, or not? Uh, so the SCOS specification will tell, will tell us that that collection are, um, are made to, to group uh, SCOS concepts. So they are usually SCOS concepts. Uh, everything is SCOS concept if it's not a scheme, a collection, or a label in SCOS. Uh, the the but it's true that they are not necessarily described with a hierarchy um, uh, or inside the hierarchy. So that's why we had those challenge of presenting them, and and and, um, and um, uh, the, the 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 key aspect also is is the cost specification was also kind of offering us the materials to say that when you build a collection then you declare the members that it has so the entry point is supposed to be the collection and from the collection you see the the concept whereas in the portal we were entry entering through the concept and from a concept get the collection the concept is in it's not um, it's not there is no cost property to 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 do that that in collection uh, property does not exist in SCOS. So it exists in a few extensions of SCOS. Uh, we use the, the, an extension of SCOS to actually encode that information, but that's a, a, an additional information that we compute in order to be able to go uh, and discover collection, whatever we enter by a concept or whatever we enter by a, by a collection. And, and uh, but that's an additional let's say entailment that we do from from by, by, from the triples that are loaded in the in the triple store based on the file those ones are not even retrieved if you download back the original file you'll not even download those uh, those but you can use them uh by using our sparkling point or the api because they are being a, uh, we are kind of doing i would not call that reasoning but that entailment yes yeah thank you um so thanks clement for a very um detailed and um, uh, good presentation. Um, and um, we'll move, um, maybe we'll come back to some of these issues in the final discussion perhaps, uh, but we should move on now um, to um, the uh, our next speaker. Um, Matthias, if you want, uh, I think Clement to stop sharing. So Matthias, if you want to start uh, sharing your screen, I'll just introduce you um, uh, uh, quickly. Matthias Frosterus is the um, Information Systems Manager at National Library of Finland. He's going to be talking about the COCO Upper Ontology Cloud, an operational system at the National Library uh, of Finland. Um, and um, uh, I'll just pass over now to, um, uh, to, to you, Matthias. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that you can hear me and, and the slides change, right? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, excellent. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, uh, I will be talking about about our, our, uh, our approach to uh, linked uh, lightweight ontologies. And uh, we have been doing this for, for quite a while now and, and sort of, uh, uh, reflect on everything that we have learned. Uh, but before we start, I would like to extend uh, special thanks to Professor uh, Eero Hyvänen, uh, who has been absolutely instrumental in in, uh, in uh, the creation of this uh, approach, and also to Information Systems Specialist Joeli Takala, who is uh, currently the main uh, developer of, of Koko. Uh, the presentation has sort of three parts in that uh, first I will go 
over the concept uh, of the linked open ontology cloud, why we need it and what it is and so on. Uh, then I will go over our specific application to practice, so how we did it. And finally, I will go, go over the lessons learned. Uh, and so the basic basic challenge that we are trying to tackle is that that um, that there are lots of organizations that maintain their own high quality thesauri and they have used those thesauri to produce uh, great metadata uh, about um, documents or resources in their own domain, uh, but. Uh, it's difficult, they, they, as the thesauri aren't interoperable, uh, it's difficult to use them simultaneously to search all of this data. And uh, we want an, an approach that, that uh, enables this, but also an approach that uh, allows us to sort of uh, retain the expertise of each of these organizations so that they can continue to uh, develop their own vocabularies. Uh, and finally do it in a way that is maintainable. <laughs> and uh, this is sort of the, the, the crux of the problem maybe. So, so uh, something that we'll, we'll get back to uh, multiple times during this, this presentation. Uh, so what we did, uh, we first of all moved from thesauri to lightweight ontologies. So basically SCOS vocabularies uh, with a complete is a type hierarchy. So we are using SCOS broader, but applying it more strictly. So uh, uh, so that when we do uh, a SCOS broader, it means uh, is a type relation uh, relationship. And uh, then, of course, we had to move from, from terms to concepts. So whenever I say ontology, I mean these sorts of lightweight ontologies. So SCOS vocabularies with this, this uh, is a type hierarchy. And uh, this is done because uh, making terms interoperable is very hard, but making concepts interoperable is possible. So um, to sort of uh, find the concepts be behind the terms allows us to make uh, more um, robust and more uh, expressive relations between the concepts. And uh, this is especially pertinent when it comes to language. Uh, so mm, uh, as you all know, language uh, shapes the way we think but uh, and, and how we express things. And uh, while some, uh, the term level uh, links between languages can be a bit uh, fuzzy and uh, not all that well defined. But when we go to the concept level, every concept is, is uh, uh, expressible in every language. And uh, in the case of Finland, this is uh, sort of amplified by the fact that we have two official languages, Finnish and Swedish. So uh, in our case, we used these two languages, Finnish and Swedish, uh, for the sort of conceptualization uh, step. Um, and then we also translate uh, to English and uh, lately uh, to Northern Sami language as well. Uh, so for example, uh, Swedish has two words for castles that are like a bit like castles and maybe citadels in, in English. So the sort of the, the, uh, the actual fortification in the middle and, and then uh, the other word is for the, for the sort of the village around it or the, or the uh, with the uh, buildings around the, the main main uh, fortification. Uh, and the Finnish language doesn't make this dis distinction. Uh, so uh, we sort of, in these sorts of cases, we consider whether it's a distinction that the sort of the, uh, that is uh, meaningful to the uh, end user. So as our main focus is on uh, trying to make things findable uh, for the for the um, you know, information seeker. Uh, so 
we have to make these decisions. And in, in this case, we decided that we'll have only one concept for castles and then the, uh, the label in Swedish uh, is, is both has, has like two words and uh, so that's like castles and citadels in a, in a, in a sense in, in Swedish. Um, now, when you uh, when you do this, when you move from the uh, from the thesauri uh, to lightweight ontologies, there is a lot of overlap between them, and uh, this is especially true if you want a complete is a hierarchy because the upper part of the hierarchy is always the same, and uh, uh, so uh, from this we can build a general upper ontology or GUO. Uh, and the other other ontologies or the or the, uh, the ontologies derived from the original thesauri can then expand this GUO uh, in their own domains, uh, and so we call them domain domain ontologies going forward. So if we have two uh, two of these uh, ontologies from the original thesauri that have been uh, 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 that have been uh, uh, expanded to have a complete uh, hierarchy. So there's only only uh, uh, everything is in the in the sort of the same tree. Uh, then we can we can uh, take the the upper part of the hierarchy that is the same and uh, make make from that the general upper ontology. And then have the domain ontologies extended in their in their own own domains. Uh, so yeah, uh, then we applied this this theory to practice. And uh, first of all, uh, a short word on the on the infrastructure that we are dealing with. So as as Clement <laughs> mentioned, we have uh, Finto Thesaurus and Ontology Service. Uh, so it's it's being uh, maintained by the National Library of Finland. And it's basically a publication platform for scores vocabularies and also an ecosystem of, of various applications and uh, expert groups and, and things like that surrounding uh, surrounding them. Uh, and it's not just for the library sector in Finland, but rather for the uh, whole cultural heritage uh, sector as well as the public sector, so public administration and, and so on. Uh, they all use, use Finto. And uh, Finto works on top of Scosmos, which is this lightweight uh, open source software for setting up a Scos vocabulary service uh, that provides a browsing interface and REST APIs. And and uh, and as as Clement mentioned, we have quite a few uh, few organizations that are hosting their own Scosmos uh, uh, installations. Uh, just. Very quickly, this is what Finto looks like. So this is from the YSO, the general Finnish ontology, which is the GUO that we are using. Uh, so here on the on the left hand side, we have the hierarchy uh, of the concepts, and on the right hand side, we have the uh, the properties uh, and relationships and, and things like that uh, for the uh, for the concept abandoned buildings in this case. Um, so for the for the GUO, we picked uh, this uh, general Finnish thesaurus and its Swedish language counterpart Alars, uh, which were uh, which were maintained in the National Library of Finland and have been used to uh, catalog or index uh, all the non-fiction literature that has been uh, published in Finland uh, since the eighties, or rather the the uh, <laughs> uh, rather, the thesaurus has been uh, maintained since the 80s, and uh, so we combined these two uh, thesauri, one in Finnish and one in Swedish, uh, to one lightweight ontology, the general Finnish ontology YSO, and indeed the uh, the whole from terms to concepts and and, and making a complete hierarchy uh, for it and. Uh, we chose this as a GUO uh, since it sort of encompasses everything as it, it has been uh, as nonfiction literature sort of encompasses everything. 
uh, <clears throat> or or well everything is a strong word but but uh but uh but it made for a for a good basis to then be expanded using using the domain ontologies uh so for the for the linked open ontology cloud uh coco we took the guo and then we had uh we currently have 13 domain ontologies there it's approximately 60000 concepts and uh the domain ontologies they range from uh natural resource and environment to fiction and to military science or photography so all sorts of all sorts of domains and uh of course yso uh, encompasses these in some part, but all of these sort of go deeper into their respective domains. And uh, then we also have this expert group of ontology developers. So, so all of the uh, organizations that maintain their uh, own domain ontologies, they belong to this group. And uh, that sort of uh, discusses and decides on the, on the principles uh, behind the development. So ranging from sort of technical details like what exactly should the deprecation of an uh, of a concept do uh to more sort of uh, uh less less technical things like what to do with archaic offensive alt labels or or things like that and uh, then we have a whole host of of uh smaller applications scripts and and um all sorts of like uh supplementary uh, programs uh, to help with the uh, with the uh, merging of Coco uh, and publication of it and and uh, maintenance of it and and things like that. I won't go into detail here. But yeah, uh, then the lessons learned. There reads over ten years worth of experience because the sort of the the exact starting date of Coco is a bit. Uh, difficult to pin down in the sense that it began its life as a research prototype but uh, uh and then moved to to production or or like production level use but uh i decided to be conservative here and and have a have this over 10 years because it's it has been in in production use for for uh well over 10 years now but uh yeah so what what have we learned? Um, so our approach has always been this sort of modular uh, in that we have been uh, developing uh, tools uh, for sort of specific uh, challenges that we have encountered along the way and doing so in, a, in an iterative way. But uh, sort of the one of the very key things here has been finding a balance between manual labor, automated processes, and proactive guidelines. Because um, uh, in order to make these domain ontologies maintainable uh, by a large group of organizations that uh, don't have daily contact with each other, uh, you need to sort of uh, and, and the organizations are very different from one another. They have different amounts of resources to spend on their ontologies and they have uh, sort of different uh, expectations for them. So sort of finding the balance uh, in, in, in there uh, has, has been like one of the uh, main challenges, but also probably like at least from an engineer's point of view, <laughs> uh, like, less uh, or hard, harder to define or pin down or, or, or something like that. Um, then probably the most uh, difficult challenge uh, has been the propagation of changes uh, in that when the GUO changes, uh, that probably affects uh, the domain ontologies or, or at least some of them. Uh, that when new concepts get added or the or the hierarchy changes or whatever, uh, the domain ontologies need to make sure that the semantics between their uh, that, that the semantics uh, within their own concepts uh, remain intact and and correct uh, when there are changes like upstream on the on the um, on the uh, upper levels of the is a hierarchy. 
And uh, we publish a new sort of frozen version of YSO uh, twice a year and new versions of Coco uh, four times a year. Uh, and this is uh, since we want to accommodate the different uh, update cycles of, of different organizations since they, as I mentioned, have different uh, resources. Uh, so some might might uh, be more active in, in reactive reacting to the changes and, and some might be less active. Uh, we also developed this tool to help uh, the domain ontology developers. So it tries to sort of uh, guess based on the hierarchy uh, what changes are the most likely to be relevant uh, to a given given domain ontology. Uh, so, so as to to sort of help them prioritize uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, when they go over the over the changes and and decide what to do to have them in a in a sort of a rough uh, order of priority. And uh, then there is also the fact that the changes in domain ontologies might affect other domain ontologies. Uh, one of the sort of the key principles here is that each of the domain ontologies should have a distinct domain. But of course, uh, that that doesn't mean that there is no overlap. And uh, and catching these uh, sorts of changes or or the uh, or the effects of these changes to towards other domain ontologies that's uh, that's more difficult. Uh, since it's like uh, they usually aren't uh, like uh, easily defined uh, in that there might be uh, some like deeper semantic level uh, uh, effects uh, from 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 changes and uh, then Another challenge is definitely that um, even though concepts and, and, and URIs are forever, organizations are less so. Uh, so sometimes organizations decide that they don't have resources anymore for, for uh, maintaining their domain ontology. Or an organization might, might cease to exist or, or whatever. Uh, and that might result, and in our case has uh, a couple of times resulted uh, in a situation where a domain ontology in Coco doesn't have uh, a developer behind them anymore. And, and that's naturally a very uh, sad situation uh, since, since Coco is, uh, uh, is made to be used as a, as a uh, as a whole, so so the idea is that uh, when people annotate uh, their uh, their resources with it, uh, it it should <laughs> it should remain uh, relevant and, and and workable. And when a whole domain ontology leaves, uh, there's basically two choices. So one is keeping it in stasis, but then it slowly deteriorates due to changes uh, that affect it and no one is, is sort of reacting to them. Or uh, the second choice is merging it into the uh, into the GUO or another domain ontology. And this is uh, what we have been choosing so far. But naturally, this sort of puts more stress uh, into the GUO or, or the other domain ontology because they receive like a a large amount of uh, quite specific uh, uh, concepts from a domain that that uh, that might be like highly uh, uh, need expert know-how to to sort of manage properly. And uh, of course, there is the the more normal normal uh, situation where a singular concept um, gets deprecated, and and that's like uh, that's business as usual because the most likely uh, reason for a concept to be deprecated is that it's duplicated somewhere else. So there's uh, there's a way to uh, to uh, have this is replaced by uh, type relation, and 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 this is like a normal normal thing but if if a whole 
whole ontology gets uh, replaced by, and, and they all point to something uh, a bit more general, you know, or or way more general in the general upper ontology. If they all all point to the branches that they were they were expanding, that uh, that that doesn't work, or or it invalidates the the, uh, the metadata that has been sort of relying on on those concepts. So so uh, yeah. And also, of course, we uh, every once in a while have the more positive <laughs> uh, thing that new new ontologies come along. So uh, that's naturally quite a bit of work, but it's always a happy occasion, uh, and it's relatively straightforward in the, in that in that it doesn't pose pose as much uh, or or it doesn't pose those sorts of problems. Uh, then the next and maybe a bit obvious um, lesson that we have learned is that semantics are hard. <laughs> so uh, when the problems are have to do with semantics, they are difficult to find using automation and and extremely difficult to fix using using automation. So as I mentioned in theory, there should be minimal overlap between uh, so the concepts in in the domain ontologies, but in in practice, it's very hard to make sure that it, that it doesn't happen. Uh, and if there is overlap, ideally it should uh, enter the the GUO or else. One of the domain ontolo ontology developers could could just accept that the other one are are taking care of that concept from now on. Um, and one thing worth remembering here is that we aren't trying to model reality, but rather just uh, answer specific annotation and and information uh, searching needs. So that sort of helps a bit uh, in in this regard. Uh, in that uh, sort of the we don't do complex uh, deduction uh, on the on the uh, uh, on the on the properties. So it, it, it usually isn't like a catastrophe if if there's some semantic fuzziness uh, or or some semantic problems around. And of course, it's also that since this is uh, since this since Coco is in actual use, uh, also the users can report these problems. So if automation fails, the the <laughs> sort of the the users can can uh, pick uh, up some of the slack of that. Uh, yeah. So I guess the, the sort of the main question is that has Coco been a success? Uh, now, sort of in in uh, looking back, and. Uh, I guess that it has been in in some way. It's especially useful for organizations that uh, sort of deal with everything under the sun, such as museums and media companies. For example, the National Broadcasting Company of Finland, uh, Yle, uses uh, uses Coco since they they deal with with kind of everything. And uh, it's also possible to make use of Coco uh, in a way that doesn't take everyone every single one of the uh, the domain ontologies. So you can just uh, pick uh, the general upper ontology and then uh, a set of of domain ontologies that you are interested in and use only those. So that's a that's like a very valid way of using using Coco, uh, but it still sort of re retains the interoperability uh, of the data that has been annotated uh, using using those vocabularies. And uh, yeah, uh, we have like. Uh, a long list of of uh, deficiencies that we know of and that we are working on. Uh, so, Coco isn't perfect, uh, but so far uh, it has been good enough, and and it's it's still improving. And I hope that in maybe in ten years' time, I can I can remove the question mark from the from from the uh, from this slide. So so, but we shall see. So thank you for your attention and, and I will be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thanks, thanks Matthias. Um, so let's, uh, we're uh, slightly over time, but let's make time for um, uh, some questions or comments. Um, people are encouraged to use the chat or raise, uh, raise a hand if that's easier. 
Um, I'll just kick off. I, I liked your final flourish with the good enough. Uh, it, it's maybe it, it seemed to uh, reflect the very kind of I think practical uh, approach that um, uh, you've taken and uh, really kind of dealing with with real kind of um, uh, app context, real real users and their and their needs and applications. And I, I, I saw it as linked to your um, slide on finding balance, where you talked about a balance between um, uh, uh, automatic tools and um, uh, support and, and guidelines to, to sort of nudge, to uh, 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 encourage the, uh, uh, the users to um, uh, use a system in a, in, a, in a good way. Are you able to say just anything briefly on the gui kind of guidelines that you, you're, you're referring to there? Uh, yeah, we have this um, sort of uh, set of principles that uh, tries to sort of outline the uh, the uh, the sort of the I don't know rules for 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 developing uh, the the uh, the domain ontologies, and uh, I guess that uh, a lot of it it uh, comes from the uh, from the GUO. Uh, we allow for some, uh, like, uh, if a domain ontology wishes to use their own, own uh, some additional properties for, for some things, for example, um, to, I don't know, have part of hierarchies or whatever, uh, that's allowed. But, uh, uh, but since uh, the entirety of the COCO uh, cannot... Uh, utilize those uh, it should be like sort of uh, understood that it's a bit of a mm, what's the expression in English sort of the the, the, the least uh, the smallest denominator or or <laughs> is that the correct correct uh, yeah, uh, term yeah. but uh, yeah uh, so so uh, it's quite a like a generalized approach. And uh, sort of the, the the guidelines tend to reflect that uh, in that you can you can do more if you wish, but don't expect to be uh, like uh, able to impose it uh, on the on the on the whole whole vocabulary. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, the um, uh, we can maybe come back to issues at the end. The, uh, we got a, a comment from um, Yarmo, um, if you can see Matthias, uh, adding that um, uh, you had um, uh, your own URIs for the federated concepts. Yes, yes, yes. That's a that's a good point, and and it's because uh, if we want to sort of uh, refer uh, the users to Coco as opposed to the uh, to the individual components, uh, then we need to have. Uh, own the own Coco type URIs, so uh, so yeah, uh, and it's also to sort of uh, make sure that when we merge uh, merge concepts from different ontologies, uh, we can sort of uh, it's possible to do some violence to them. <laughs> so it seems more prudent to give them uh, new new URIs to make sure that that there's they yeah. do have naturally the the links back to the to the uh, to the original URIs. But but yeah. And Marcia has also given a couple of links in chat. I think she's saying that the um, you actually give examples of the um, indexed resources uh, resources that are indexed. Yes, I can actually actually show it. Uh, so in Finto, if we uh... yes, I think this is the example that uh, you see this service support all kind of other ways to put the knowledge resources together. So this is uh, two examples yeah. I like uh, to show. Yeah, let's. Uh... Yeah. yeah. So we have we have uh, this like a widget 
that uh, shows uh, from the Finna portal, which is like this uh, cultural heritage portal in, in Finland that, uh, that um, uh, collects uh, resources from, from uh, libraries, museums and archives. And uh, we have implemented this like a widget that, that shows what are the uh, resources that have been uh, indexed using a given term. Uh, so there's there's various various types, and then oops, and then you can you can naturally follow the links. So and Yarmo has mentioned that uh, there's an additional service using the uh, uh, the search engine for the glam sector Finna for the yeah. uh, concepts. Um, I think maybe we were just uh, running late, but maybe quickly, uh, Clement, as is um, uh, uh, hand raised for a question or comment, Clement. Yes, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, very, um, always very exciting to see a, a work done with um, upper level ontologies and, and the huge amount of work it requires to, you know, federate all of that uh, and probably a lot of exchange with community developing those ontologies and experts things like that um how do you position yourself here and i mean this is not a judgment but just really a question uh, uh, with respect to other initiatives in upper level ontologies and typically thinking of bfo in the obo foundry uh, or, or sumo or things like that i mean the bfo took also that approach of, of offering like a, a higher part of the hierarchy a top level upper level ontology and then have the other ones connect to that did you, how do you compare? Did you make a distinction? Uh, or? Yeah, yeah, they have definitely been an, an, an inspiration. And I think that we are sort of quite close to, to the approach that Sumo had uh, or has uh, in, in how we are, we are doing this. Um, there is, um, mm, I think that one of the key components of, of how we have been able to do this uh, has been that that Finland is quite a like a small ecosystem in a, in a, in a way, and uh, since we have uh, the Finnish language is is uh, like there aren't all that many people who speak it, uh, we had to sort of uh, make this uh, on our own. But on the other hand, we were able to find like a consensus and and to have like sort of uh, a, a great amount of Finnish resources to or or Finnish organizations to agree to this this approach and then have this. Uh, uh, like uh, w being applied to practice over over many years, so uh, yeah. Uh, but but to answer your question, uh, I think that we are we are sort of uh, uh, quite close in our approach to to Sumo in 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 many ways. Oh, okay. Thanks very much, Matthias. Just to briefly add to that point, I, I can't resist. Um, we, uh, in um, uh, the work that uh, uh, my group has been involved in, in the Ariadne uh, archaeological um, uh, infrastructure, research infrastructure, we've um, followed a, a, a less formal approach, um, and uh, but with an upper vocabulary using the Getty Art and Architecture of the Zoras uh, uh, as a sort of, um, in some ways, as a, a, for search purposes uh, and browsing as an upper um, an upper level and using the SCOS mapping pro properties to to connect to it in a informal way, sort of at the um, very sort of a informal uh, end of that spectrum. We should, um, uh, but we should now move on to um, the final speaker of this um, uh, uh, first session. And then we have a break and then a, a second session. Um, uh, so, Thanasis, if you are able to um, uh, 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 share your screen, uh, uh, Thanasis Velios is the Collections Data Manager for English Heritage and uh, was the PI of the, uh, LC, the linked conservation data. That's uh, going to be the topic of his talk. Uh, the, Think Conservation Data Network uh, to improve access to conservation documentation via linked data. So uh, conservation of like objects in the museum um, and using various techniques. So over to you, uh, Thanasis. Yeah, and you can see my screen and you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. 
Yeah. So, um, uh, yes, thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to um, uh, present today at the um, at the workshop um, because, you know, many participants are people who have taught me things uh, over the over the years. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And just to say that um, this project, uh, well, I was sort of um, uh, leading this project when I was still working at the University of the Arts London. I have since moved to English Heritage, uh, but um, yeah, the project was under the auspices of the University of the Arts. Um, so um, just to be clear, uh, we're talking about art conservation, not environmental conservation since we're talking about terminology. So this is just to illustrate what, uh, what the field is, um, uh, is about. Um, and like I said, it was, um, the project was um, uh, led by the University of the Arts London and the Legatus Research Center. Our main partner for that project was um, Stanford Libraries uh, and Kristen St. John, uh, who is working at uh, Stanford, uh, was really fundamental to um, uh, establishing this, this project. Um, and you will see here that uh, we had a, a you know a fairly uh, a good sized consortium. Uh, various institutions um, were involved. Um, you know, you think about a project uh, in terms of um, uh, terminology and all the technicalities that comes with scores and you know portals and all these things. But really, um, what it ended up being was a project about communities. And this is just to indicate that uh, we tried to very much engage with conservators who did not have any previous expertise in knowledge organization or, or vocabularies. Um, um, so it, it became very much um, uh, a, a way to begin discussions around terminology within conservation with non-experts. I mean, expert conservators, but not experts in, um, in terminology. <clears throat> The main idea uh, of the project was uh, integration of data, of data sets. Uh, and um, there are many good reasons uh, to integrate data. Uh, in conservation in particular, we have a, a range of um, um, arguments why we should be uh, creating data that you know can integrate. I'm not going to go through all of this here. I, as an example, the, the, the fourth point maybe in this slide is about um, uh, typically, uh, conservators uh, do condition surveys, yeah? so they record the condition of objects in storage, and they store this data in, in one database, in one system. Uh, there are also information about, there's also information about the environmental conditions in, um, in the same stores, typically stored in a different system. So that idea of integration sort of, uh, you know, makes sense, and it, it should be um, uh, standard practice, but it, it isn't at the moment. So the, the project was exploring all these um, ideas. <clears throat> um, you're welcome to um, to go to the project website and sort of browse through the resources, especially if you have an interest in, in conservation. Um, but what I'm going to be um, just flagging a couple of um, outcomes from the project, which I think are relevant. One is um, the data sharing policy template. Uh, we discovered from early on that, um, okay, the technical issues were, were um, things we needed to discuss, but people primarily um, have an immediate reaction to, you know, when you ask them to share data, the answer would be no. Um, and it, it's just um, uh, trying to understand what we mean by sharing data and how people can come to the uh, position where they feel comfortable to share their data. So the the, the policy template is specific for conservation data where it helps um, institutions or conservation studios uh, begin discussions around what data they're sharing. And this applies to terminology as well. Um, and this was um, ratified by three large professional bodies in conservation, which actually you know, made me very happy. Um, the next sort of big um, uh, body of work that um, we undertook in the project was uh, to examine the CIDOC CRM ontology. And I don't know if, um, I mean, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, it's, it's an ontology um, that's sort of designed for cultural heritage discourses, and it's particularly suitable for conservation because it allows um, the description of the change in objects, in museum objects, um, development of um, uh, the condition of damage in, in objects, and of course, scientific measurements and sampling, which are all things that conservators are particularly interested in. Um, 
and a few members of the link conservation data project were actively involved with the CDOC CRM, including me. So it, you know, it sort of it, it worked really well. Um, and the CDOC CRM um, uh, sort of we examined the, its its suitability. Um, there were areas that we discovered that could do with a little bit more development, and I'm just listing them here. Uh, so um, that that would be things like recording risk. Conservators typically record, you know, assess the risk of, for for uh, an object. Uh, negative statements. We're not only interested on what on the what is uh, what exists on the object, but what does not exist. You know, that's really useful information in conservation. Um, treatment plans. Conservators typically say, okay, we 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 make this this assessment, and this is what we're going to do to you know fix the object, as it were. Um, and the CDOC CRM deals very well with past events, but uh, not so well with planned events or things that may happen in the future. So we built a few um, uh, uh, mini extensions to, to deal with these um, limitations for conservation and also contributed to existing um, extensions like the CRM SI, which is the extension for scientific observation, which actually was very um, helpful to us. Um, another outcome of the project was uh, to build uh, a link data pilot. Um, so this was uh, a portal. Um, we're using the research space uh, software, which is a link data platform uh, software, uh, to bring together uh, data sets around one uh, use case, which in this case was book conservation. So the reattachment of boards on books, yeah, okay, a very specific example for conservation, but it was useful to just see how far we can take it. Um, and some of the uh, consortium members were libraries, and they held data on book conservation uh, over many decades. And so we collected this uh, data, we modeled it, and then we're able to sort of answer some research questions or sort of examine hypotheses about book conservation. Uh, this is a um, uh, an example showing um, the kind of techniques that have been used in the past 20, 30 years to reattach boards to books. Uh, and those of you who are paying attention to the terminology will, you will see that obviously reconciliation of terms um, was an issue from, from early on. Uh, this is another example to show how uh, um, materials used during conservation have changed over the um, over the decades. So the hypothesis here is that from using animal glue, we're now we're now using uh, starch paste. Um, and and so we we answered a few of these questions in our um, in uh, in our pilot. Uh, now, like I said, terminology was an issue from from early on. So we established a terminology working group, primarily with uh, conservators, but also with um, uh, experts in uh, knowledge organization. And I'm sure you will uh, see some uh, familiar names over here. Um, so we, we tried to attack this problem of, of terminology in conservation. So the first thing we did was put together a questionnaire uh, and ask people what, what, what they do about, about terminology. We got 40 responses back. Okay, this isn't, I'm not suggesting it's in any way representative of the whole of the conservation field. Uh, but it was certainly representative of the consortium, and it gave us some, you know, a, a good starting point to see what what the issues are around terminology. So we asked questions about the, um, the the role of the people within organizations who deals with terminology, um, what kind of software they use, how their systems are set up, and of course the uh, specific terminologies or vocabularies that they're using in their work on a, on a daily basis. So we got these responses back, and it was positive to see some some people were using already published thesauri. A lot of them were using internal word lists, um, and although, like I said, the responses were limited, it was pretty clear that a couple of the thesauri that exist already, the vocabulary that exist already, were quite popular. One of them was the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, and the other one was the Cameo. Um, uh, thesaurus, but of course, also it, it sort of showed the, the sort of the variety of vocabularies that people use. 
So we compiled all that a list of vocabularies, and we, you know, one of the outputs of the uh, of the project was to to produce that list. And there, there were more than what I th had thought in the first place. Yeah. So it's a, it's, you know, it's quite a long list. Um, and then having compiled that list, I mean, this acts as a sort of reference point where a conservator wants to build a, a, a data set. You know, they can come here and see what other people are using to uh, 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 describe uh, their own records. The next step was to examine each of these vocabularies and uh, sort of tag it with, with some terms. So we would uh, describe it based on the subject area. For example, this one is about um, uh, book techniques and materials. Uh, and we will also examine it on the, um, the, the current technical setup, uh, whether they had the, the vocabulary had any scope notes, if there were any hierarchies, um, were there any structured data? Sometimes we just get a you know a PDF file with scanned pages from a 1970s publication that is still quite um, uh, useful for many uh, conservators. And then we did a little bit of um, work to understand how much effort would it take for each of these vocabularies to be published as SCOS and to be uh, aligned with with other vocabularies. Uh, so things like producing URIs, you know, matching concept and coding, all these things. So we we sort of we we had a, a, a reasonable understanding of of that amount of effort. So with the simple vocabulary and these responses, we were able to get you know quite a good insight of what what is happening. So understand you know the the the, the trends, the, the vocabularies that are more popular. Um, understand very importantly the overlap in scope. Yeah, like all uh, previous speakers said, uh, the massive overlap over the different uh, vocabularies. And people are stubborn. Yeah, they don't want to just switch to another vocabulary. Um, and then also uh, prioritize with, you know, uh, uh, assessing the amount of effort needed, prioritize the amount of work that we need um, uh, to, uh, to publish these vocabularies more um, uh, formally. Um, and of course, uh, meet with people who maintain these vocabularies and establish these uh, these uh, relationships. And then we have a long discussion uh, about okay, we we say we we create scores uh, versions of all of these vocabularies, and then we need to host these things somewhere. Um, and we start discussions about you know what kind of portal, what kind of software do we need to um, to do that. Um, and these discussions went on for a while, and we had a range of options, and some of them have been presented already today. Um, the point was, of course, that there was no uh, security for long-term maintenance. If we had uh, a little bit of a complex software with a, <laughs> with a software stack underneath, somebody needs to maintain that. And for a small domain like conservation, it is not an easy thing. So uh, after a lot of discussion, uh, we sort of we abandoned the idea and we opted for a, a, a okay a GitHub repository uh, which does not provide that functionality, but what provides is long term uh, security uh, and shared ownership. Something that you can change hands quite quickly if one body is not able to maintain. Yeah. And of course, people will have mixed views about, you know, whether relying on Microsoft uh, infrastructure is a good thing or not. I'm not going to make a comment on that. But anyway, it was it was a decision we eventually um, uh, made. So we built this um, voca um, uh, repository. It's fairly simple. There's one folder where all the SCOS vocabularies will be shared as RDF or other formats. And then there's another folder where the alignment data between any two vocabularies um, will be shared. And the reason why we keep this very distinct um, is because, like you know, we, we heard already in this session, um, when one vocabulary changes version uh, and then another changes version in a different rate, the alignment between the two quite quickly uh, goes out of sync. So keeping that independent of the of the versions of the vocabularies, uh, we thought was a good idea. And there's a naming convention to navigate all that, but you know these are details. Um, and we also use the built-in wiki functionality uh, from uh, GitHub to uh, produce some instructions on how to use the repository. And that was meant originally to be a very sort of technical uh, document on you know dealing with the, with the with the repository. But as we engage with conservators more and more, 
this document became longer and longer and more education, educational in nature. So we start uh, the table of contents here. Yeah. So we start with the um, the sort of the types of vocabularies. Yeah, what is a list? What is a glossary? What is a thesaurus? Why they are different? Why it's better to you know opt for a more complexity? Um, and then we we continue with a little bit more technical terms like how to produce your own URIs and how to um, encode your records in a, in a machine-friendly uh, way. Um, we also had a, a quick start guide. Um, conservators are busy people like everyone else, so having a 20 pages document, introductory uh, document on just how to deal with your vocabulary may be a little bit too much for some people. So we tried to make this as uh, simple and to the point as possible. So we've annotated a spreadsheet. Conservatives can hit the road running, you know, with the spreadsheet quite quickly. Um, and we're using uh, the tools offered by Scosplay, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. And I think, you know, they're, they're very useful. Um, we also produced a couple of um, flowcharts just to make this information a little bit more accessible and, and visual. And you will see that there is a, an annotation in each action point where uh, you're either given uh, ideas of you know the kind of tools that you can use to undertake that step, or the reasoning behind making a decision. You know how to decide, uh, you know uh, what kind of uh, URI you want to build, and and so on. And this is the same thing for uh, uh, vocabulary alignment. Um, in this uh, in this case, we've got um, uh, the, the the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, similar to what uh, Doug mentioned for Ariadne, um, acts as an umbrella thesaurus. It's by no means complete for for conservation, uh, but it was we thought the best thing we could have at this at this point. Um, so we are hoping that if a vocabulary is published as course, at least is aligned with uh the getty aat in some in some way um we're also um uh, mentioning here the backbone thesaurus bpt which is a thesaurus that has been designed with a little bit more um sort of uh, strict isa hierarchies that match the cdoc crm um perhaps a little bit more uh, um uh, sort of strict than than aat so anyway these are a couple of thesaurus that we thought might be quite useful to use as umbrella um, is all right. And then within the pilot, we showcased what you can do. Yeah? So you can use a, 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 a continue using your own term in your vocabulary, uh, but search with terms from uh, the Getty or other Thesauri. Um, so this was really our, um, our trip with, um, with, uh, with terminology. Um, I think I mean, a couple of points that uh, I think are probably worth discussion, discussing maybe uh, later in the in the panel is this idea of the long-term sustainability. Who takes the responsibility to maintain this for a small domain like conservation, but also without losing ownership, yeah? Um, it's one thing to say, okay, we'll use, um, you know, another uh, a, a, a portal in another organization, but that sort of, you lose the ownership of it. It's difficult to convince a community to switch to that to that thing. Um, and the other point that I found very interesting and you know completely diverted the uh, the route of the project was uh, working closely with conservators, uh, domain experts that do not have the knowledge in um, or the expertise, the experience in um, in uh, building thesauri and trying to explain all this complexity and, and why it is important. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions and the discussion later on. Thanks, um, thanks to Nasis. Um, that was a very uh, uh, rich presentation, um, and uh, in fact, it reminded me that um, in Ariadne, uh, my last comment. Um, uh, in addition to using the um, the for uh, the archaeology um, infrastructure, in addition to using the Getty AAT, as Thras has just mentioned, uh, Ariadne also used um, the CDOC CRM uh, for on the. Uh, uh, in, a, in a formal way for data integration. Um, let's, uh, we're over time, in t but let's uh, uh, take some time, uh, well, not, 
actually Thanasis was very, <laughs> very good at keeping to time, but the uh, we, we've, we've been over time uh, uh, um, uh, generally. Um, we got a couple uh, of comments. I don't know if you can see the chat uh, or, or questions. Um, Thanasis, uh, do you want to address them? Yarma has got a question about the terminology of conservation. Yeah. Um, so Yano says, uh, do you do you get problems using the term conservation alone? How to differentiate from nature conservation, which is always the first related concept in my brain? Uh, would you include that con that conservation? Um, no, I think they're very uh, different things, of course, and that's why my first slide was to show a painting to you know clarify that um, it's it's art conservation. I think um, uh, it, uh, you know it's I think um, um, uh, Clement uh, mentioned earlier um, that the it, it it's about the scope note, yeah, it's about defining the concept, um, and I think um, clearly nature conservation and uh, art conservation are very different disciplines and very different activities. There is a little bit of overlap when it comes to uh, sites, archaeological sites, um, but the, the the kind of activity that I was describing is more about object conservation in museums, uh, libraries, or memory organizations in general. So I would consider them quite different domains, yeah. Uh Matthias has um, uh, some excellent discussion points and resonated with me in our experiences. Um, Matthias, did you want just to elaborate on what, which of the um, sort of discussion points um, particularly, uh, or, 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 or just speak speak to it? Uh, yes, the, 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 um, uh, the point on uh, these like very specialized and sort of uh, small uh, organizations or, or small uh, thesauri or terminologies and uh, how they're sort of the the, uh, the question of ownership uh, in that we have also we have run across uh, these like uh, extremely specialized like we had one one uh, museum on on uh, like old sleds and wagons and and they had a like a, a vocabulary about sleds and wagons and and it's like super specialized and very small and and um, and this always uh that if you sort of incorporate it into the larger larger ecosystem and the and the uh, larger world it sort of gets lost in the in the uh uh it sort of gets lost in there and and also uh it can be uh, for the user who uses the sort of the the, the more generalized uh, uh, version or or the more more generalized uh, vocabulary, uh, it can be a bit jarring if there's a, like a very specialized uh, uh, portion <laughs> there, and yeah. and there are start to wonder that that which type of sled do I have? I, I have no idea about this. So so that's uh, that's certainly uh, something that that that's a, like a very interesting uh, question and 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 uh, challenge. Thanks. And um, Jakob um, asked if there are plans um, or ideas to make the vocabularies available via an API. Yes, uh, I mean, again, yeah, this was part of the discussion. Uh, we would have loved to be able to do that. Um, and um, but I mean, it's it's going back to this idea, then uh, we need to sort of have some more specialist software to be able to serve this this content in different ways. And um, uh, we could probably set something up as part of the project, but you can sort of uh, raise the expectations of the community. Then the funding goes. Then you know the university has other priorities or whatever. And then who maintains that thing? I mean, it's it's a very difficult thing to. And within conservation, uh, the discussion started on shouldn't we have like you know we have an, the International Institute for Conservation? They do not necessarily have the the resources to maintain this kind of thing or the expertise. So, it's it's still a, a you know a pending question for me. How, how do we maintain that complex software that it would allow you know to serve through a, a, an API and so on, uh, while maintaining ownership? 
and doing it in a sustainable way. Um, so I'd, I'd be very happy to hear, you know, ideas and, and views. I'm not, I'm not sure I've got the answer. Okay, maybe let's park that and pick that up in the in the in the final final discussion because I think it would be it's a general one about about the uh, sustainability. Is it, that's the uh, so maybe um, remind me, Thanasis, if we. Okay, um, starting starting again. Reminding folk, uh, recording is um, in progress, um, and. Um, uh, hopefully, folk are back from the coffee. Etienne, Etienne, are you are you back yet? Maybe. Maybe I should say something instead of just uh, gesturing <laughs> with my hands. <laughs> yes. Hi, hi Etienne. <laughs> you, uh, you're ready. Let me just. I'll do a very brief intro. Uh, Etienne. Um, uh, uh, Posthumus is a senior researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Information Infrastructure, Karlsruhe. He'll be talking about the Chinese iconography, iconography thesaurus and its online service. Over to you, uh, Etienne. Doug, <laughs> just checking my screen is visible, uh, right? Yes, screen is visible. Okay. We can hear you. Oh. Um, I'm Etienne Postumus uh, from the FEZ Karlsruhe in Germany, um, but I'm actually based in Amsterdam and operate from there and I operate a cultural heritage consultancy in Amsterdam. And I'm presenting this together with Dr. Hongxing Zhang from the VNA in London. The CIT, the Chinese Iconography Thesaurus, uh, has a journey from around 2016 when it all started. And I'd like to talk about this journey up until where we are. Uh, at the moment. The idea for the CIT is a subject indexing standard for Chinese art. It's been inspired by icon class, the European comprehensive classification system for the content of images, which is slightly more well known and which is actually a, a very old system, uh, first published in around 1972 until 1985 as 17 volumes of printed books. And it used to be the bane of art history students' <laughs> lives as they were taught to look up things in these volumes um, laboriously to, to discover these classification codes. Um, in around 1999, we made the first online version. I, I made that version as well. And I'm also the maintainer of Icon Class. Um, in icon class, you know, we, we were often asked this question, where are the images? And this is very much like asking uh, Dewey, you know, where are the books? Um, people experienced with knowledge organization systems will understand this difference, but it's it's often a very difficult thing to explain to, to non-technical uh, persons. Um, so eventually in icon class, we decided to actually add some images as examples. So to show you have the classification system, but at the same time, if you were to apply it, here are some example images. And uh, icon class has become quite widely used across the world now. Um, it's also been translated by volunteers. Um, here is the example is being translated into Japanese completely. Um, or also into Portuguese uh, or from volunteers, cooperation between teams in Brazil and Portugal. Um, but it's also in other languages. Originally, it was made in English, um, fully translated into German, French, Italian. There were even some parts into Finnish and Dutch, um, but these were uh, never completed. But it, it's widely used around the world. What's the importance of controlled vocabularies? I'm preaching to the converted here. But the idea is that if you use it, you can link collections. You can make cross-collection search and analysis feasible. And here is an example of a database that, that uh, did this, the Archives Project. And this is a database to try and bring together subject queries for more than 40 collections of Europe, European art. Uh, and the, the, the golden thread that binds all of them is to use icon class to index the subject matters. The other really useful uh, aspect of using controlled vocabularies 
is that you can use it for the semantic web and artificial intelligence research. And here, for example, we made the icon class data available as a test set. It's also on hugging uh, uh, places like hugging face as a data set. So that it could be used for training data uh, and as input to validate and test your artificial intelligence uh, systems. And we've had some, some great usage uh, of the vocabularies uh, for uh, papers that have been published uh, in the AI research uh, recently, which makes us very happy. So a number of years ago, um, Hong Xing had the idea to do something similar for Chinese art. Um, it's always been one of the um, criticisms of the icon class system that it's very Western biased and it's, it's purely based for Western European art. Um, and if you want to use it for, for other uh, collections, um, there are serious gaps. And so um, the aspiration is to create something like an extension of icon class for indexing visual contents of Chinese art and, as a and to create a standard terminology. Um, it can cover the majority of subject matters depicted on portable objects in museum and library collections with scope ranging from scroll paintings through decorative arts to prints in the period from the early Tang to the late Qing. Where did it all start? Um, so I'm I'm actually reading some information from Hong Xing, so please uh, apologize for my mispronunciation of uh, certain uh, words. The, the project team began to work on the Shiku Baoji and the Midian Zhu Lin as the core body of the raw data. We chose them because, as we know, these two series of catalogues on the Qing Imperial Collections of Calligraphy and Paintings, commissioned by the Qianlong and his son Jiaqing Emperor from 1744 to 1816, despite their many defects, are the most representative, representative and the most detailed among all historical catalogues for the subject. When developing the CIT structure, we adopted the icon class classification principles devised by Henry van der Waal, who in turn, based on Panofsky, Panofsky's classic three-tier theory on the meanings of works of art, pre-iconographic, iconographic, and iconological. When indexing an image, like the icon class indexers, we chose to index the first two layers of meanings and leave out the iconological interpretation to art historians, as it is often debatable and ever-changing. This slide contains a series of snapshots regarding the activities on the journey from the planning phase in the spring of 2016. For example, we hosted a joint workshop with Wenwu Zhu's collection metadata standard project team members. We traveled to the Getty Research Institute to learn from their vocabulary building experiences. And during the early phase of image indexing in 2018, we made a study trip to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam to learn from the colleagues there working on their 10-year indexing project for European prints and drawings. In autumn of 2019, we organized a conference in Beijing, bringing together leading research centers on the subject to discuss the past and the present practices of subject indexing in 2019. This was also the launch of the very first version of the CIT. Subsequently, the conference papers were published in the title of World 3 Iconographic Archives in the autumn of 2022. So next, I would actually like to uh, tempt Murphy and uh, Fate and give you a, a live demo of the system. And uh, let's see if this works and if it's going to crash or not. Um, can you see now the CIT screen? Can someone give me feedback? I've swapped browser tabs. Yes, yes we can see. Right. So this is actually the um, the, the database that we're looking at now, and it consists of two parts, as mentioned. The actual uh, vocabulary containing 14,600 terms and a number of artworks that have been classified using the vocabulary as an example. And it contains collections from the v &A in London, the National Palace Museum in Taiwan, the Metropolitan in New York, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Harvard Art Library at the moment. And of course, the, the goal is to expand this uh, over time and especially to inspire others to eventually use the CIT to be uh, cataloging and classifying their collections as well. But you have to start somewhere. Um,
Um, here we can see some of the numbers uh, used in the various collections. As you can see, the bulk of them um, are from the National Palace Museum in, tai in Taipei, um, and then from the other collections. Um, when you jump in and browse and search the collection, it's very much an image database. And one could, by typing in search terms, you have a full text index here. And as you type in terms, um, it shows you which uh, terms from the classification system are linked to the search results from what you typed. And if we choose one of the uh, items, um, you can look at the image and then on the left-hand side here, see the actual terms that were used to classify the relevant image. And in a very standard way, by then clicking on one of these terms, you can refine your search index. And now on the right hand in the middle here, we can see that we've now combined these search terms. Um, and if I click another one, we now have this image has both of these two terms uh, for the image. Um, all images use uh, the standard IIIF system for viewing and uh, describing the images. And we integrate the Mirador system for a light box functionality by enabling this little switch on the top left hand corner. I can create a light box and view um, the images that I would like to see and compare them um, side by side. I noticed that the system has slowed down a little bit, so it could be that uh, we have more than uh, with different people using the system. Um, it slows down a little bit. <clears throat> uh, you can see I've selected various images and I can now view them side by side uh, in the system. And also, um, I'm sure that the, um, the Mirador system is familiar to many of you. In, in how you can compare images, look at them side by side, and also link in IIIF sources from other websites. Um, it's also useful to mention that um, because it's IIIF and each image um, that we have here, you have the IIIF link for it. Um, you can use this image if you wanted to uh, link it in, in other viewing systems and so combine uh, the system. Um, this is the image part, and then if we choose one of the items, you can also go and view it in the context um, in the traditional hierarchical system. And here we can see where the system is at the top, very general concepts, and as we descend down, it becomes more uh, fine-grained, as it is, I think, very familiar to most of you uh, in the knowledge organization community. Um, and by clicking on the terms, you can, you know, see the images linked for that uh, concept. Uh, very much standard things. Switching back to the presentation. Um, we have two parts, the terminology part and the image part. Um, and in the beginning, we were um not widely trying to get uh, the community to use the system yet waiting for the, the 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 hierarchy to settle down so it's no use um promoting a system and trying uh, people to use your standard if you're still very much in, in the building blocks and deciding how the hierarchy of your system will fit together and how it will actually be used um at this point, the system has started to settle down and coalesce into a reasonably stable system. And the IDs that we are using for the system has also stabilized. So we will are now will be taking the next step into try and promote uh, the use of the system as a standard and to try and convince uh, participants to also use the system. Um, we've minted uh, terms for the system under the slash ID URI space for the CIT. And all uh, items with all terms within the vocabulary is expressed um, as a turtle file, as a concept. So you can view it uh, in this way um, as a SCOS concept. 
And uh, when we were thinking, while turtle files and RDF is really um, the, the core of it and how it fits together, we were wondering what would be a, uh, a very practical and useful alternative representation. And, and in this case, I chose uh, JSCOS. Um, and I'm sure, I'm not sure if Jakob is in the audience that he will be speaking uh, after me uh, uh, in this uh, panel. But the, the JSCOS way of sharing your information is a very practical way of enabling and crossing the divide between the, the linked data worlds and the, the more practical oriented uh, web developers worlds. So we've expressed all our terminologies in JSCOS. And uh, if I were to, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to type, retype this URI, but that's the URI. And if you, you, you have a look at it, you can then browse the whole concept uh, using standard JSON, which is very convenient. Um, there's also a Sparkle interface for the CIT. Um, so you could browse the concepts using Sparkle in the same way and do uh, queries um, of the system in that way. Um, in future, we are considering on how to actually um, map the contents and the images of the CIT uh, in a semantic way. And one of the standards that we've uh, been considering is the linked art standard, which I might be familiar to many of you uh, by Rob Sanderson, currently at Yale. Um, and it's a very similar to in spirit to how the IIIF standard was developed. Um, and we're considering whether that's one of the uh, useful ways of actually mapping the image data of the CIT. Um, but it's still a very much an open question. Um, and if you uh, have any suggestions of um, vocabularies or ontologies that could be used to um, map the semantic data, I uh, would be very interested to hear from you. Um, other future work that we plan on uh, doing is um, doing some better semantic search using some sentence embeddings and doing visual searching. These are two um, features which we've already done for the icon class system. Um, the semantic search means that um, you're doing your search results not purely on the words of the full text, but you're doing a semantic mapping of the contents of your uh, vocabulary. And when users do their searches, it gives a slightly more, um, in a way, user-friendly way of doing your searches as your, your search results. You, you always get results, even if your searches are not as exact uh, as one types. And You'll notice this This is what happened with the Google searches changing dramatically a few years ago. Um, the concept of uh, sentence transformers were actually uh, developed by Google AI. Um, and that's when your Google searches suddenly changed to be, you always got results. And it was very rare that you didn't get results. And it's because they used this content, concept of sentence embeddings. And especially for small collections like the CIT, it can give uh, incredibly useful results. And in the icon class uh, side, we've already seen how um, the language independence that it gives you um, is, is dramatic and you, you, you get very, very uh, uh, good search results using that. Um, and the other aspect is the visual searching uh, so that you can actually drag and drop images into your search results and then use uh, visual similarity um, to, to get your search results and not only by typing in keywords. Um, once again, this is something we've done in the icon class side, and we really look forward to be doing this um, for the CIT as well. Um, and two other uh, aspects which we hope to to work on in the coming uh, near future is network analysis using our data and doing some more visualizations. Um, all the data and all the software for the CIT is on GitHub. Uh, so you can uh, have a look there and uh, it's freely open and it's under an open license. And we actually do all the uh, development work and the data work on the GitHub repo. Um, and it's it's free and available um, to reuse. <clears throat> and I'm actually zooming ahead, seeing that we're running a little bit behind. I think uh, I left out some bits, but I think it would be a good moment to... Uh, say if there are any questions please uh, feel free to ask them and otherwise we will be and i have i have one more point to raise seeing that we've got some time but i'm first going to leave it open for for questions to the audience
Okay. Um, let's, uh, if folk have uh, questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. I had a, uh, a minor point. I was, uh, I'm not sure if I missed it. Uh, did I hear you say that you, um, in your demo, um, the live demo, there was a hierarchical interface to the CIT? Um, is, uh, is it, uh, did you have a example of that? What was it one of your slides? I, I... Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, and um, <clears throat> one other point which I uh, neglected to mention, of course, it is fully multilingual, um, which is a very important part, seeing that our target audience is, of course, um, also not only European users, but uh, users in China. Um, the whole system is uh, also in traditional um, Chinese. I see a question. Oh, it's not really a question. I might be thinking, Clement, that's not a question. You might have pasted in the wrong window or is that a recommendation that I should contact? No, no, that, that was that was a point for, uh, I just met someone yesterday that told me about cultural heritage, working on semantics and, and just wanted to share the, the link. Um, Super. Yeah, so seems, she seems to be so Beatrice Markov. She's from University of Tours. Seems to be very connected to a lot of uh, European initiative in cultural heritage, including um, with semantics approach. So, I was thinking maybe it will make sense to reach out. I will, I will. I will email her a general message saying, "Clement recommended I email you." I'm not sure why I'm emailing you, but hello. <laughs> um, other, other. Questions, uh, comments? Um, oh, I see Matthias has his hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, no, I'm very far from an expert in Chinese art, but uh, as far as I've understood, there is this, uh, or or there was at, at some, some uh, point in history, this uh, uh, sort of, I, uh, idea or or a, or a tradition that the art was uh, or or paintings included uh, poems, and uh, and and the art was sort of a, a, a collaboration between the painting and the poem and the calligraphy used to depict the poem. Uh, so I was just sort of wondering whether you could el elaborate on on sort of the. Uh, on the nature of the art uh, of the of the Chinese art compared to the Western art, and, and what were the sort of the um, maybe challenges or or interesting uh, things that you encountered while while doing this work, or from from sort of that perspective. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, firstly, I'm not a, a content expert, so um, my hat is as a computer scientist and knowledge management uh, person. Um, but the concept of iconography and describing your artwork iconographically uh, in a strange way doesn't really exist in China at the moment. It's an incredibly new field. And when we traveled to Beijing in 2019 and explained and showed our work, um, it was it's, it's seen as quite an exciting new thing. Um, and it's 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 actually um, not been done very much, and there's very much been a focus in Chinese art on calligraphy, and um, these kind of aspects. And so the 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 subject indexing uh, is a, is a is a very new thing. Now I noticed my my colleague Hong Xing is also in the audience. Uh, I'm not sure if Hong Xing if and he's he's unfortunately been traveling uh, very very much, so he might not be. Uh, able to answer, but I'm just giving you the opportunity. Hong Xing, do you want to mention something about this? Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. And thank you, Matthias. Um, I, I try, try my best. <laughs> it's a it's great, great question. Um, as you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, there's a, um, it is a big difference between, say, European painting and the Chinese painting in that 
in Chinese painting, yeah, usually you see inscriptions, um, the texts inside in the pictorial space, and which uh, sometimes uh, is a collaborate between painters and calligraphers or writers. And but in many cases, uh, also by the painters themselves. And that I thought it's a, it's a really great source for the, for the iconographic approach and the two Chinese painting. In Western paintings that so you don't, you have the, the say classical or um, for example, the uh, Christian um, say um, the Bible stories and uh, but you don't have an inscri inscription about those stories on the painting or in the painting. But in China, um, usually we do. And so those inscriptions are really the source, um, the textual, say, source for iconography. That's why and uh, I thought even, and as the ATM points out, the iconographical approach in Chinese art history as a scholarship is not really is very new, but in fact, the source of iconography, it's really rich. And also there's, um, you could say, it's a quite direct link between images and the text. And so that the text is, uh, is a solid foundation for, for this approach. That's why the CIT, as the ATM uh, showed in the slides, based on the historical catalog. Those are catalog, the 18th century and the early 19th century catalog is quite a detailed um, uh, documentation of not just the, the description of the image by catalogs, but also inscriptions as well. So the raw data of this the CIT is based on inscriptions and the historical titling. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, very, very interesting. Thank you. So um, there's a few minutes left, and I'd like to take this opportunity to hijack the discussion briefly, if you don't mind, uh, Douglas. And that's to ask, seeing that we have, you know, the brightest minds as far as SCOS and uh, COS in general in, in this, this gathering, I'd like to ask a question on how to solve a problem that we have with the icon class system. So for icon class, we've had to, to deal with a system that's about 60 years old and used <clears throat> widely across the world with actually defined notations that we can't change because we can't reach in to the databases in libraries and places all over the world that have used these, these concepts and change them. So we have to retroactively keep on supporting them and the key, the, the problem is when this system was devised by art historians uh, 50 years ago, <clears throat> they came up with small little subtrees in the main knowledge organization system that gets activated at various places. And they called these keys. And then you've got this little mini hierarchies, which could be attached to various places in your main vocabulary. Or th and the the net result of this is that in icon class you have about forty thousand concepts, but then you have all these little subtrees that can be attached to various places in these concepts, and then you get and when you expand them you get a vocab you get about a million nodes in your hierarchy. And plain scos is not sufficient to model this. And well, or it might be, but I'm, I've just not been able to understand how to express this in SCOS. Um, and the problem that you encounter and what this also means is that in systems like the um, the ontology systems in, in Finland or the Bartok, you only have a small part of icon class. You only have the icon class without these keys. And that gives a sort of, um wrong view of the actual vocabulary because you're missing important parts and if that wasn't sufficient or if that wasn't bad enough with these keys they also came up with this concept of with names where inside the notations you have brackets round brackets 
and the end user is invited to fill in their own things like names of fruits or names of uh, saints. And so instead of your classification system being comprehensive, you have these open parts. Now, I would really love to speak to experts who deal with knowledge organization systems and SCOS to, to, to try and say, hey, you know, how can we how can we fix this problem? Unfortunately, in the CIT, we knew about this, so we avoided this completely by saying in the CIT, we do not have keys, we do not have these open-ended with names. So in the Chinese iconography thesaurus, we could avoid this pain altogether and from the get-go not do this. But unfortunately, you know, icon class is used globally all around the world, and we still have to support this ancient art historical way of describing things. And yeah, open question. If there's anyone in the audience who has comments or would like to speak to me, please, you know, do. Maybe, um, yeah, we could follow up afterwards and um, also uh, in the discussion. But I was just wondering, Clement, does this overlap with the discussion we had about your SCOS extensions? If you're there, is Clement there? May I give a comment? <laughs> Oh, and Jakob has oh, a comment. I haven't seen. Yeah. So yeah. I can't give a full answer, but uh, the issue of the keys is very similar to the um, how the duodecimal classification is used. So the, the in our library data, we have a lot of duodecimal notations that are built up from base numbers. And it's, uh, yeah, if you take all of this, it's, it's get uh, also in millions. Um, of key, so we have built a service to decompose uh, these numbers, and yeah. So with raw scores, it can't be done. But the problem uh, is not only in in icon class. It has some resemblance to the scores collections, or perhaps the Fuller expression in ISO two five nine six four. Jakob, have you? You haven't done experiments with that? No, just a DDC. And uh, have you looked at UDC? It's um, even more complicated. So maybe uh, con get in contact with uh, UDC uh, editors. But anyway, uh, we should uh, stick to one solution that, that covers eigenclass, DDC, and, and other terminologies which share, share this, um, this issue. Yeah. Just um, uh, one one thought. Um, I think that that would be a good idea. I, it does seem to have some connection. The the keys perhaps have some connection with the notion of um, of, of collections in SCOS. And ex um, an earlier talk by Clement Etienne uh, talked about his extensions to SCOS uh, regarding um, uh, some aspects of collections. Um, it's also Fuller developed in ISO 25964, the um, uh, collections have, have, have more functionality, sort of like um, micro thesauri. Um, so these could be two starting points, but um, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I've also come across the, uh, the keys. It's, it's an important issue. Um, so I think maybe um, we should um, perhaps Pick it up again if other ideas in the um, uh, the um, um, uh, in the in discussion. I'm just looking at the uh, at the chat there. Uh, Jakob, do you want to um, uh, start share? If you can stop sharing, Etienne and Jakob, start sharing, and I'll. Very briefly, um, say that the uh, Jakob uh, Voss um, is going to give the uh, uh, final presentation in this session on the uh, Bartok repository, which has been mentioned uh, a few times earlier, preparing Bartok for the future of knowledge organization. Uh, Jakob is a research and development manager uh, at the head office of the uh, BZG Common Library Network in Germany. Over to you. Yeah, cool. Okay, so first, thank you for organizing this workshop. It, uh, the recent talks were really interesting and there are some uh, connections to Bartok as well. Um, yeah, 
I, I suppose you've all heard of Bartok, um, but I still will nevertheless give a general interest talk in introduction, then some current numbers of the uh, registry. Uh, yeah, the basic features, uh, but more more of interest, recent new developments and next steps uh, where we want to extend the system to. And in the end, there are some discussion points, uh, general challenges uh, to manage and, and uh, create such a system. Okay, yeah, so the first started as Basel Register, now basic register of Cesaro ontologies and classifications was initiated by Andreas Ledel. So it's already uh, 10 years ago. And since 2020, uh, we, VCG, took over the technical, um, first the technical um, hosting and uh, also now also the um, the general uh, management. Uh, yeah, in short, it's um, the most comprehensive catalog uh, or list of knowledge organization systems. And yeah, the terminology differs among communities. Some call it ontologies, some vocabularies, some terminologies. Um, in, in Bartok, we mostly, um, I think we, in most places we use uh, the term vocabulary for everything. And the basic um, information in Bartok is information about vocabulary. So some title, publisher, subject domains, abstract, and so on. Um, that's the first. And then we focus more and more on um, information about access. So when you find there is a vocabulary, who's responsible? How can it, is there an API, uh, which la license is this uh, vocabulary license under and so on? And uh, yeah, some additional machine readable information about content like the language um, and, and size and so on. And yeah, so to, to a growing part, there's more and more identifiers and technical data because uh, vocabularies are listed like like icon class is listed and I, I guess in, in almost a dozen of different uh, registries and lists and catalogs and, and some use other identifiers for the same vocabulary. So Bartok tries to uh, put this together so you can better find vocabularies. And everything is uh, accessible as linked open data and via APIs using this um, already mentioned JSCOS format that we developed in, in the recent years. And the content is not only edited by us, but there's a group of international Bartok editors. And um, at the moment, we are from uh, 14 countries and we have some additional contributors. So if you want to uh, get right access, uh, we, I j just need your ORCID identifier and then you can log in with your ORCID and, and do um, contributions. And we have a yeah, more or less yearly meeting online um, with the editors to, to share the recent developments in discussion. So this is a short summary of Bartok. Um, I, I thought that most of you know the basics, so I uh, kept it short. Now some current numbers. Um, at the moment, we have around 3,500 vocabularies. And uh, in this diagram, you see the, the history it started with a list of Cesari or there's a quarter of the vocabularies are Cesare, another a bit more than a quarter are classifications of different type. And the other um, large part is ontologies because there was some um, some large automatic uh, import and there are more and more ontologies. But um, I'm sure there are more ontologies not listed in Bartok uh, yet. So the, the focus is more, more on, on uh, other controlled vocabularies. And yeah, ten, about 10% 10 glossaries. These are not very really, uh, semantic, but useful as well. Um, yeah, and some other types like gazetteers. And every year, or in the recent years, there are around 20 to 30 um, new records. So it grows um, not that fast, but steady. And um, uh, existing records are updated. Um, as well. So if the API or publisher changes and, and things are outdated. And apart from the vocabularies, uh, there's a growing list of registries. So other lists of vocabularies, um, like we've seen before. And yeah, uh, it, it's uh, even more. Now we, uh, we counted 126, including Bartok. Um, 
and um, this number has grown um, from 100, 102 in 2021. And we also try to um, catalog whether there is an API and which kind of API. So um, the current number is 126, but five of them have already been uh, closed. And we also, um, we still keep the information about there was some project to, to collect vocabularies, but now it's offline or it had been closed. And still the, the remaining registries, um, 55 of them um, have an API of some kind. So for instance, Cosmos have standard APIs or, or onto portal. Yeah. And at the moment we uh, collect uh, registries and vocabularies independently. Uh, but the plan is, um, like I will uh, tell about later, is, is to query these uh, registries automatically and, and synchronize uh, the information in there with, with the vocabulary data. And for this plan, here's an overview um, about um, the APIs to access vocabulary. So the um, first uh, row here is a different kind of APIs that we know of. So Cosmos is very popular. Um, our Jesco's API, um, Sparkle is a very general um, API. So we haven't fully implemented because you always need some adaptions depending on the Sparkle endpoint. But Cosmos is a very, uh, yeah, if, if for one Cosmos instance uh, it works, then it works for all of them. Um, or there are some other vocabulary management tools. And some um, publishers have their own uh, custom API, like Library of Congress or Medical Subject Headings. Um, and um, yeah, there's a two large um, remaining um, APIs not implemented yet are onto portal and ontology lookup service. And uh, our estimate here in the last row is how many vocabularies uh, are there managed in registries uh, using the software. So around 500 OLS and on the portal, I, I guess 1,300. And um, in the middle, the, the, the number of vocabularies, we um, know the actual API endpoint. So um, uh, in the end, we will get the higher numbers here, uh, around 500 vocabularies in Cosmos. But uh, because there's not automatic synchronization, we need to, so, um, collect this information in for each and every vocabulary, so it's uh, larger. So in total, we have around 388 vocabularies that can be accessed via API with our um, software, so it can be browsed and, and, and searched. Uh, but we will, yeah, our plans, we will end up with around 5,000, I think. So yeah, the basic features, um, I can also show this live. Um, it's always my more fun. So yeah, there's uh, some basic uh, search interface, and if you search for vocabulary, and uh, then you hopefully get uh, the right answer. Um, you can filter for type or uh, or language. Um, for instance, how how many Chinese um, vocabularies we have? Uh, Seventy four, of which we know of. And um, yeah, then if um, we selected a vocabulary, um, I was just about, uh, I searched uh, about the, the Chinese iconographic uh, um, thesaurus. It, it wasn't indexed in, in Bartok yet, despite the large number of vocabularies. So if um, you are logged in with your ORCID and I've given you the, the right access, there's a possibility to add or edit a vocabulary. So I can show you here the live um, interface how to how is this uh, database is um, edited so I can type in here the name abbreviation some abstract uh, language of the vocabulary I guess it's the Cesaro so the type of vocabulary um, subject area so this would be I guess art or history and and some more information and one very useful information is a uh, service ul so you, we can specify here ah there's an api for the vocabulary okay i i haven't finished uh, editing as uh, adding this um this hours yet so i will skip the the live view uh, but if they are it, it's finished or if it's uh, in there as a um, vocabulary you can uh, and if there is an api this can be uh, used to um to access it I, 
I have example Dewey, also I think this is a German edition. Um, yeah, anywhere I use it. Um, so either you can search here or, or browse around and this browsing interface is the same for each of the 388 vocabularies that have um, an API that is supported by the software. Okay, so this is a, just a basic um, what um, what Bartok provides. There are some other helpful or, or nice nice tools we are working on. Um, for instance, a direct link into a catalog. By now, it's only uh, the, the German um, large library catalog K10 plus. Um, so if I select um, concept here, I can directly go to the literature, and yeah, sh this should be extended for other collections as well. Um, uh, when you have a topic, then you can find uh, yeah digitized material, books, and so on about it. And we have connected um, uh, this um, Bartok with our mapping tool Kogoda, where you you can manage alignment uh, between vocabularies. Right now, these alignments um, are not shown in, in the interface. It's, it could also be integrated. But as the first step, it's, it's, um, it's just a link and it opens. And then you get the direct um, connection to DBC mappings. Yeah, I only had, um, have some, um, some screenshots here. And um, we'll share the, the slides URL um, after the talk. OK. So these are the, the existing um, features. So it's just a catalog of, of vocabularies, but with um, API information. And, and um, this can be used to browse and search the vocabularies. Uh, the technical infrastructure is uh, uh, the, the database. It's our own development. So it's an, um, called Jesco server because we internally we use this Jesco format. So every, um, every record in here. Um, if I have one uh, record about one vocabulary like DDC, um, so there's a JSON view, and this is um, uh, yeah JSON LD or JSCOS, and then the, yeah you you get um, information and where to download the information or who uh, has um, published the vocabulary and so on. So everything that's shown here, and uh, our yeah infrastructure is that this information is stored in J JSON in a database and can be accessed. For instance, give me all. Yeah, all vocabularies uh, with Chinese language and so on. Um, like already mentioned, editing is done via, um, if you can log in with your orbit, that's because uh, we don't want to store passwords. Um, and the web application is uh, written in, in JavaScript, um, this uh, view as, as um, interface. So this was the interface um, was newly created to, um, in 2020 when we took over. But it was done in a hurry, so we, with the next um, project, we plan to uh, rewrite uh, or uh, um, improve um, all the technical infrastructure. Um, yeah. So the, the the records contain information like shown about APIs, and then we have um, a, a open source component that can make use of this information about the APIs. And uh, then you, this, you can use this programming library to say, well, for this terminology, please search for a word, or please get me this concept and show me all um, broader or narrower concepts and so on. Um, yeah, everything is open source. And uh, last but not least, uh, Bartok contains some additional content, not in a database, but um, uh, information about software, some statistic and so on. So this um, here, um, the software list is um, collected in a wiki page. And there, are, that's uh, also gave um, note of vocal um, advice. So there's one software to, to host vocabularies uh, as split files. So this uh, could be of use for the um, for the um, vocabulary registry. Um, in...
as Jacob mute himself. Sorry, um, some key uh, uh, muted me. Um, so I, I think I got lost here on this slide on additional content. So there's some in additional information about um, uh, vocabularies, about software, with statistics, and so on. So we also try to um, be um, yeah like a, a point where you can ask um, about, uh, I have a vocabulary, what to do with it, and uh, what, which software can you um, use, and so on. Um, yeah. Okay, so this uh, is um, the yeah basic in what's uh, basic content and and uh, technical infrastructure of, of Bardock, but what uh, what has been done in the recent uh, years and what are you are we planning? So um, yeah, sure, we add more and more new terminologies. Um, in the recent years, there were a large set of Korean uh, course, for instance. This has only uh, been shown in a presentation last uh, year in the workshop. Uh, more and more information about APIs in particular. Um, yeah, we try to improve the browsing, um, have a mailing list um, uh, for the editors or um, interested uh, participants. And what I want to sh uh, focus on now is uh, we just submitted uh, or a grant proposal or our second round that so we have sub uh, submitted last year. And it was um, reviewed uh, positively, but with some remarks for that we should um, uh, change or improve the proposal. And for this uh, reason, the, the extension is a delayed a bit. But um, I'm, yeah, I, I'm in a good mood that we uh, can start next year um, with some additional um, developer um, to extend Bartok. And uh, one of these extensions ha had already been done uh, in, in when Bartok was in, in Basel um, as experiment. So Bartok's Cosmos, a vocabulary server for also for hosting vocabularies. Uh, we took it over last year, but it's only um, an experimental instance, so it's not very uh, stable. And the other extension that had existed um, as a meter search um, engine on vocabularies what was called Bartok Fast. Um, so we want to rebuild it uh, next year. And yeah, Bartok's Cosmos is uh, live there, but yeah, we could all, it's, we, uh, I, can, uh, could, uh, I can only imagine that we uh, use Onto Portal or some other software um, to do, um, because there's always a need for, for smaller vocabularies to, to be hosted at some place. And um, uh, it would be nice if we can, we can with Bartok provide such a place. So, now I want you to summarize the main goals, what we are going to achieve in the next years uh, with this um, uh, with this funding. So um, there are uh, four or five uh, main goals. So this one is if, uh, it improves the content. Of course, we want to um, do more cataloging to see what's outdated uh, there to extend the information. Um, but also the search is not very good, uh, I, I must admit. So. For instance, if you don't type the, the um, if you have some typo in, 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 in your words, uh, you won't find the uh, vocabularies and it should better be a browsing uh, around in topics and general areas, or it would be nice to have a feature to show me similar vocabularies. Yeah, and general update of the technical infrastructure is needed. So first we want to just to be more and better. Then we want to introduce some new capabilities. Um, yeah, first one is to integrate with other systems of vocabulary management, like already um, uh, indicated. So if there is a registry like um, uh, hosted with Cosmos or, or this list um, uh, in uh, preservation, uh, we want to um, establish some workflow that the um, information about vocabularies is automatically synchronized or imported into Bartok, so we don't have to do it all by hand. And we also want to import um, additional information like mappings um, between um, vocabularies and links into catalogs um, and so on. Yeah, then we want to better support uh, research data management uh, by the introduction of, of additions and relations between terminologies. By now we have one vocabulary is one record, but these get updated with different additions or maybe a subset of another vocabulary is used to build some new uh, um, Cesaros. 
this information cannot be um, managed by now. Yeah, and we want to improve the usability and workflows of editing. So you, all of you could just um, click on edit without lo being logged in and, and um, yeah, suggest um, new vocabulary or um, uh, something to be fixed. Yeah, and the last uh, goals, uh, we want to provide additional services. So um, yeah, to help in management of technologies uh, like guidelines, which software can be used and or yeah, I think this is a, a good point where we, we can collaborate more with publishers of existing lists of vocabularies. Um, and uh, yeah, do some more outreach to, uh, to, to extend the, uh, the community of editors um, so we become, a battle becomes a real uh, union catalog or for like, yeah, world cat for vocabularies or thing, something like this. Okay, so, but this uh, will require, we, we estimate three years for the older development. And there are some challenges, uh, some general challenges uh, that we um, experienced um, in the last uh, years of development. The one is that um, terminologies are not hyped. Uh, so. Uh, the term scores or in, the term end course is not not as widely known as ontologies. So um, in library and information science or our in, in cultural uh, heritage and uh, organizations, maybe we all have terminologies and know a bit about it. But there are other uh, much stronger trends like machine learning and and full text retrieval or um, ontologies. On the other hand, uh, the term knowledge graphs uh, popped up a few years ago and, and got uh, more attention. So if we maybe do some rebranding um, or, or, or make, make clear that terminologies and knowledge organization systems are about knowledge graphs, uh, then uh, it, it will be get more attraction. Um, yeah, and a, a general challenge is uh, always the lack of resources we, all, we always could uh, use more people to contribute, but I think th this is easier to overcome. And uh, then there's maybe one reason for why, why the cost is, is not that popular is um, there's a cultural divide and terminology management. So we, we experience two communities. So one is uh, the, the communities with, that uh, talk about vocabularies like in libraries, archives and museums. And the other, more from the sciences uh, talk about ontologies, um, but the, often the, there's a, a very large overlap or we both mean the same, but they have different words, words um, to, and, and, and Bartok is clearly stronger in the first uh, culture and in the humanities, um, but uh, from a theoretical um, uh, viewpoint, it, there's no real difference uh, between vocabulary and ontology. Sure, ontology is a speci specific kind of a knowledge organization systems. Uh, this needs some special treatment, but uh, yeah, we should better um, look at these uh, together. And one example of this cultural divide I experienced uh, last year that um, yeah, we use this or I created this um, JSON LD profile for SCOS. Um, Jazz course format uh, um, already uh, almost 10 years ago. And one feature of it is to express information about mappings because this is not uh, in, impossible in core scores. And then uh, last only last year, I found that there's another initiative, also a data format for mappings between, yeah, but they don't call it vocabularies or ontologies. They call it semantic artifacts, another terminology. And um, yeah, they, they wrote a paper without uh, noticing that our work existed and we did not know about their work. But when we found and, and talked to each other, we found that our solutions are very similar and could be translated into each other. So independent um, development with uh, similar results is a good sign of uh, the outcome is, is, is a good one. Um, but sure, we should re uh, avoid that uh, these two communities um, reinvent uh, wheels and, and don't talk to each other. Yeah, so, some some uh, aspects to bridge the, this divide is in, in Germany, there's this NFDI um, um, project, a large um, pile of money distributed to research data management organizations, and they have both uh, scientists and humanities. Um, yeah, and um, the, the 
second uh, culture is more uh, using ontology lookup service and onto portal as software. So if we support this too, then I think it will be uh, doable to bridge the divide between these um, communities. Okay, so this was the summary. Um, that's it uh, um, for, for my presentation. There are um, yeah, daily updates of the data and statistics. Um, you can use an um, issue tracker in, in or um, subscribe to the mailing list if you want to become an editor. And our first funding proposal in German can also be read uh, publicly uh, what we have planned. And in any way, um, don't uh, hesitate to contact us, us and to contribute to Bartok. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jakob. Um, that was a great presentation and, and great news that you're, well, fingers crossed on your, uh, the grant, um, the grant coming through, but, uh, 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 it's, it's, um, let's, let's hope that you, that it's the, the work continue. That would be great. Uh, I was uh, just curious, uh, on JS costs or JS costs, um, uh, the, is it possible to say any more, anything more brief on, on what it, it does and um, uh, how it uh, 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 goes beyond SCOS. So first is an, an JSON LD profile um, for um, for core scores with some opinions. Um, um, and well, if, if I uh, show here the specification, so there are um, concepts con concept schemes that that are clearly known in in SCOS two, uh, then. We have uh, an addition uh, mappings because a mapping in 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 the force cost is just a triple, and we want to store provenance information: who created this mapping and where does it belong to, and so on. And um, yeah, mappings are collected in a concordance. And um, another addition is concept occurrences. That's the information um, that a term from a terminology is used to index um, or describe a resource. And this is in, in course cost is also just one triple, and we want to um, uh, also store more information. And this occurrence also um, includes the possibility to have um, combination of concepts. So if you index a, um, a document with an end combination of, of 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 two concepts, or this this uh, occurrences support um, great mappings, one to n mappings, and we also use this feature for the um, um, encoding of uh, like uh, of um, uh, in my answer about um, this um, uh, possibility where you have a vocabulary that is used, parts of it are used to create new concepts. So like um, t additional tables and do a decimal classification or an icon class, we, you, you co connect multiple existing concept to form something new. And this is also not um, possible in core con um, um, so we created first a JSON format, and this JSON format can be in part mapped back to JSCOS, uh, to, to, to SCOS, but sure, the, the extensions cannot uh, directly uh, be mapped. Okay. On the just concept bundles, what was? Yeah, uh, well, a more detailed concept bundle is, is uh, uh, are multiple um, concepts connected by AND or OR. Oh. And a concept occurrence is how uh, these, uh, these concepts are used in uh, in a catalog. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. No, that that was. Uh, I think that'd be useful. And uh, we've been looking at mappings um, how to represent them. That's 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 very interesting. Um, we have some comments in the uh, chat. Yeah. I just said, uh, how about mapping classes or properties, not only concepts? So. Um, in Bartok, by now, it's uh, the vocabularies are, or in the JSCOS format, are just um, uh, just uh, concepts. So these can be browsed here um, with broader and narrower and related. Um, but we don't have a, um, if you have a have an ontology, it's uh, only the classes or the classes and properties are mixed because uh, the, the SCOS does not know about the, the, the different so the, it's if the primary use get is SCOS vocabularies, um, but the plan is to also include um, um, uh, OL or ontologies 
and then there would be two types of, of classes. And this is also um, it's similar like in, in some uh, controlled vocabulary, some subject indexings, we have um, typed uh, concepts like people, places, and, and uh, events. And in an ontology, we would have um, uh, classes and properties. Okay. And um, uh, I think we had, um, I'm just scrolling up, uh, I see Etienne um, uh, said this is a fantastic resource, Jakob, the um, uh, software for the wiki software for controlled vocabularies. Uh, and thanks, thanks for that, that um, list of um, which you showed uh, uh, sort of very positive comment there. Um, and Matthias, you had, um, you want to uh, talk to your point there? Um, no, just to like offer <laughs> commiserations or, or, or <laughs> like support in, in that, in that, uh, uh, finding finding projects that are are doing similar work but with different terminology is is, <laughs> is something that I'm sure that we have all all run into. Uh, and um, uh, Siyoung, did you want uh, says thanks for um, uh, Bartok updates. Any other point, Siyoung? Um, she says um, she's going to continue to upload the Korean toss to uh, to Bartok. Um, any other any questions or raised hands on on Bartok? Kevin. Uh, yeah, just just um, thanks for for this presentation. Really happy to see a, an update uh, with with such also a view uh, where you guys are going. And uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us also with respect to the implementation of wrapping up um, of wrappers for for the onto portal. We we should we can definitely help for that. It would um, and um, just wanted uh, in terms of metadata description. I mean, at the end of the talk, you mentioned interest also for um, uh, relation between term onto between ontologies. Uh, uh, you, do do you follow what we are doing with the MOD? Um, uh, I mean, there was an RDA working group historically for for about three four years, and then now we are talking about that in the context of a European project called Fair Impact. Um, uh, MOD is that that standard that not standard, but that that ontology for describing uh, metadata of ontologies that we are trying to 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 set up and trying we try to set up now as a as an extension of DCAT. So so uh, we've picked with uh, selected property uh, picked up from a bunch of, um, of vocabularies, including Dublin Core, including uh, Wolf, including uh, OMV, including Schema.org, including DCAT. And uh, so I was wondering if you if your metadata record could be or, or could be compliant with that, uh, it will ease the, the probably the, the the extension of metadata between solutions. Uh, MOG not not in particular. So uh, we we tried to map um, to DCAT, yeah, and or and in general uh, try not to create new um, new properties and classes and RDF, but to stick to existing. Um, vocabularies and uh yeah that basic data is, is stored in json and could be yeah. mapped to to uh, yeah. different ontologies as well, well on, on, um, on that we we share the same view that yes sticking but sticking to existing vocabularies doesn't actually solve the problem uh so so mod is a review of 350 uh property that could apply for for describing ontologies metadata and each in is on 342 property there is no property that were defined in the mod namespace so mod was not there to provide new vocabulary properties but just to gather them all in a in a format and saying oh look those are the ones you should use in a profile if you prefer 
and and uh, and by doing that then then the idea was that we could describe the the the, the vocabularies with whatever metadata fields available but when you put them in a portal or in a registry like like bartok or agro portal then you will see a, a unique uh, format for for them that you can then build your service on so for example the the fairness assessment service that i've showed is based on the metadata record and we will not able to do that if if we would have 10 versions of the license property inside the portal itself mm -hmm. we do have that from the ontologies that arrive in agro portal but then we map them to a unique Unique format that is following the MOD, and that's why I'm wondering if if you guys have looked at it in the in in the implementation of that of GCOS uh, or the the, the few uh, the the part of GCOS that is related. So we will uh, thanks for for the reminder. So we will definitely um, be, um, look at this when we uh, we extend mm -hmm. Bartok and and um, yeah. So idea is it should yeah. be possible to to export the, all yeah. the content of Bartok and directly merge it uh, with content mm -hmm. uh, from from onto portal and um so, uh, another update thing. on which yeah. you want to be sure you follow that's related to MOD, but fair impact is supposed to also provide eventually uh, in the next month an, um, an api a specification of an api for semantic artifact catalogs so let's call them ontology repositories <laughs> registries where, where you call them but we will provide an api and then have an open call with we'll pay service like ols for example who are not in the project or bartok could be also a candidate we'll pay them to implement um uh, to implement that shared api and so on your side it would be interesting for you to implement that api for bartok to be ready bartok resources to be redistributed but also to look at the people that will implement that api because your mm -hmm. your table that says oh we grab we grab the resources from a bunch of other registries that table will actually be become done for for all of them where if they if they implement if they all implement the api and, and so so keep 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 tuned on, on, on those things. I mean, the Fair Impact Project is communicating communicating quite well with the website and news and all of that. But we're going to have this open call by by probably now 12, 12 months uh, or maybe 11 months to, related to the implementation of such an API that will probably enable the federation of ontology repositories or registries like that in the future. Right, right, yeah. Now, when we when we started with uh, this a uh, few years ago, we also did a review of existing APIs, but there, there was much less. Or there was Cosmos and some others, and um, I'm sure, um, yeah, the, the result will be compatible, and uh, yeah, we will be able to to pro provide the same API as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is something that's going to have also an impact with um, the NFDI um, uh, subgroups that it's working on terminologies that you did mention at the end. Those I'm guys in contact with them, yeah. OLS, and, and so if you're following on that, they are going to follow also what we're doing because this is very well aligned. Great. Um, and I think, um, Jakob, you had one, there's one more comment uh, a question from Yarmo. um yeah uh, for about the search yeah as i said search capabilities is not that good so what i actually do is download so the, the the data of bartok with the download link in, in in json format and then do a jq query uh, on the api field on the comment line yeah 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 okay so um Surprisingly, we are, I think, just about um, back on time to um, have a, a final discussion. Um, and um, uh, so if um, any of the panelists have, um, I think that we've been discussing all the, um, all the time, but uh, any, uh, any particular comments or questions, um, points of similarity that um, uh, anyone has immediately to mind. We did have the question on um, sus sustainability uh, issues and um, uh, I think um, Maintaining the t challenges of uh, level of resources has been mentioned by um, more than one project. Uh, Thanasis, I got a message. He he raised it as a point to dis uh, discuss, but he's um, 
uh, had to leave. He had um, uh, uh, something came up. So, um, is there um, any any points on on strategies for uh, sustainability, particularly when um, I think Panassis's point for um, uh, communities that uh, have, have are small, have low resources, or or specialized. Uh, anyone have um, ideas, issues on that? Um, I, I I already left um, a comment in 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 a GitHub repository about uh, um, appropriate software. So we also a lot of our work is also converting um, some Word files or spreadsheets into machine readable form. And then there's always the question where where it's going to be hosted. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it will keep um, it will always be some work, but but there are more and more workflows uh, that you can build on. So this uh, the software is uh, called a uh, Scohub workups. We, uh, Matthias. Um. Yes, on the on the sort of the question of sustainability and and how how uh, we could help, or or how to enable small communities and and organizations with with not all that much resources. Uh, uh, I think that there is sort of or or I can think of two uh, approaches sort of to this question. Uh, one is naturally to make it as easy as possible, so so uh, to have um, uh, tools and processes and systems that that help them uh, in, in in and as much as possible, which is sort of a, a given. But the the sort of I think that the other approach is to be able to demonstrate uh, the good uh, that they are doing or or the the the, the benefit. Uh, that their work provides, and I feel that that's always a um, quite a difficult task uh, when it comes to sort of uh, open uh, things, and and we might not know <laughs> the the sort of calculating the impact is is always uh, a difficult difficult thing to do, and uh, and and sort of. Uh, Communicating uh, and and measuring <laughs> and uh, things like that. Yes, our um, our research managers are continually telling us to uh, communicate our impact ourselves and giving us giving us uh, uh, tutorials on it. Um, but yes, no, it, it would also apply to to the to to, to our our users. Um, one thing we found is um, we've been doing work, a lot of work on mapping uh, in, in Ariadne, uh, uh, mapping um, uh, between, um, trying to map between vocabularies, mapping to the AAT, as I said, but also uh, looking at other work that's been um, trying to map between um, perhaps um, the Zorai, uh, but a lot of the legacy systems often have um, Either just um, uh, uh, sort of very simple vocabularies without any any um, uh, scope notes, without any uh, even without hierarchy, or and some of them are just perhaps pick lists that have been used to word lists, used to index uh, uh, a data a data set, but they are they are controlled. Uh, there's a, a definite list, but it raises problems in in, in trying to know what they. Um, uh, to impose a meaning on them in order to map them to uh, to a, a, another classification of vocabulary. Is that something that um, uh, uh, you guys have encountered, or, or anyone in the uh, in in the in the meeting? Do not. It's, it's just very simple word lists, but um, wanting to connect them to um, to to uh, 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 perhaps a, a better resourced um, thesaurus or, or, or classification. So, uh, Doug, this is Joseph. If you yeah. can hear me, 
Sorry, I um, only caught the very end of this part of the workshop, but if you heard Tom Baker's talk um, earlier, he talked about, yeah, <laughs> um, he had some, I thought some very clever ideas. He talked about semanticizing um, flat vocabularies by associating them with um, ontologies um, or, and, um, and I, my comment to him was that, um, you know, sometimes you want to do the opposite. You actually want to create a micro set, what we used to call a micro thesaurus um, from a bigger set as well. So it's really a two way process. But I mean, his thinking was that um, with the, the kinds of environments that we're talking about and the standards to support them, um, we are moving towards exactly that sort of scenario where anyone working with vocabulary, large or small, um, can take advantage of the, the scalability that may be there in the <clears throat> bigger sense, assuming that we um, uh, follow some common practices um, and SCOS and, um, and the elaborations that are being discussed um, being being part of that, but, but it's really much bigger than that. Um, so just I wanted to, to point that out. Um, uh, so I suggest you listen to Tom's talk. He's a very smart guy, and he's been working with the National Agricultural Thesaurus um, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, he had some very, um, I thought, clever and 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 um, interesting thoughts about exactly this point. No, thanks, Joseph. I yeah, no, I I, I snatched a few hours sleep before uh, um, before we uh, I, I saw the beginning of the workshop and then yeah. got some sleep. But there are the um, Tom's and the other presentation slides, in, in, including Joseph's talk on the, his work with the World Bank um, of the uh, Africa, uh, the the um, African Bank um, is um, the uh, is available uh, will be available on the Enfos workshop um, webpage, and so you, you can see that the power the, the PowerPoint PDFs there uh, as as well. So um, uh, we should um, refer back to that. The recordings will be available. Joseph, do you want to come in again? It seems that it's, um, so it's not in our control, <laughs> but it, it seems to be taking about two days. Um, I talked with Nishan about that uh, from DCMI. So that, that will be available and we will, um, they, have a, they have a wait to quickly send emails to the list that we that we gathered. Um, so even this morning when we had difficulties <laughs> because there, there, there was a bug <laughs> um, in getting the link out to people, um, we'll, we'll be sending the link out to everyone. Uh, and that was the, the, the reason we used the, um, the ticketing approach for this, it's not to have a ticket, it's just to quickly gather your name and email so we can communicate with you. And the next important communication is, um, yeah, the uh, the link for the publications. Um, Marsha um, is gathering PowerPoints as well, and we will, um, assuming they're supplied, uh, as they're supplied, they'll be also linked to the schedule on the ECOS page for this particular workshop, um, and uh, and I'm sure elsewhere as well. Uh... Thanks. I'm going to shut my camera off so I can have another sip of my beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's late here. We won't, we won't look. We won't look. Okay. <laughs> uh, Matthias has uh, his hand raised for a while. Uh, yes, just as a as a uh, I don't know uh, response or 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 further further. <laughs> uh, anecdote on on your uh, question or or point. Uh, we have encountered this this sort of uh, that that uh, that an, uh, that a data has been annotated using like a flat term list, uh, and and then trying to uh, incorporate that into a more uh, advanced uh, course uh, has has certainly been been problematic problematic as a uh, like a quick anecdote uh, we dealt with this legal data on on the uh, laws uh, of Finland uh, that had been 
had been annotated uh, using a flat list. And, and there was, for example, there was this uh, term of snails. And uh, we were sort of wondering what <laughs> what does the law have, have to say about snails. But it was very specifically about uh, snails used as food. So so it wasn't like a general <laughs> general idea of snails, but but uh, but in this very specific context, and sort of uh, retaining that context uh, is is naturally extremely important when doing this, and and it's not. Uh, always easy and you need to have the uh, very like uh, specific domain knowledge uh, in order to to uh, make sure that you don't make <laughs> horrible mistakes <laughs> yes mis mistakes are easy um, and um, uh, it's um, um, yeah it, it's interesting uh, mapping between um, between uh, can connect between vocabularies. It's often we found the case that um, it's not just the one. Perhaps in some cases, it's not just the one mapping that's um, that's sensible to do. But uh, well, 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 we our first guidelines were encouraging the users to the, the the domain experts mapping just really go for one. We don't want the semantic context gives gives you all the other connections. But we found in fact that. Um, uh, that they, persisted and that there are good reasons sometimes to have more than one mapping, two or three mappings. Uh, in, in some case, uh, in our case, when you were dealing with um, uh, perhaps um, uh, more, more traditional uh, specialized thesauri and mapping to the art and architecture thesaurus, which is a faceted scheme and has broken up the um, complex concepts into uh, faceted combinations, you actually uh, there's a reason to have more than one mapping. Um, so um, that's uh, uh, that was that was something in our ex in our experience. It's it's actually quite a complex a complex um, as as we know it's it's a complex job without actually a, a one right answer. <laughs>